Welcome back to Jocelyn, Tim, and Rachel. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to be back. All right. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for today's Planning Commission hearing. Today's date is August 10th, 2022, and the time is 9.30 a.m. And today's meeting is completely remote via Zoom. And so before I turn it over to the chair, I just wanted to go over a couple of instructions. We have a couple of different ways to participate in today's meeting. If your computer is equipped with a microphone, it is recommended that you participate via the Planning Commission Zoom meeting link, which is posted on the Planning Department's homepage at sccoplanning.com. Also, if your um, computer is not equipped with a microphone, there's another way to connect, which is via telephone. If you'd like to call in to provide comment, the phone number is 669-900-6833. The collaboration code that you'll be prompted to enter is 814-8152-8029. This information is posted on the Planning Department's uh, homepage under the Planning Commission link if you forget the phone number or if you suddenly disconnect and you want to call in. So today during key points in the meeting, time will be provided for members of the public to provide their testimony. We'll be muting all speakers until we call on you to speak to cut down on background noise. I will ask participants who wish to provide testimony to either raise your hand by selecting the hand icon on the Zoom link, or if you're calling in by telephone, I'll ask you to remotely raise your hand by pressing star nine. I will call on participants, participants by either your name or the last four digits of your telephone number. If you're participating via the Zoom link, when I call on you to speak, you'll see a pop-up on your screen that asks you to unmute. Please accept the pop-up. I'll ask you to state your name for the record and you can provide your testimony. If calling in via telephone, you must unmute yourself by pressing star six. Then I'll remind everybody of these instructions as we move forward. If at any time you have any difficulty to connecting to, today, to today's meeting via the link or by calling in, we do have support staff with us today, Michael Lamb. You can email him anytime at michael.lamb, that's L-A-M, at santacruzcounty.us. He's checking his email periodically, and he'll let me know if we need to pause the meeting to make sure somebody's connected. All right, those are the instructions on participating. This time, I will turn over the meeting to the Planning Commission Chair, Tim Gordon. Good morning. Good morning, Jocelyn. Thank you so much for the intro, and glad to be back and have a lot of us back here today. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Planning Commission today on August 10th, 2022, and it is 9.32, and we can call the meeting to order. Ms. Drake, can we please have a roll call? Yes. Commissioner Shepard? Commissioner Shepard, you are muted. Uh, how's that? Great. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Commissioner Lazenby? Yes, here. Commissioner Violante? Present. Commissioner Dan? Here. And Chair Gordon? Here. Great, thank you so much. Um, moving on to item two, do we have any additions or corrections to the agenda today? Uh, no, not today. Okay, great, thank you. And then on to item three, declaration of ex parte communications. Do have any, com any commissioners have anything they'd like to declare today? Okay. Hearing none, we can move on from that item and move on to oral communications. This is the uh, part of the meeting when members of the public have the opportunity to speak on items that are not on the agenda today. Ms. Drake, do we have any members of the public that would like to speak today? So I'll remind um, members of the, of the public to raise your hand using the hand icon or pressing star nine on your phone. If you wish to make a comment today related to anything other than what is on the agenda and we will allow you two minutes.
All right, Chair, I am not seeing anyone. Okay, great. Then we can go ahead and close the oral communications uh, part of the meeting, agenda item four, and move on to agenda item five, consent agenda item. Um, we have AB 361 resolution again today. And would any um, commissioners like to make a motion on this item? I'll move approval. Thank you. I'll Commissioner second Lee. that. And thank you, Commissioner Lazenby. We have a motion and second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, great. Consent agenda passes. And we can move on to agenda item number six, approval of minutes from the July 13th Planning Commission hearing. And would any members of the commission like to make a motion on that? I'd move approval on the minutes. Thank you, Commissioner Violante. Any second? I'll second. Thank you so much, Commissioner Lazenby. I have a motion and a second then on that as well. We uh, Let's take a vote on this item. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And any abstaining? Um, I'll, abs I'll abstain yeah. as well. I didn't have time to listen to the full meeting. Okay. Two abstain and three, four. So leave it still passes. Good to go. All right, so we can move right along here to agenda item number seven. And this is a recommendation of the Tiny House on Wheels um, amendments. We saw this back in February. And so, you know, it's been a little bit, but happy to see it come back. And um, so we can go ahead and get started, Ms. Drake, with a staff report if we have staff available at this time. Um, yes, if we could please promote um, David Carlson. And Stephanie Hansen and Daisy Allen. Uh, Commissioner Gordon, uh, I just like to request that you that the staff go over the options very thoroughly because I didn't understand them very well. So they have said, well, yeah. there's this option, and here's two more alternative op options for you to consider. I'd really like to go over those in detail. Agreed, yeah, I understood. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, and if we could, um, let's see, looks like we have, we've got policy staff with us this morning. Um, Stephanie, is David Carlson going to start us off? It looks like so. Good morning, David. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Good, great. So um, I would like to share my screen. And that's that button. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's that one. Is that introductory slide visible yes. to everybody? Great. Yes, it is. Great. Okay. So let me. Um, Go here so I can control that. Okay, so I my name's David Carlson. I'm the planner on this project. And um, so I'll just begin with a brief outline of what this presentation will include. Um, it will begin with an introduction describing what a tiny home is, followed by a brief summary of the planning process to date, um, and then the approach that we took to creating the ordinance, um, a general description of the ordinance and those options um, just mentioned. And I'm definitely prepared to go over those in detail, uh, followed by some details on the uh, key ordinance provisions, and then finally the staff recommendation. Um, so what is a tiny home? Um, it's, a, it's a specific type of non-motorized recreational vehicle called a park trailer, and it's defined in California Health and Safety Code 18009.3. Um, it's a house on a trailer, no larger than 400 gross square feet and no wider than 14 feet, and it's built upon a single chassis. It's registered as a park trailer with the DMV. Um, it can be towed on public roads with a special permit from the DMV. Uh, generally, they're designed to look like a tiny house um, using various design and material options. 
They can be purchased from a certified manufacturer that has constructed the tiny home on wheels according to an established national standard for park trailers, or they can be constructed by an owner builder on site under the supervision of a qualified inspection agency that, that certifies that it uh, has been built to that national standard. Um, they would come with a certification documenting that the tiny home on wheels meets that um, accepted standard for park trailers. Uh, for this type of structure, uh, that means the local building inspector would be verifying the unit has the third party verification or certification and would only be inspecting the on site installation according to the approved site plan and the connection to utilities. Uh, staff was directed by the Board of Supervisors uh, back in 2021 to, to pursue this project and the Planning Commission and the Housing Advisory Commission have both provided their input and direction at previous meetings, um, as you recall. Um, as described in the Planning Commission staff report from February 9th, 2022, um, County staff, my colleague Daisy Allen, conducted a large amount of outreach in the form of community meetings, surveys, and research as preparation for the for development of the proposed regulations. Um, and this work is summarized in, in that presentation on February 9th um, and in the staff report for that um, meeting. The current staff report to the Planning Commission just generally describes the feedback and direction staff uh, received from the February 9th Planning Commission study session, and that is incorporated into the proposed ordinance. Um, however, because some information has been updated and clarified since that um, study session, um, staff has also provided some additional ordinance options for the Planning Commission to consider. And I'll go through those, uh, the proposed ordinance and the two additional options um, and talk a little bit about each one. So in developing the options, staff tried to maintain the simplest approach possible and construct a proposed ordinance that does not repeat existing requirements that apply to single family dwellings or ADUs, um, whatever the case may be. The ordinance just addresses the unique aspects of tiny homes on wheels and incorporates all other existing requirements by reference. Under all three options, the tiny home on wheels would be allowed to function as a single family dwelling on any property where a single family dwelling or ADUs are allowed, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, also under all three options, the tiny home on wheels would be required to meet all site development standards and be subject to all the same regulations that apply to single family dwellings or, ADU, or ADUs. Um, and as noted in the uh, uh, staff report, these regulations do not change anything with respect to requirements of fire agencies, water supply requirements, uh, sewage disposal system requirements, um, and environmental resources and constraints that may affect the property. Um, other considerations include that uh, t because uh, tiny homes on wheels are registered with the DMV, they are not assessed for the purpose of property taxation. Um, however, improvements to the property, such as the infrastructure associated with the tiny home on wheels may be accessible for the purposes of property taxation. Um, tiny homes on wheels uh, can count towards the county's regional housing needs um, allocation under certain circumstances, under certain circumstances, which um, are uh, described in the staff report and staff believes that this is the case under the proposed ordinance requirements. Uh, so the proposed ordinance would allow a tiny home on wheels to function as the primary dwelling or as the ADU or as the junior ADU such that the total number of units does not exceed what is currently allowed on the property or up to three units in the simplest case. Um, however, most jurisdictions in the state that have allowed tiny homes on wheels to function as single family dwellings have allowed them to function as ADUs only. Uh, Placer County is the one jurisdiction that has recently adopted regulations allowing them to function as primary units and ADUs, um, and their regulations also allow for tiny home villages. Um, a consideration to note here, um, and with option two, um, it involves allowing them to function as a junior ADU. Um, in state law and county code, uh, as you know, um, a junior ADU is defined as contained within the existing or proposed single family dwelling on the property. And so replacing the allowed junior ADU with a tiny home on wheels um, creates a potential conflict with this definition. Um, 
staff has attempted to inquire with state housing and community development department um, regarding this um, this question, um, but we haven't received a response yet on that. Um, so they don't, I don't know where they stand on the issue of um, attending Home on Wheels functioning as a junior ADU, but they definitely um, encourage uh, uh, jurisdictions to allow tiny homes on wheels to function as an ADU, uh, new construction ADU. Um, the ordinance is structured in a way that allows it to be easily modified, however. Um, so there's two additional ordinance options presented as, as attachments to the staff report. Um, the second option would apply to a property with an existing or proposed conventional single family dwelling and would allow a tiny host house on wheels to substitute for the otherwise allowed ADU or junior AD, ADU. Um, the tiny house would be subject to all applicable um, ADU or junior ADU regulations um, in addition to the special requirements in the tiny house um, on wheels ordinance. Um, however, um, obviously this option uh, presents the same issue regarding the conflict with the definition of, uh, of a junior ADU. Um, and so the third option would allow the tiny home on wheels to function in place of the otherwise allowed new construction ADU on the property. Um, normally the property would already be developed with a single family dwelling and may even have a junior ADU already contained within that single family dwelling. Um, and this option would allow a maximum 400 square foot uh, 14 foot wide, up to 14 foot tall, tiny home to function as a new construction ADU. Um, any option that would allow a tiny home on wheels to function as a new construction ADU would also have potential benefits for those that lost their homes in the CZU fire in that the ADU regulations allow the construction of an ADU prior to the uh, primary dwelling in the case of rebuilding after a disaster. The only requirement in the ADU regulations in this case is that the location for the development envelope for the future primary dwelling must be indicated on the plans submitted for the tiny home as an ADU. There is no requirement or timeline for actually building the primary dwelling shown on the plans. Um, this provision is already in the ADU regulations and can be utilized now to build an ADU on a conventional foundation. Um, and this ordinance would allow the, that ADU to be a tiny home on wheels. Um, and now uh, getting into some specific ordinance provisions um, regarding the location on the parcel in general, the tiny home could be located anywhere that a single family dwelling or an ADU could be located under existing regulations. Uh, the parking pad would have to be provided for the tiny home in a location that would allow the tiny home to be safely moved onto or off the property and the tiny home on wheels and the parking pad could not block required parking for any other unit on the property. Um, hook up to utilities would have to meet current plumbing and electrical code requirements, uh, meaning no extension cords or water hoses laying on the ground. Um, utility hookups would have to be extended to the tiny home location underground with direct connection to the tiny home on wheels or just short extensions uh, to utility connections next to the parking pad. Um, the ordinance contains some design and material standards that are intended to mimic a normal house um, and references the fire safety standards um, in the case where the tiny home on wheels is located within the wildland urban interface. Uh, in terms of occupancy, um, because the tiny home on wheels is movable, it could be conveyed and, and it's uh, considered personal property. Um, it could be conveyed separate from the primary residence. Um, per the planning commission direction, the permit would be subject to renewal every three years or, um, and staff has added this additional provision uh, when the tiny home on wheels is conveyed to a new owner, uh, whichever occurs first. The permit would also expire when the tiny home on wheels is removed from the property. Um, the permit process would be similar to the normal permit process for a house, uh, which could include, which would include verifying the unit meets the um, uh, ANSI or American National Standard Institute uh, A119.5 standard for park trailers. Um, and it has a valid DMV registration for towing to the property. Um, and here I wanted to make a, a clarification to this section of the proposed ordinance uh, regarding certification of the tiny home on wheels. Um, 
per state law and consistent with the nationally recognized and industry standards, the tiny home on wheels would just have to be certified to meet the ANSI A119.5 standard for park trailers. The, the other standards referenced in that the current version of the uh, proposed ordinance um, are not necessary because the ANSI standard is sufficient. Um, and I make this clarification to the last section of the proposed ordinance, um, depending on um, what the planning commission uh, forwards as a result of this meeting. Um, the uh, all three ordinance um, options um, and the information in this staff report were presented to the housing advisory commission on July 13th, 2022. Uh, the commission supported the ordinance uh, option that would allow a tiny home on wheels to function as a single family dwelling as the primary unit, the ADU and the junior ADU, along with the five year permit term. Um, instead of the three-year permit term recommended by the Planning Commission. Uh, the vote was a split vote of five in support and four opposed. And uh, based on the discussion, that split vote apparently uh, reflected the lack of full support for any permit term at all. Um, the argument against a permit term limit was expressed as a, uh, as a fairness issue and that the large investment to prepare a site for a tiny home argues for the expectation that the permit be issued with no permit term limit at all um, or renewal requirement consistent with any other permit for a single family dwelling. Um, there was discussion of alternative means of monitoring, uh, such as an annual fee or checking DMV records for annual registration of the tiny home on wheels. Um, uh, if the planning commission wants to consider modifying the permit renewal requirements, staff would suggest the proposed ordinance could include an affirmative statement that the permit shall be renewed um, unless a site inspection by county staff identifies a violation of the county code related to the tiny home on wheels, in which case the permit could still be renewed if the violation is resolved concurrently. Um, this would provide that sense of permanence related to a tiny home on wheels and also provides for the required monitoring of these units um, as required for them to count towards the county's RENA obligations. And so in conclusion, um, the staff recommendation is to conduct a public hearing to review the proposed amendments to the Santa Cruz County Code that would add regulations for tiny homes uh, with associated CEQA notice of exemption. Um, adopt the attached resolution recommending that the Board of Supervisors uh, direct staff to file the CEQA notice of exemption with the clerk of the board, adopt an ordinance as proposed in uh, Exhibit C or as modified um, by the Planning Commission, um, adding regulations to the county code for tiny homes on wheels, and direct staff to transmit the amendments to the California Coastal Commission. And that concludes the staff recommendation. I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen and um, be available for any questions uh, during the discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Really appreciate that. Uh, great report. And thanks for the refresher on, on a lot of that information and since it's been a little bit. Um, I'd like to ask the commissioners if they had any immediate questions for Mr. Carlson at this time. Well, uh, I don't mind going first. Please go ahead. So kind of starting at the beginning, thank you for the presentation. Um, I am a little confused about uh, how hookups for water service uh, uh, and sewer slash septic um, can be on page two of the staff report on the fourth bullet point. It says that um, the, um, the throw must be permitted by the lowest jurisdiction by the local jurisdiction meet the um, sense that the definition of a housing unit must have new hookups to services and other features to demonstrate a sense of permanence without being placed on a permanent location and the local jurisdiction must monitor the throws to ensure the unit has not been moved. Now, I don't know what demonstrating a sense of permanence means and that's pretty vague. And I also, it sounds like we are being directed by the state to make sure they aren't moved. So that kind of relates in my mind, at least to some kind of uh, permitting so that you can check in every five years, three years, 10 years, whatever, to make sure they're being moved, correct? Am I understanding that section of the staff report? 
Yes, and that those criteria are based on our communication with a state HCD um, for the purpose of being able to count these units towards our arena um, numbers. Now, so, that's if if you would like to have them counted towards our arena numbers. That if if we want to be looser, or more flexible with the with the regulations. Um, then they may not allow us to count them towards our arena numbers. That doesn't mean we still can't do it. Well, I, I think there's probably everyone wants them to count against our arena numbers. That's such a stiff quota. So I think that has to be followed, which is we have to have an ordinance that has some provision for the local jurisdiction to monitor the throws to ensure they have not been moved. If that's a permit, then that's a, that's a permit. Um, my next question is, what is going to be accessible? You indicated that. I understand the property will not be assessed for real estate taxes, but for example, where I live, we have a fire district assessment and a whole bunch of miscellaneous school assessments and so on. So I want to be clear, row owners will be paying all those other assessments that everybody else pays, correct? Correct. All um, improvement fees that would apply to either a new single family dwelling or an accessory dwelling unit. What I was explaining was the issue of property taxation. And because the tiny home on wheels is registered with the DMV, it's personal property and it's not um, accessible for the purpose of property tax taxation. However, um, the, the permanent improvements um, on the site to service the tiny home on wheels like the um, infrastructure related to the sewage disposal system, water supply, the parking pad, all of that um, may be accessible um, by the by the assessor. That would that would be their they would make that determination. Um, well, I'm not sure that you have answered my question. When I get my tax bill, there's the real estate taxes, which I understand the assessor's tax assessment of what I should be paying. But I have a lot of miscellaneous charges for for school for special programs to, for example, to build our firehouse, for school assessments, uh, for mitigation measures, this and that. I, I couldn't list them out for you. But will throw owners be paying those? Because they're building, if they're building primary residence or JDUs, or is that's a question I have? You may not be able to answer it. Yeah, no, I, I can answer it in terms of the improvement or capital improvement fees that are collected by the planning department when we issue a permit for a single family dwelling or an ADU. Those would all still apply as applicable, whether it's a single family dwelling or, or an ADU. In terms of, of property tax assessments, the the those assessment the the applicability and amounts of those assessments would be determined by the assessor's office. Um, so, so this uh, is a big area. For example, we built a firehouse twenty years ago, and we pay I can't remember maybe twenty seven dollars a year to pay for that. I want to know if those costs of supporting community services will be passed on. So, if you can't answer it now, I'd certainly like to get that clarified. Um, Commissioner Lazenby, maybe I could jump in here. Quickly. Yes, thank you. Um, it sounds to me like you're describing several different things that show up on your property tax bill that that are tied into uh, different means of of assessment. For example, Prop 218 assessments. And the answer is is if something, if, if an assessment is properly assessed against real property, you'll continue to be assessed against real property. The tow itself is not real property and wouldn't receive the assessment. But if you were, for example, putting this on an ADU, using a tow as an ADU, that wouldn't change the <clears throat> that wouldn't change the special assessment um, necessarily change the special assessment on your real property, uh, unless, for example, it moved the property into a different classification that had a different assessment rate. So the answer is it depends, but tows are legally vehicles rather than something that necessarily impacts real property and how real property is assessed. Okay. Well, thank you. That is more, that is more clear, but it does raise concerns because our, our local volunteer fire department and a lot of other local improvements have made do rely on these kinds of small assessments on our tax bills. So that's a concern for me. Okay. My next question is about parking in driveways. 
this is on page three of the staff report under development standards. It says, therefore, a provision is included in the proposed ordinance that a throw may not be located in an existing driveway, only may be located only if it meets the required setbacks, is not located in a required parking space, and does not block, ac block access to required parking for other dwelling units. Well, that's a lot of restrictions. So that was a big concern at our initial hearing, and it still is. It sounds like effectively you'd have to have a huge driveway to allow a throw under what you're talking about, right? Because that was a concern. If you pack a throw in a driveway, then the garage is effectively not a place where anybody could park a car, et cetera, et cetera. So this restricts throws to driveways that don't block the garage, correct? Well, that's correct. It, uh, well, it, it restricts the location of the tiny home on wheels to a location that doesn't block require, required parking for any other unit. Okay, let's say I have a single family home with a two car garage and a big long driveway. Can I pack, can I uh, park a tho in front of my garage? It will, it will certainly not allow me any longer to get the cars out. I, I would say it depends, maybe or maybe not. Okay, and if I park a throw on a driveway and I am required to have water hookup and electrical hookup uh, underground, you're obviously going to have some construction there, right? Right. I just think that our general sense, and I'm happy to hear from, I'm hoping other members will speak to this, I think that it's a bad idea to pack a throw in someone's driveway. but. I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, got a few more questions. I won't take up too much time. Um, I asked you about impact fees. What uh, about um, those in areas that have special mitigation requirements like the Sand Hills, where right now you have to pay mitigation fees uh, that go into reserves or mitigating those environmental conditions? And I don't see that addressed. Those, those same requirements would apply to the tiny home on wheels. So to the extent that the uh, new parking pad, for example, uh, where the tiny home on wheels will be located represents um, new disturbed area, then um, the same requirements for payment of mitigation fees based on the square foot of, of, uh, of disturbed area would apply to that parking pad. So the, the, in, in general, we constructed the proposed ordinance to just um, treat the tiny home on wheels the same way we would treat any other single family dwelling in terms of environmental resources and constraints. And then my next question is, in terms of for CVU victims who are rebuilding their homes, couldn't we make a special provision in this ordinance to allow people uh, who have had a natural disaster such as an earthquake or a fire they have a special provision to allow a throw while they are rebuilding, and it could be in lieu of their primary residence, but it would be a special exemption when a natural disaster has occurred. I didn't see any. Mm -hmm. I would be inclined to allow that in the fake of a natural disaster, but not make it a permanent thing, because we know where homes were destroyed. That, that exists already. Okay, and then. That, that's happening already. So right now what you're proposing is you could build your um, tho as a um, accessory dwelling unit. It could count as your primary residence, even if there is another burnt down primary residence. I didn't quite understand what you were saying about that. There's no implement, so you could live in it forever. Well, so, so what's in our regulations currently is provisions for allowing people to um, install a recreational vehicle um, or a tiny home on wheels on their property while they're um, trying to rebuild after a natural disaster. And then that's happening already in the burn area. There's, there's people living in RVs and maybe even tiny homes on wheels um, under temporary permits that um, Actually, in the case of the CZU fire rebuilding, um, I, I believe we've actually extended the the time limit 
lots um, to allow people to occupy those as they're rebuilding. Um, but then, and then also, well, and also you, if if you get a permit, and this has been in the code for forever also, if you obtain a permit for your single family, a new, to construct a new single family dwelling, um, and you have your permit in hand, you can also come back in and get a permit for the ability to allow you to occupy an RV on the property while you're building your house. And then once you, once the final building inspection of the house is completed, um, you, you're supposed to disconnect and the RV and, and not live in it anymore, move into the house. Um, also, uh, we have the um, proposed provisions now in, in the Tiny Home on Wheels ordinance that would allow you to um, occupy a tiny home on wheels on the property permanently as a single family dwelling as, as either the primary unit or an ADU or even a junior ADU, depending on the planning commission's um, recommendation. Could you have a situation where you have a thorough on a property as a primary residence at 400 square feet? Would that not give you the right to build a 1200 square foot ADU and or whatever, six or 700 JADU. So you'd have a tiny home as a primary residence and two other residences that were twice as big as it, as officially junior to it, right? Theoretically, yes. If, if, if this ordinance allows a tiny home on wheels to function as a primary unit and that's all you got a permit for at one time, then yes, theoretically that property owner could come back in in the future and decide, okay, I want to build a normal ADU on a foundation on the property. And then you, you could do that uh, according to the ADU regulations. Um, well, this, this kind of gets back to the question of utilities. Like, so we're going to allow such a situation and even just the primary though, What's the difference between a primary throw utilities and a recreational vehicle utilities? Because we have a tiny home parked down the street from us, and they just have a hose to the house and electrical extension cord to the house. So what exactly? You mentioned that, you know, if you get a water hook up here, which are very expensive, and a meter it has to be installed underground, so our connections are underground, what are... What are we? What is the difference between a, a, a you know enclosed RV that goes goes and uh, you know pumps their sewage out at a pumping station, et cetera, et cetera, and a throw? Obviously, there's a big difference. So, what will we require? I mean, if you have if you use a throw as a primary residence, will you get a what? Do you have to buy a water meter? Yes, and you have to it have cost, an it could cost more in the valley than the throw. <laughs> Uh, okay, it, just clarify. It that. depends. <laughs> depends on the location of the property and the water system situation. Yes, I, it, it, yes, you have to have an approved water supply and an approved sewage disposal system, just like any other single single family dwelling going okay, through the so permit that, process. That, yes. So that's the major difference. A recreational vehicle doesn't need any of that, right? Uh, mm, well, I want to be careful here. I mean, if in the case where we've permitted the recreational vehicle to be occupied while you're constructing a single family dwelling, the requirement is that you have developed your approved water supply and you installed your sewage disposal system and hooked that RV up to those utilities while you're constructing your, your house. Um, and so you're not allowed to live on a property in an RV and just use the facilities in the RV and maybe take the RV to a dump station or whatever, that's not allowed. Um, in the case of a tiny home on wheels, under this, under these regulations, you, 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 the tiny home on wheels, the, the property on which the tiny home on wheels will be installed will have to have an approved water supply, approved sewage disposal system, and the hookups to that will have to be um, according to the electric code, plumbing code, uh, either either directly tied into the tiny home on wheels or extended to the parking pad. Um, 
in a, on a, in like a, on a pedestal where, where there's short connections that, that connect to those utilities, just like you would see in say a, a, a recreational vehicle park. Um, there, it would not be allowed to have extension cords and garden hoses on the ground. That would not be allowed. Okay, and finally, I am not quite sure on the Housing Advisory Commission vote, um, what, I'm not sure of the context of that, but I would like to see those, especially since we can change the ordinance at any time. I think when we start, in my, in my sense, I just wanna say, I think having a permit, whether it's three years or five years is, is a good idea, at least for the first 10, 15 years, so we get this all kind of work, worked out. That's gonna be my position, I, I think. Okay, I'm sorry to have taken up so much time, but it's great. this is something entirely new and it's hard to get your uh, mind around. And I'm very concerned that the public really understand what is required, because that was my question, what's the difference between RV and the flow? Because I don't think most people really see that. They see themselves kind of pulling something onto the property and they're, you know, it's going to be more complicated than that. Okay, thank you. Sorry, fire truck going by. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Shepard. And would any other commissioners like to ask any questions at this time? Go ahead, Ms. Lazenby. Uh, yes, I was, um, I was just wondering when you were talking about having the proper or the approved hookups, those people who are now living in an RV on their site where they're trying to rebuild a house, maybe they don't have those or have you required it for anyone who is living in an RV right now or is this going to be retroactive? You're, are you asking specifically about the CZ people rebuilding after a loss in the CZU fire? Right. Um, I hesitate to uh, provide uh, detail. I, I don't know all the details. Those, I haven't been involved in all of the um, specific aspects of, of the permitting of the temporary um, our recreational vehicles for folks that are trying to rebuild after the CZU fire. Um, what I explained earlier is that the basic requirement that has been in place for a long time is that if you um, have a permit in hand to rebuild, a, to build a single family, new single family dwelling on a lot, in order to be able to occupy that RV temporarily while you're constructing the house, the, the water supply and the septic system have to be developed and installed to, for that RV to hook into. For for folks that are rebuilding after the fire, they they may have had their water system damaged or their septic system damaged, um, and frankly, um, maybe there's somebody else on this call from planning that can help me out here and describe what sort of special considerations we may be um, allowing for folks rebuilding after the CZU fire in terms of of uh, the, those water supply and sewage disposal requirements. Um, I'm actually not sure. Maybe those have been relaxed a little bit. May, maybe we're, we're allowing um, these RVs to, to be uh, self-contained, so to speak. I, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other hands for somebody that might have a- I, I could certainly get back to you on that. response. I can okay. certainly find out. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. That um, the temporary housing program is administered by the um, RPC staff down in the basement. So I would need to check and see how they're handling the temporary housing um, in the case of CZU um, situation. I'm, I'm not sure if it's evolved since we created the documents for that process. So um we can try and get that information for you. But, Thank but you. I, I, that's why I was asking you the difference between an RV and a flow. And what we got before us is what would be required for a flow. 
Right. I guess I guess I would like to clarify though that th that is a special situation that's happening with rebuilding after the CZU fire and doesn't necessarily have any bearing on what we're what we're considering here. I mean, what we're considering here is an ordinance that would uh, that would allow tiny homes on wheels um, to be occupied as single family dwellings or ADUs on a property and the, and all the related ordinance provisions on how that would be allowed. Um, the 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 situations that are happening right now with people rebuilding after the CZU is a, is a like I said, it's it's a that's a separate separate situation. It doesn't necessarily have any relation to what we're considering here, uh, except for the except for to the extent that this ordinance would would have some benefits for those re attempting to rebuild after CZU in terms of being able to to uh, do that with a tiny home on wheels. That's right. Okay, thank you. Hey, Commissioner Violante, did you have some questions? Yeah, I was just hoping, Mr. Carlson, that you could clarify in your presentation. I, I thought I, when you were talking about the ANSI, you had mentioned that it wasn't in the ordinance that you had presented to us and you were hoping to clarify later. You went over it a bit quickly and I was hoping you could just explain, because it sounded like you were hoping that, that if we go yeah. this direction, that something would need to be clarified in the code. And since it wasn't in the staff report, I was hoping you could elaborate on uh, the, I, like I didn't have a chance to look up that particular piece of the ANSI and, and what that would mean. And that would right. just be really helpful for me. So if you don't mind both telling me that number again, and then what that change would mean for the, the code and the implications. Right, right. So yeah, currently in the ordinance, um, there is that, that last uh, section of the ordinance uh, contains language that would allow this, the um, tiny home on wheels to meet various certifications, including the ANSI 119.5 standard, the NFPA 1192 standard, um, or be constructed according to the California Residential Building Code Appendix Q. Well, and that was put in there because of, of an, an initial understanding on my part that there was a lot of overlap in those standards. But what, what's been clarified is that um, the California Building Code Appendix Q applies to the construction of a tiny home on a foundation. Um, and the NFPA 1192 standard applies to RVs in general and really just addresses fire and life safety standards for um, our recreational vehicles, including RVs that you would see driving down the road. Um, the, the ANSI A119.5 standard is specific to park trailers, which is what we are talking about in this ordinance. And so that's all we need um, in this ordinance is that it meet that standard. Um, and and so that's that was the clarification that I was talking about. I want to strike the references to those other standards and just refer to the ANSI A119.5 standard. That is the standard that is referred to in state law uh, when, when in the section of state law that addresses park trailers and the, and the standards that apply to park trailers. It re references that standard only. So that's the standard we want to reference in the ordinance. So just so I can clarify, so we're, we're talking about I-1 in, in the ordinance, and you would recommend that we strike everything after the ANSI 119.5? Yes, and, yeah. And so, and that that's, I just want to be, I just want to be, when we're talking about striking something from the ordinance, I think it's really important we're, we're clear about what it is you're making recommendation. And so I just, I want to make sure I understand and. And the public understands since it wasn't in the in the staff report. Um, yeah, that's that's exactly correct. That's what I have in my notes is striking everything after ANSI one nineteen point five, and it's actually uh, ANSI A one nineteen point five, and then striking everything after that. Okay, and with that, but it would we leave in two obviously for there. Yes, valid okay. DMV registration is required for okay. uh, towing to the parking location. Okay. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I, I think I have other questions, but I might I might wait on them. That one I just think was important since it was part of the presentation and you're recommending a change to no matter which direct uh, version we pursue. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Violante. And Commissioner Dan, did you have any questions or comments? Um, I don't have any questions right now. I do have some comments of 
suggestion, but I'll wait till after public comment. I just, I do want to say, I want to appreciate the other the questions of my fellow commissioners and Commissioner Shepard, don't ever apologize for asking questions. I found your questions very helpful um, and they were some that I had as well. Thank you. Agreed. Uh, I do have one more in that case. <laughs> <laughs> Please uh, go ahead, Commissioner Shepard. Uh, David, you mentioned that the, in terms of considering a co a primary residence, other you have, you mentioned that Placer Placer County allows it, but other jurisdictions do not. So, how many did you look at, and who are we talking about? Because Placer County is a very sparsely populated uh, county, and I don't think it's. I'd like to, some other frames of reference. Did you, you mentioned you must have talked to three or four others or looked at three or four others? Yeah, other jurisdictions that have um, ordinances allowing tiny homes on wheels uh, to function as ADUs include Humboldt County, the city of Los Angeles, the city of San Jose, Santa Clara County, the city of San Diego, the city of San Luis Obispo, um, and, and Placer County. So overwhelmingly, other metropolitan communities have gone in the direction of allowing those as ADUs. Yes. Okay, well, that's telling, I think, because those are very big, complex places that also have high housing needs. So I would be inclined to be influenced by that strongly. Chair sure, Gordon, actually, I may, I may actually ask a couple more questions before we go, since, I, since Mr. Carlson's here, if sure. that's all right. Yeah, please. I guess, Mr. Carlson, I have a couple questions. In, in Section E, um, the ordinance, when we're talking about utilities, um, the, the second half of that, when it's talking about off-grid systems, it talks about solar panels, battery storage, things that we obviously want to encourage. But the second part of the last portion of that talks about the connection to a generator. And I guess my question to that was, was the intention of staff that generators were meant to be used on a regular basis? I mean, obviously, um, the the intention is that the solar the solar I almost said solar system <laughs> um, the, the solar, but that's what we, that it provides the enough power but um, in cases of days where it's too cloudy or there's high energy use is is that the intention of staff that generators be used on a regular basis for these off grid systems no what section was that again I want to go I'm on E uh, it's page oh. I think 11, if, if you're on the first version of the, um, of the, the options staff provided us. Um, and so I, because I, nothing in the ordinance, in my opinion, says that these are only meant to be used as backups, nothing in it says that they're only meant to be used in emergencies. I don't want to get into discussion, so thank you. I appreciate the clarity. I think I'll have some more comments on that later. Um, the, the other question I think I had was that on section H2, um, when we're talking, so on page 12, for people who are listening, um, we're talking, so section H2, the tiny home, uh, the permit shall expire. That's what we're talking about. Um, it says upon permanent removal of the tiny home from the property. I'm just wondering if you can tell me what permanent is. What do you mean? Uh, I'm wondering if staff had, so, so that the right, staff, right. staff provides a, a definition that the permit shall right. um, be removed, uh, expire. I'm just wondering, there's no, did staff have a contemplation or a definition of what permanent removal was? So was there a timeline that staff had? Was there an intention that six months, three weeks, three months? It was, I, I just wasn't sure if staff had, I didn't see one and I wasn't sure if staff had contemplated this concept since it wasn't in the ordinance. No, we okay. haven't contemplated what that would mean, but- okay. um, that's helpful for me. Yeah. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, okay, those are my questions I think that I was hoping for clarity on. I think those were important pieces. Like I said, I think both of my questions will lead to some of my comments and questions and discussion later. Um, so thank you, I, I look forward to the discussion with my colleagues in a bit. Thank you, Commissioner Violante. Um, I had a couple of follow-up questions here also. And, you know, some, some of these come from discussion that we had at the last uh, meeting about this. And I'm just not sure if they're reflected or why they're not, if they're not included. Um, and so um, a couple of them here. The first one was we kind of discussed allowing 
tiny home on wheels to be used for multifamily or mixed zone or mixed use zone parcels. And I'm wondering if that is excluded because the phrasing just references single family residences. And some of there is says principal residence. And so just wanting some clarity on, on that. I, I think just in general, just the, the nature of a tiny home on wheels is a, is a, is, is a single unit. It's it it's not a multi-family unit, and it can't be used as a multi-family unit. So the the that's the reason for just the simply the reference that these would be allowed to function as a single-family dwelling, because that's that's the only thing they can be, um, in place of the other an otherwise allowed single-family dwelling or or ADU. When you get into, you know, multi-family dwelling zoned parcels that 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 could get a little bit more complicated in terms of how we would allow a tiny home on wheels um, on a parcel like that. But, but in any case, they, they would be permitted as a single family dwelling. They would never be permitted as part of a multifamily dwelling because they can't be connect, they can't be attached. They are separate units towable onto and off the property as a single unit. Okay, yeah, that, thank you. That, that clears up my second question, which was, are we had discussion around allowing people to combine them so you can have like, you know, a kitchen unit and a bedroom unit and a bathroom unit or whatever, but it sounds like that is not possible. These need to be separate standalone. Yes, they're intended to be separate standalone living units. That's how they're defined um, as a separate uh, standalone living unit with cooking, sleeping, bathing facilities in, included in the unit just like okay. any other single family dwelling. Yeah. So, and then, so just to back up one quick step here on the multifamily. So, you know, in theory, you could, if you had a multifamily zone parcel, you could build, let's say, let's say I had 10 units that were allowed. You could build 10 separate apartments that you rented out, right? Instead of one building that included 10 units. In that case, would you consider these as allowed in that multifamily zoned property because they're all single units separated as required for setbacks, fire, and all the rest. I, th I think that, to be honest with you, I think that goes beyond what has been contemplated here. Um, and so what, what we're proposing is that they function and would be allowed anywhere a single family dwelling is allowed. So. This is a good question. I think the Planning Commission might want to clarify this in their discussion, whether or not um, we want to more narrowly focus that on allowing these to be um, permitted on parcels that just allow single family dwellings, or do we want them to allow them on parcels that to, on par <clears throat> to function as single family dwellings that would allow um, m multiple single family dwelling units? You may or may not want to allow that. I, I, I that that was not part of the uh, the thinking behind this. I, I think the, the the thinking here so far has just been allowing them to function as a single family dwelling, where where a single family dwelling would otherwise be allowed, and not a multi family dwelling situation. Okay, understood. Thank you. Um, yeah, we can talk about that a little more in our discussion time. Um, another quick question here. You know, this is one of the, the options are around how these get um, permitted every three or five years. Was there any idea around like a self-certification? Like, you know, a website, a homeowner could take a picture and say, hey, it's still here and upload it and there you go. And it's automatically approved, something along those lines. It just makes it really easy for people, but still would count for uh, the requirement of HED or whoever need, needs us to check in every so often for the RENA numbers. Wait, let me see if I understand your question in terms sure. of just monitoring or construction requirements. Is it, uh, sorry, mon long-term uh, permitting just, monitoring. So just, you said we need to have that in place in order to have these count for the arena numbers. So I'm right. just wondering if there's like a simple process that has been thought through, but maybe, you know, is not an option or could be an option. 
Yes, that actually occurred to me as well. I, I didn't mention it, but I thought maybe that might come up in this discussion. Yes, that's a form that would potentially be a form of monitoring just uh, instead of staff having to do a site visit, for example, requests require that the um, a picture be a current picture be submitted showing yes, it is in fact still there or not. Well, I'd like to suggest that since you have already looked in some respects to see what other a lot of other counties have instituted these ordinances many metropolitan areas maybe we ought to look at some of these things and see what everybody else is doing so we have some context and not act like we are inventing the wheel since in this case it's kind of a bad joke given that it's always on wheels but we aren't and whether it would happen today or when you send it up to the board you were able to provide some insight on how many other counties are allowing them as primary residents, which is only one out of a lot. And then this might be another issue. What is verification amounted to for the many other counties that have ordinances in place? In other words, there's other, there's something to draw on here. We're not pulling it out of thin air. Right. This, um, I'll tell you that this, I think this question of, of counting them towards our arena numbers is a question that um, I actually had a kind of a hard time getting an answer to from HCD because it's a new, as it's, it's a whole new um, idea for, for housing It's going beyond, you know, the traditional construction of a house on a foundation. So because it's movable, um, although, you know, their H HCD has gone on record with, um, you know, brief letters to jurisdictions saying we encourage, you know, we, we like the fact that you're allowing these to function as ADUs. We encourage you to do that. Um, the question of do they or do they not count towards arena numbers um, has, has not previously been addressed. And so, um, uh, I believe I may have been the first one to sort of push that question with HCD and got a response from them and 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 where they outlined those criteria that they would like to see. Um, uh, because they're on wheels, the, the key issues for them in terms of counting them towards our arena numbers are, you know, are, are they going to be that, that sense of permanence? Are they going to be there for a significant amount of time and provide that? that housing that's needed in their community uh, on a semi-permanent basis. Um, and so that's the purpose for the um, uh, the requirement that they get a permit, that there be a sense of sense of permanence on the property, there be that parking pad development, infrastructure development to support it, and then that monitoring to make sure that it's still there. Well, I'm just suggesting you look and see what Los Angeles and Santa Clara and San Jose and all the other many counties you Contra Costa see what they did with that. Report. I don't think they're doing any monitoring. Uh, we I, 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 we are inventing the wheel on this one. I, I'll, I'll, saying, I, I'll definitely follow up on that, but I suspect that um, none of these other jurisdictions are doing any monitoring of them. They're, they And they may not even be reporting them on their RENA uh, annual reports. Oh, okay. So we need to be very careful that whatever we do will allow it to be counted by Rena. That's the point. So we need to figure that out. Yeah, and that would be figuring out some way of doing the mo doing the monitoring. Um, great. Thank you. Um, I had a question on the solar as well. It wasn't clear to me if power is required to be brought to location before in discussions that we had, you know, where with like composting toilets, you could use a composting toilet, but you still had to bring sewer to location. You didn't necessarily have to hook it up. Um, and as I'm not sure if that, well, that's another question I have with the composting toilet, but how is it with the power? Is it, a, you need to bring power, but you can use the solar if you want to? No, it's different. Yeah, it's a different issue with the electrical compared to the, the sewage. No, you don't have to extend the power necessarily to the site. So you would, for a property that uh, chooses not to or can't afford to extend power to their site, they would have the option of being off grid with a solar power system. But you are requiring a generator. 
uh, we're requiring the ability to connect to a generator. We're not necessarily requiring a generator. We're requiring the solar power system to be designed to serve the needs of the tiny home on wheels based on the, um, the loads of the tiny home on wheels with battery backup and the ability to connect to a generator in emergency, but um, not necessarily a requirement that they actually have a generator. Yeah. Um, for example, you know, if um, during a major storm that lasts several days and the batteries are depleted and you don't have a generator, then you may be faced with a situation where you don't have power for until the sun comes back out and you can start charging your batteries again. So, it, or you may have a generator um, that you could connect to under that circumstance, but then that um, that, that, that would, in, in practice, the, the the use of that generator would only be for the length of time that it would take for the sun to come back out and start charging your batteries back up again. Would and that you... be um, inspected on issuance of a permit? Like yes. I have a generator and I spend a lot of money and time getting it properly installed and inspected. Yes. That would the, the ability to connect to the generator would be inspected, and if you actually did install a generator that was not portable, that would be inspected too. Um, there's no permit requirement for a portable generator. Can you confirm also that the solar panels would be inspected by local jurisdiction? Is that correct? Yeah, they are now. I can speak as someone who has, yes, you have to get permits and you have to have inspected. Well, yes, to the extent that they're installed on site. So um, I believe there are manufacturers that produce tiny homes on wheels that do have integrated um, solar power systems in them so that they are self uh, contained in terms of, of power requirements. And so um, to the extent that that is already inspected under the ANSI certification, then then no, the, the building inspector would not necessarily be inspecting that on site. Yeah, so that it, was it okay. depend. Yeah, it would depend on how it how it uh, was if it came with the unit or or was installed post manufacturer or, or on site. Okay. Thank you. I, I think I have a little concern there. Um, and I could probably just bring that back at discussion. Um, you know, just in the fact that if someone parks this on a in the forest where there's not as much sun as what the specs for the tiny home builder require, which is that you park it in a desert, you know, where it's all sun all the time. Right, right. <laughs> and right. and then we get a bunch of tiny homes that don't actually work that well with the electricity. And then we end up with like tons of gas powered generators, which running our homes on gasoline from the station is not a good idea, in my opinion. So, um, right. Yeah. Okay. Understood. Let me think about that. Well, I think that's a real concern because to get a, in, in that case, they'd say, well, I can't do this forever. I better get a power hookup. And that's a very expensive proposition. And in forested areas probably may not always be available. So we need to figure out if there's any way to craft this without ending up with just what Tim is suggesting a whole bunch of people with gas-powered generators, which drive neighbors crazy, pollute like crazy, and use a large amount of gasoline. Yes, and I think you probably could address that in a pretty simple way in the ordinance by adding to that provision that addresses solar power something to the effect of on um, the site plan needs to verify solar access. I yes. think that would be something we probably most of us I got a feeling support. So why don't we bring put that in as something we'd like to consider? Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, a couple a couple last quick questions here. Why the four hundred square foot max? Is that a requirement from the ANSI standards, or where did that come from? I don't remember yeah, that. Much. That's the definition in state law for a park trailer. And yeah, yeah okay. the maximum four hundred square feet. And maximum 14 feet wide in the maximum dimension. That and then that that allows for it to be transported on public roads. But Got it. Uh, you need a special permit from the DMV to do that. But you you can do that. Okay. And that doesn't seem like, in my guess, without a ton of knowledge on this, that it's 
not wouldn't be restrictive. I, I assume that's like pretty large floor plate, you know, for what can actually travel down a road anyway. But you know, have you done some research as to like you, you know, I don't know if there's any change in that or if we even need to discuss that, or if it's, you know, hey, there's tons of options that are 410 square feet, you know. Yeah, it couldn't couldn't be 410 square feet. Um but uh, that that's that that permit requirement from the DMV for transport on roads, and then the definition of a park trailer and that ANSI standards that that sort of distinguishes these things from sure. your typical RV or fifth wheel that gotcha. you could that, that doesn't need a per, special permit to travel around and does travel around more readily. These aren't designed to be moved very often. <laughs> and yeah. the assumption is they're going to be towed to the site and they're going to stay there for couple of, you know years basis or, yeah, or in this case for possibly forever do those standards have minimum construction protections built in for earthquakes as being in a very earthquake prone area i'm just wondering when you mention all the safety standards how does it relate to earthquake safety um the keeping the wheels on is what provides the seismic stability take taking the wheels off then then you start to get into okay how is this thing connected to the ground via a foundation and and so that that's why that's the reason for the requirement of the ordinance that the wheels stay on basically well whatever requirement we have for verification that would be something whoever's looking either at the permit registration However, we come up with that, that they they'll be looking to make sure the wheels are still on them, right? Yeah. Yeah. Once the wheels come off, then it's it's a it's it, you just start you just start going down the path of connecting it to a to yeah, really some kind of foundation that is per, that is semi or, or permanent, and, that, and that's then that gets you in the category of of a tiny home on a foundation, which is already allowed. So there has to be some distinction between a tiny home on a foundation that was already allowed, just like any other single family dwelling constructed according to the building code and a tiny home on wheels. And that is keep the wheels on. I mean, if you're building a primary residence and happens to be 400 square feet, that's fine. That's not really a tiny home. A tiny home has a specific definition, right? Well, well, it's a tiny home. Uh, a, a tiny home on a foundation is could could be the same size as a tiny home on wheels, 400 square feet. It, it, it's just it's built according to the California Building Code Appendix Q, which contains special requirements for tiny homes on foundations. And and that's we've adopted that code already. You, already that, that can okay. be done in this county right now. You can build a tiny home on a foundation anywhere that you can build a single family dwelling. It's it's a single family dwelling, just like any other house. It's just 400 square feet um, and has some special provisions for lofts and stairways because it's so small. Um, these are different. These are tiny homes on wheels and we need to maintain that distinction uh, by keeping the wheels on. Okay, um, thank you. I have two last questions here. Uh, on code section, on the design code section, section one F3 states mechanical equipment that's not incorporated within the structure shall be screened from public view and shall not be located on the roof. Electrical and plumbing hookup shall similarly be screened from public view. A question on this one, just in the fact that it seems a little, like we don't require this on single family homes. We don't require this anywhere else. We saw some pictures in the presentation where, you know, the mechanical unit wasn't covered. And sometimes they can't be, depending on how it, you know, it's built with fans and things like that. And then the second thought there is that, you know, say you had a taller roof structure and you need, or you needed a fan on the roof for the bathroom, you know, to push the air out. This code would seem to eliminate like a rooftop fan. And it's a little bit, you know, I'm just wondering like if, what's the purpose for this? Could it be eliminated without causing too much damage to the intent? Just to reduce requirements and make this just a little bit easier and more standard and more in line with what we already do as single family homes and ADUs. 
um, it, point taken. I, I I think that what the 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 reason for that provision in the ordinance I, I think came out of the last planning commission discussion, um, where I think I think that we had talked to the staff had talked about um, incorporating all of the mechanical equipment within the structure, and I and I think the planning commission wanted to allow a little bit of more flexibility on that and. And, and so that's where that language came from, but um, Wait a sure. Minute, Tim, why, why not? I mean, you know, you, you don't want a lot of people build homes who have like different, you know, utility stuff, build little fences around them. I don't see why that, that's just a courtesy to passers by. I don't see that as being onerous in any way. When you put a fan on top of your house, no one's going to make you build a fence around it. I think we're thinking we have a bunch of apparatus on the ground and most people do that in their neighborhoods anyway. I, yeah, the, I wouldn't support taking that out. I think the key the key words there are public view. So you're right. When you said passersby, that's what that's our intent, public view. So I mean, if if the tiny on one wheels is on a parcel that's way off the road and you can't see it, then this doesn't apply. Understood. Okay, that helps clear that up. Okay. Um, last question I had is one from one of the members of the public and some of the communication, and I had the same question. Can you confirm what the code distance between a tiny human wheel and an existing building is? So excuse me, I made that phrase out of purpose. The distance between the two buildings. What it? What is it actually? Right. I think for um, for a non ADU, I think it's ten feet. But um, there's specific uh, provisions in the ADU regulations that allow for four four feet, or maybe it's three. But yeah, if it's if it functions as an ADU, there, there's it's subject to the um, the setback requirements in the ADU regulations. Okay, so it'll essentially be whatever the similarly to the rest of the codes, whatever the single family or the ADU or JADU code is. Yeah, that's yeah. what it'll apply. Okay. Right, minimum separation distance between ADUs and other structures shall be three feet. That's that's in the ADU regulations. Okay, understood. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. That is all my questions. So if anyone else has any, I'd love to hear them. Otherwise, you can move on to uh, public comment at this time. No others? Okay. Great. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. That was a uh, rapid fire. Lots of questions. We appreciate that. Oh, thanks. Uh, no, thanks for all those questions. I anticipated that definitely because of okay. the nature of what we're doing here. It's, yeah. it's, it's new territory. <laughs> yeah, complicated. Okay. Um, then we can go ahead and close the discussion or questions at this time and move on to public comment. Ms. Drake, do we have any members of the public that would like to speak on the matter? We do, Chair. Um, so if we could get three minutes um the timer for three minutes put up i'll call on members of the public everyone will have three minutes to provide comment um and let's just see if we can get the timer going here and then i'll start calling on folks awesome so i'll start with someone by the name of gc good morning if you could please state your name for the record Good morning. If you could unmute yourself, GC, and state your name for the record. <clears throat> Looks like that person is having difficulty unmuting. Um, we will come back to you, GC. I will move on to Jeffrey Ellis. Good morning. Please state your name for the record. Hmm. Looks like we're having issues with folks unmuting. Oh, hi, this is Jeffrey Ellis. Can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Um, so in a previous uh, study session for this ordinance, uh, we were told that uh, 
in, in other jurisdictions that have tiny home ordinances that uh, relatively small number of such units have been constructed. Um, however, um, you know, th these are other places uh, with other ordinance, uh, other economic situations and, and social situations. Um, so I'd like to suggest that at least for the first few years uh, that the county would have a quota, a maximum number of uh, units that would be permitted uh, just to see how the ordinance functions to be able to, to make changes if changes are found to be necessary. Um, and, and just as an example, uh, where there might be issues, uh, looking at the staff report um, under design criteria F1, where it says uh, incorporate design features and materials typically used in houses, such as siding or roofing material, uh, et cetera. So one interpretation is uh, that a guy could take a, a travel trailer uh, go over to Home Depot, uh, get a single roofing tile, glue the roofing tile to the top of the roof of the travel tailor, and voila, claim that that's a tiny home. Um, and because these permits are issued ministerially and, and there's no discretion, uh, every application is potentially uh, a, a lawsuit against the county if, if that permit uh, application is denied. So the, the reason I bring this up is, is not to suggest that you refine the wording now, but simply that you uh, allow yourself uh, time to get experience by limiting the number of uh, units uh, that are permitted each year, at least for the first few years. Thank you, I'm done. Thank you, Jeffrey. All right, let's check back in with GC and see if this person is able to unmute. Good morning, GC. Will you please state your name for the record? You need to unmute yourself. All right, looks like still trouble there with unmuting. Um, do you see, you might want to try calling in. Uh, we have the number posted right on the planning department's web page. That might be easier. Um, I'll move on to the next person and we'll, and we'll also check back in with GC. I'm seeing a hand raised by Alex Vartan. Um, good morning, Alex. Will you please restate your name for the record? Hi, uh, Alex Vartan. Um, I just wanted to call in to support uh, the more um, expansive uh, option uh, of using tiny houses as single family residences. Um, and just to make note, um, the uh, especially because the, the new lot split um, state law I think in practice has and is going to be pretty difficult uh, for people to um, implement. And we have a lot of marginal parcels in this county, especially in Live Oak that are larger, they've got space on them, but um, have other issues with, you know, um, which would be otherwise good candidates for um, a lot split, um, but have issues with, you know, sizing a full size single family home on um, on the split lot. And I think um, that uh, adding, uh, getting, being able to use a tiny house on wheels um, as a residence, especially in that uh, scenario is, is really important. So I would just encourage that. Second thing I want to um, remark on is sort of a subtle, uh, a subtle issue in the way um, 
the proposed ordinance is written, and I believe this is the intent of it, that this ordinance and these definitions apply um, to tiny house on wheels as used in residential zones. Um, the tiny house on wheels, I'm familiar with tiny houses. I have one built um, in another jurisdiction. And um, tiny house on wheels, as written in this code, looks like it is used um, the park trailer definition. But a tiny house on wheels that um, can also be uh, seen as a um, as an RV or travel trailer if it's 10 feet, I think eight feet wide as well. Um, so in commercial zones like RV parks, it the, it, it is already allowed to uh, use a have a tiny house there because a tiny house is also a travel trailer. Um, and in those zones and locations, I would hate for us to uh, wrangle um, residents of uh, those travel trailer parks in with um, uh, single family residential zone intent because um, they could be a big upgrade for people uh, who have been living there long term. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Alex. All right, I'm gonna check back in with GC and see if we can manage to unmute. So GC, I'm gonna go back to you. You should have an option. I'm asking you to unmute. I'm clicking on a request for you to unmute, see if you can accept that. Um, and are you seeing a pop-up asking you to unmute? I'm not seeing that you were unmuting. Hmm. All right, I'll check back in with GC. Um, just wanna remind you, you can call in as well. Um, I will move on to Angie. I'm um, Joycelyn, why don't you read the number to call in out? Okay, I'll read that number again. Um, Hold on, let me grab it. <laughs> so the phone number again, if you're having trouble unmuting or connecting via the Teams link is 669-900-6833. And the collaboration code is 814-8152-8833. And this information is also posted on the planning department's homepage, sccoplanning.com. And also you can email Michael Lamb at michael.lamb at santacruzcounty.us. Um, okay, so, so the instructions, again, it could be just a hand of someone who also isn't intending to speak also. Sometimes hands just pop up, so. It's hard to tell. All right, I'm going to move on to Angie. Um, good morning, Angie. Will you please state your full name for the record? You have three minutes. Hi, this is Angie Prebor. Can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Hi, yeah, it's it's kind of odd. I use Zoom all the time and there are no unmute buttons showing up on this Zoom for some reason. Uh, oh. Thank you for letting me talk. I have a question around the requirement for meters. What, uh, can you talk to the requirements on a private well? Um, we certainly would hook it up to a private well, but requiring a specific meter, um, I wanted to understand the details around that, if that is required, or if it can just be hooked up to the well and all's well. Andy, um, thanks for that question. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I should say we can, uh, we'll come back after public comment and uh, ask the question. Okay. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, Chair. Thanks, Angie. All right, I will, um, I'll try GC. <laughs> I still see hand raised, so let me see if I can get GC to connect. I did just text our, 
our Zoom facilitator as well to see if there's something else I can suggest. Um, so GC, are you still with us and hoping to speak? If so, see if you can unmute yourself. If you're calling in that, that you pressed um, star six to unmute yourself. Awesome. If there's no unmute button on the other side for people calling in, how did how did they unmute? I mean, a couple of people figured it out. Um, I usually see a pop up that says um, you're being requested to unmute. Oh, gotcha. Um, so. Um, Olivia, if you can give GC permission to talk, that would be great. I don't know if there's something I'm doing. Usually this works just fine. Um, you have permission, GC, to talk, so you do need to unmute yourself. Hmm, I should see a pop-up. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure what's happening with this one person here. Um, well, we do have another hand raised, so we'll go over to Jen for now and see if we can work something out with GC. Um, Jen Levini, good morning. Please restate your name for the record. You have three minutes. Hi, my name's Jennifer Levini, and I'm a local housing attorney and author of the Tiny Home Law Book. Um, and I wanted to just uh, weigh in on a couple of questions that the commissioners asked. One of them is there were a couple of questions about how the elect how the uh, utility hookups. Well, first I want to thank you all for doing this, the commissioners and the staff. You're doing an amazing job. Um, and I wanted to just say something about the electrical hookups and utility hookups. Um, that is that. Uh, the state of California has health and safety code section. 18030.5, which specifically prohibits adopting any local ordinance or regulations which conflict with state standards for manufactured homes, mobile homes, recreational vehicles, commercial coaches, or special pur purpose coaches, and that would apply to these tiny homes on wheels. And there um, references health and safety code section 18550 which is our state standard, which regulates the connection for gas, water, electricity, and sewage connections for RVs and tiny homes. This isn't a code that the, um, the county can create. This is already regulated at the state level. But just to answer your questions of what that typically looks like, typically what happens is there is a trench that's dug that conduit for electricity and pipes for water run through the trench and at the end of the trench next to the tiny home or it's the same for mobile homes or rvs there's a small tower that sticks up from the ground and that at that tower the rv tiny home or mobile home is connected to water electricity um, and then there's often some kind of sewer connection. So this isn't uh, inventing the wheel. This is something that already is, exists um, and is already regulated at the state level, it does not need to be in the local ordinance. Um, and the other question was about other ordinances in the state that have renewal periods. No other ordinances in the state have any kind of renewal. They all just have, once you're permitted, you're permitted permanently, this is something new that Santa Cruz is trying to create. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much again for working your work on this um, ordinance. Thank you, Jen. All right, I'm gonna go back to our list of callers and attendees. Um, just wanna remind anyone who wishes to speak on this item to raise your hand. Um, by pressing star nine on your phone or raising your hand using the hand icon on the Zoom app. GC's hand is no longer raised, so I'm just going to leave that alone. Um, and I am not seeing any 
additional callers chair. Um, I'll turn it back over to you. I did want to just quickly before you go back to discussion, report back that I looked back at the recovery center's website and um, the temporary housing units for CZU, um, temporary housing um, units are required to be connected to a permanent source of water, sewage disposal, so septic and electricity. So just wanted to report back on that. Great, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to the members of the public for the uh, comments. Really appreciate those. Some good um, questions came out of it. And, uh, and at this point, we'll close the public comment and bring the item back to the commission for discussion. Um, it's all right. I'd like to ask Mr. Carlson to start with just a few responses to some of the questions from the community that came up. Um, start with the requirements for a private well. Can you explain that a little bit? So to connect to a private well would require approval of that water supply system by the environmental health department and then and hook up to that. There, there's not a requirement by the county planning department for a meter necessarily for that. that that's you're hooking up to your own private well. You're not required to meter that. Um, in, unless there's some separate program with environmental health for metering with respect to um, you know water resources management or something like that, but um, I, I don't think that's the case currently. But I, I know that there's been some ideas regarding that in the past. But for the purposes of, of permitting it uh, to a private well, there's not a meter requirement for that. The, the meter requirement would apply to a, a, an established water utility that would that would want to meter the water for the purposes of charging you. Great, understood, thank you very much. Um, there is a well permit you have to get to when you drill the well with the well, the registered well, well driller. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That would have to be, that water supply would have to be approved by environmental health. Because you kind of want that because you get the water tested and et cetera. As a well owner, that's a good thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, great, thank you. Um, question came up about this code being used in residential zones and how it affects commercial zone. I'm trying to make sure I got this, but I think the question was around like existing trailer home properties, like where mobile homes aren't allowed, or excuse me, not mobile homes, trailer homes are an allowed use currently. I think that was the question. Oh, okay. Well, this this would not affect anything regarding a, a existing mobile home park. Yeah. Um, this only applies to um, properties where the county is authorized to issue permits for single family dwellings. So, so it doesn't. This doesn't overlap with any all any all the separate requirements that apply to uh, or regulations that apply to mobile mobile home parks. Okay. No mobile home parks, and then. Um... Thank you. I think there was like a question about the commercial zoned areas where a ton, uh, like a trailer could already be used. I think there's like, you know, separate like RV parks, like things like that. Are, is this going to affect those in any way? No, no. And you, and you, and I, and I think I heard from one comment, maybe it was getting to the, to the issue of, using, you know, sort of modifying existing RV to make it look like a tiny home, that wouldn't be allowed. The, the tiny home on wheels needs to be certified as manufactured and constructed to that ANSI standard, which is, it, it, which results in tiny homes on wheels that look like the pictures that I showed you in the slideshow. Well, We're not talking about RVs that you see driving down the road uh, to the, to the rec, to the RV park. That's not what we're talking about here. Well, I'd like to further clarify that because even a couple callers said, well, whether it's an RV or a tow or... So an RV is not a tow because a tow is built to specific building standards, to those standards you just... Why is an RV not a thrower? Why is a tow and not an well, RV? Well, actually, the, the definition of a recreational vehicle in state law has two parts to it. One part is your traditional... RVs that you, fifth wheel trailers that you see at campgrounds. 
that are towed by trucks or driven and have or have integrated com internal combustion engines and you drive them down the road. Um, the other, the second part of the definition of a recreational vehicle in, in uh, state law is a park trailer. And a park trailer has a, is, is separately defined as what we're talking about here. Um, and there's that ANSI standard that applies to park trailers. So, so we're, we're talking about park trailers. We're not talking about which, which, which are a type of recreational vehicle, but we're not talking about the types of recreational vehicles that I think some people have in mind here. We're not talking about the ones that you typically see at a campground being towed by a truck um, that have wild designs on them that are made out of plastic and metal and that sort of thing. That's that's not what we're talking about here. Those, those don't require any special permit from the DMV. You can take those on vacation. Um, what we're talking about here is park trailers that are built to a specific standard and look like tiny houses. So when, when I come into the planning department and I have been told that I can get a pretty easy to get a permit for a tiny home, I'm going to be presented with a definition of what my tiny home needs to be, i.e. this park trailer definition. So it'll be very clear because I think it's quite, it is in fact very confusing because you, as you just said, it's not an RV, but it is a park trailer. Um, and there are, are specific differences. And I think whatever permitting is involved, because there will still be a permit, even if it's, it's a not too complicated or expensive one, the people really need to know what they're getting into here, clearly. Because it's easy to confuse these. What the, you say? It, that, the, the ordinance is clear that that they need to be certified as meeting that ANSI standard for park trailers. I'm just and saying to to avoid any more planning commission counter bad interactions, it's got to be we can make clear when people step up with one conception and are going to be clearly informed of what the actual ordinance is. A question on that note. If someone goes to build a single family home or something else, they go to the code, they look at what it says, and then they do that thing, right? So in my perception of this, you know, it says you can build based on these standards. It has to look like this thing. You know, there's pictures that they can go back and review. To me, it's, I guess I'm just saying it's not as confusing as maybe as it sounds because we've kind of got to this point where it's got the right verbiage, right? Um, so. And, you know, it, oh, I was going to say, like, you know, it, I think that, and then on top of that, there is a permit process. So someone would have to come in and say, hey, here's the thing I want to do. Does this work? Yes or no? And then go from there, right? So I, I guess I'm not understanding the confusion from Commissioner Shepard. I wonder if, like, if there's any clarification that would even need to happen or if this is not, like, clear enough. Only because, go ahead. Commissioner Dan. I just was wondering if I could weigh in at this point yes, and please. move this along. I think what Commissioner Shepard is saying is she's just, I think what would maybe solve what she's trying to address is maybe like a brochure that describes what a tiny home on wheels is that could be made available um, to the public in the area and the fourth floor where we have a display of brochures. I think that might just satisfy what she was um, trying to get at. Um, and then if I could just um, move along now, I had a couple of comments if, if it's the appropriate time to do Please, yes. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, thank you. <clears throat> so I have one small question and then some comments that, and then hopefully we can get to the point where we're ready for a motion. Um, I wanted to know if the other jurisdictions that you looked at define JADUs, or de define tiny homes as wheels, on wheels as, being able to be counted as a JADU, or is that something that we are singularly looking at doing ourselves? That's that's correct. I'm not aware that uh, other jurisdictions are mentioning them in their ordinances as junior ADUs. It's pretty consistent uh, that the other jurisdictions are allowing them as just new new construction ADUs. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so I would say um, I am not comfortable as count, uh, counting a a tiny home on wheel is a JADU at this point until the state 
has changed their definition. I think that we have been pretty consistent in this commission as being uh, consistent with the state definitions, and I think we should continue to do so. I'm not comfortable um, going sideways from the state at this point. Um, so I would be supporting not defining the tiny home on wheels as a JADU at this time. Um, um, but what would you be supporting counting them as then? An ADU. Okay. Or, so there's two, some options given to us. And one of the options is not to count them as a, not to not that you would not be able to define it as a JADU and one that you would be. And I am indicating that I am not supportive defining the though as a JADU at this time because it is inconsistent with. No, I, I understand, but you are. Yeah, please. Can, defining. can I just get through my comments? I've, um, thanks. Um, I'm also um, be open to not allowing them in driveways. I think that when we have had this come up in the past, it creates a lot of conflict to allow uh, a tiny home on wheel in a driveway. So at this time, I would not be supportive of allowing them in driveways. Um, uh, I also wanted to suggest that before this gets to the board, that if you look at other counties um, and talk to other counties or cities um, and ask them what is working, that you also ask them what is not working so that we can um, create an ordinance and learn from what's not working in other areas to minimize uh, conflict. Um, I also want to be sure that tiny home on wheels um, be only allowed where single family homes are. And I understand the ordinance currently says this. I just want to emphasize that I think that that's important for the time being that we only allow them where single family homes are allowed. Um, I also would be supportive of um, within the urban services line, disallowing tiny home on wheels to use generators at all. I think that if you're in a within the urban services line, um, having a tiny home on wheels, relying on a generator for part of their energy use um, is just a recipe for conflict. And in the rural areas, we already have a lot of issues with excessive generator use. Um, so I think that it would be magnified if that were the case in the urban services line. So. Um, I, and if there's a motion, I hope that that's included in the motion. And then lastly, I just want to say that um, I believe this will be an iterative process. This is our first crack at regulating and allowing tiny homes on wheels. So I think the best way to craft these ordinances is to be conservative at the beginning. And then as we see how it goes, that we come back and take a look. And I would be supportive of, of having a review of this ordinance, either in a year or when we have a certain number of permits that we've issued so that we have something to take a look at. Maybe that's 25, maybe that's 50 tiny home on wheels permits. And then we can have something come back to the commission if staff thinks that that's appropriate to review and possibly make modifications to this ordinance. So that's it for me, thank you. Chair Gordon, if I may. Yes, thank you, Commissioner Dan. Please go ahead, Commissioner Violante. Thank you. Yeah, I, I appreciate Commissioner Dan's comments. Many of them are very in line with the ones I, I have myself. I appreciate her saying that she uh, is not supportive of them in driveways. That's actually one of my comments as well, it's, it's especially my comments were going to be put a focus on um, the, the, the coastal zone in particular. I, I think that by allowing them in driveways, we um, even if it, I know the staff report said that it, but we weren't going to allow them to take away required parking, but I think that it's an issue and it takes away parking in general, uh, especially in the coastal zone, because ultimately what we, we unintentionally do is create on the street parking impacts. And I, and I don't want to see that happen, especially as um, we're already um, intensifying 
urbanized development, we are reducing our parking requirements. And I, I'd hate to see us take away parking that already exists um, by, by this type of development. So I support Commissioner Dan's um, idea that we don't, we disallow them in those driveways. I, I, I share her concern. I, I, I do not want to see us be contrary to state regulation about JADUs um, and be inconsistent with their definition about them being an attached unit. And so I don't support um, allowing these as JADUs. I, I have to say I, I am concerned about the idea that these units will not be contributing um, property tax. I think it's essential that they help support the facilities and service um, provided by the county and other agencies that are dependent on these. And so I um, just, I just want to raise that concern in general because you could have ultimately, potentially, I would say, um, at least an option one, three units that weren't providing property tax to support the services of three housing units. And so I, I agree with Commissioner Dan that it's important we start conservatively um, and recognize the impacts of these on our area and our community. Um, I, I think I alluded to this in my previous comments that I, I have some concerns about the idea that these are both permanent and impermanent. Um, the HCD is asking us to meet certain circumstances that include this idea that they are have a sense of permanence, but we're not requiring them to be on a, this foundation and this, I feel like the ordinance in some ways is incomplete. It's a very good beginning, um, but the fact that we don't have our own definition of what permanent removal is, um, are we okay with them leaving three months or six months? I just, I worry that we need to to, to say what is okay when a, a unit is removed because we want these units to provide housing for our community. We want them to provide uh, a place for people to be part of, of our place. And the intention is that they be here a long time. And I want to ensure that they are here a long time. They are providing housing. And so for, to that end, I think it's essential that we do have permit renewal. It is not out of the ordinary that we require renewal and check-ins. We do it for vacation rental permits. We do it for things like cannabis ordinances where we have this kind of recertification and renewal process that requires either staff to do an inspection or to, um, to Chair Gordon's point, even if it was a self-certification, I think that that's essential um, that we include that kind of language um, to, uh, in our recommendation to the, the Board of Supervisors that we do not eliminate that. I know the hack was split, um, but I, and my recommendation would be that we, we maintain uh, that language that there's either a three or five year renewal process because we want these housing units to become part of our, our um, community. Uh, so that's the direction I'm going. I, I would be to not to, to, to not do the, the option that allows them as JE to use um, and to continue requiring um, some sort of permit renewal uh, and so that we, we ensure that they are staying here. Um, so that that's, those are kind of my comments. I think I touched on everything that I was hoping to. Thank you, uh, Chair Gordon. Thank you, Commissioner Violante. Commissioner Lazenby, did you want to have any comments on this? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I agree with Commissioner Dan and Commissioner Violante's uh, remarks. I did not understand one thing that uh, you said, Commissioner Dan, about was it not allow generators or not make that a requirement if you have solar panels? I am actually in favor of, of not allowing generators for tiny home on wheels. Um, right. So they would, this would be within the urban services line. Okay, thank you. And um, while we're making changes or suggestions to the ordinance, will it have the two options also, except that um, if, you know, would it be cleaned up and still use the formatting where it says option two and option three? Because I would have a suggestion on option three that we correct the lettering on page 20. It has two number H's and the last one should be an I. 
for making it. those corrections, I have one of those too. <laughs> go, go for it. In, in, the in the definition, you need a comma. Well, okay. I have those for the resolution. I, I'll get to that when we get there. Okay, that's that's all I have on the um, on the ordinance. Thank you. Okay, I'll. Um, Tim, do you want to go and I'll go last? Oh, you go, go ahead, ahead, Commissioner Shepard. That's okay. Uh, I agree with uh, Commissioner Violante. Uh, let's see, did I unmute myself? Yes. With Commissioner yeah. Violante and Commissioner Dunn, um, I think they should be allowed only as they do. I do not think we should allow parking in driveways. I agree with no generators in urban areas. I need to ask Mr. Carlson. The whole valley is not rural. For example, if you live in Felton, you're just as close to your neighbor as if you lived in Live Oak. So I'm thinking maybe we ought, might consider, and I would look to the planning department to help define this, but I was thinking maybe not in RR too. Because like the towns of Ben Loman, Boulder Creek, and Felton are urban essentially in terms of the spaces between houses. So that would still pertain. So whatever the zoning is in all the towns, which I think would be rural residential. To do that, we could recommend including the rural services line as well. That would incorporate the, the areas of Felton and, and much of the yes. areas. You're, you're, so yeah. we, we, we could add to, to, if Commissioner Dan is open to it, we could out, we could say there were no generators allowed in the rural services line as well, which is the areas you're talking about, which are also more dense, um, but not as dense as the uh, urban services line. Uh, yes, I agree. And also, I had one. So... I agree with what's been proposed 100%. I did have one question. Would these foes, if established, count toward growth, can the annual count we get for number of new units in the county and when we set the new uh, numbers for each year, would they count for in that? Yes, that's that's the goal. In not not just in the state, but in terms of our own ordinance for growth control, which is sort of pro forma at this time since we'd never met it, but they would count, wouldn't they? Yes. Okay. So I agree with what has been proposed strongly and would support um, a motion if Commissioner Dan wants to move ahead or Allison wants to move ahead, but we haven't heard from Commissioner Ford yet. Sure. Thank you. Yes. Um, I appreciate all the feedback and the comments. Um, and I just had a couple follow-up questions. With the JADUs, I definitely understand the concern of being in line with state code, but I wanted to understand if, let me back up a step. In some cases, we are allowed to be more lenient than state law. And is this one of those cases where we can say we want to count it as a JADU, or are we just like really going against what state law is by allowing it to be a JADU? That's a good. That's a good question. I um, I don't know how I've, if I have an answer to that. I it certainly is a conflict, um, but it does. It it, it could. You know, maybe in a rare circumstances, it could lead to a circumstances in which, say, um, a tiny home on wheels was permitted as a junior ADU. Um, how, at, on site with an existing single family dwelling. And then the property owner came back later and said, I still have a right under state law to do a junior ADU contained within my existing house. And then we'd be getting, it, it just, I don't, I'm not sure we want to go there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, my concern is that the definition for a JADU and the definition for a tiny home on wheels are completely different. So how could we say a JADU can be a tiny home on wheels if then you look at the definitions and a tiny home on wheels is definitely by definition, not a JADU. So I just think we're setting ourselves up for all sorts of problems. And let me just say, now that this is being brought up, I am almost 100% sure there is a state bill being crafted at this moment to deal with this issue. And <laughs> I, I 
would think within a year it'll be uh, remedied. So I don't think we should remedy it here. I think we should just sit tight. And then I would just say also on substance, um, it presents a completely different policy consideration for us in that we would be considering two tiny home on wheels in a single family parcel rather than one. And I think that that presents a whole other set of issues as far as compatibility. So there's kind of two, two issues to think about when, um, when considering this definition. Which yeah, must be the you. reason the other, the other municipalities have gone with considering them not considering JDU. So I think those, that's good rationale. I'd be inclined to follow that. Um, Commissioner, or excuse me, Mr. Carlson, did you have any other comments on there? I didn't know if I was going to interrupt you there. I, I, I mean, I guess I actually would agree. I mean, it, just laying them as an ADU is the simplest, most straightforward um, initial path, and that's what other jurisdictions have done. Um, okay. And uh, if I, I, I going, if I could, just just stepping back a little bit, um, I wanted to clarify that you know I was I was explaining how this doesn't affect the regulations in um, RV parks. You you could. You know, it, this, I'm, I'm not saying that you would not be able to put a tiny home on wheels in a, a mobile home park or a recreational vehicle park, but that that just would that would not be regulated by the county. Um, and so I just wanted to make that clarification. And then also, um, I, I'm not 100 percent certain that the the ANSI standard. Can, well, one of the reasons why we have the the aesthetic design requirements in, in, in this ordinance and then also referring to them in the ADU ordinance is because the ANSI standard may not um, provide that level of aesthetic um, uh, criteria. So we wanted to just make sure that these things look like houses, like the pictures that I showed and not, um, it, 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 while allowing for some creativity, of course, um, but I wouldn't want to rely completely on the ANSI standard in, in terms of how these how, how these would look in, in strict compliance with the ANSI standards. We, we, so we wanted to have some local criteria just for design standards to make them look like houses. Thank you. Okay, understood. Um, question for other commissioners here, you know, the concern about permanence, I wasn't clear if there is uh, an adjustment that wanted to be made for that. Um, and I just, you know, my thought on it is that, you know, we have mobile home parks, which are not permanent, right? And the ability to, everyone has the ability to move their mobile home if they wanted to. However, the reality is that it doesn't happen hardly ever. Um, so, you know, that tied with the idea that like someone is paying a lot of money to put this thing, per, you know, on their property, they're getting a permit, they're paying fees, they're getting sewer, power, water, you know, all the things makes me inclined to think that people wouldn't really want to do that short term. Um, and so, you know, I'm feeling that the permanence thing will probably is maybe not um, doesn't make me as nervous. But I, so I wanted to understand if there was some kind of change that was being requested to accommodate that, or if it's just a concern that's being voiced, I think. I mean, it's a it's a concern of mine. I mean, so the difference is when you have mobile home parks, they are assessed as property, and and they're these are not. Um, and so my concern is we are we are going down a path where we are allowing for a type of dwelling unit that is admittedly impermanent and not contributing through assessments and participation through to the county process. Um, and there are already paths to people building tiny homes. Um, and what we're saying that, and that would be assessed, right? That would be contributing to property taxes. That would be without question, it would be part of RENA. Um, and yet we are creating this alternative path that says, no, this is a tiny home on wheel. This is, this is, um, this is, this is property, but in, in the tangible sense, not the dwelling unit arena assessment. And, and so it's a, I just want to raise that concern. We need to recognize what we're actually saying, and we need to be honest about whether or not this is how 
this is benefiting our community and if it's benefiting the county because the type of housing we're building um, is, is very different and whether or not it is housing and the permanence of it is, is just different, Commissioner Gordon. Um, sure. Because it, it can be, and it, it's not that I'm worried. Some, I mean, I do worry, actually, I shouldn't, I should be honest. I do worry that people could choose to live here six months and move it six months. And that's, that's it is a reality. And it is a slight concern of mine um, because they could have the same infrastructure, say, in Arizona, it doesn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, and part of that is that they're not paying property tax here and they're not necessarily having that same type of con contribution to, our community versus if we just said no it's a tiny home they they would and so I think we need to be honest about the pathway and what type of housing we're providing and I just think it's important that we contemplate that um, in an open and honest way as it is as or if we build uh, this ordinance because it's a big change I mean um, Commissioner Shepard raised this at the beginning which is your property taxes are what pays you know Mr. Carlson's you know, salary. It's what paves your road. It's what provides for our health director. It's what it what pays for your sheriff when they arrive at your door. Um, it's actually what pays for your part of the schools. Um, and we're saying this type of housing won't be contributing towards that. Um, and I think we just need to be honest about is the the other side of that you know lever, which is like it does the good of being able to build this type of housing outweigh giving that up and I just think we need to be we we need to have a candid conversation about that um versus if we just said well you can still build a tiny home because we do as Mr. Carlson has said repeatedly that's already in the code you can already build a tiny home um on these properties and in this manner and I just think it's it'd be uh, a disservice to the public if we didn't have an honest conversation about what allowing tiny homes on wheels means um I would say that yeah. I, I agree because this is an experiment. We'll have to see how it goes. I mean, as someone who pays a lot of property taxes and relies on those services, especially here in the rural area for the fire district, the schools, and a lot of other things that I consider vital to the community, I want to see how this goes. And, and we need this kind of housing and we should try it. But I, I agree with Commissioner Violante and I, I would keep the permanent, the permit structure in just because we're, remember, we can always change this if it all works out wonderfully. But can I ask a clarifying question on this issue of, of this section H2? Um, so Commissioner Violante, were you suggesting that to be more clear and more fair that we remove the word permanent? Because I see that someone could I mean, I, I, your point is well taken, I guess, is what I'm saying. And I'm trying to think of a way to remedy this. And one way is to just take away permanent. But then, and I, I, I appreciate, Commissioner Dan, I appreciate you bringing that up. I, 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 my point is, I think, I think that would be an interesting way to, to remedy that. Um, it, that, that would, I, I just, I appreciate that. Um, and that could be, that absolutely could be. Um, a way to remedy it because then we would know we're building permanent housing and these people would be because the point the point is to build housing right the point is to say we're willing to give up these things in order to build housing that's my point right you, it, it has to be worth it and, and yeah maybe removing the word permanent would solve that it also is a subjective standard yeah yeah that might just be a very simple and, and very elegant Solution. Okay, so I appreciate your experience on the commission being able to find such an elegant solution, Commissioner Dan. <laughs> Evidence of your experience here. Yeah. <laughs> so, sorry, Commissioner Gordon. For no, that's okay. No, I appreciate there. it. I think that was a really good solution there, and I think <laughs> that you know, for me, that that kind of solves at least from what I can see here, kind of solves the issue. And I think one thing that you brought up, Commissioner Dan, which would be really great, is a check-in. You know, in a year or two years or whatever it is, and like you know, see how it's going. Um, so are you changing permit condition H2 on page 12? Correct. Uh, yeah. Are you taking out the word, the fell permit shall expire when the fell is conveyed to a new owner or upon removal? Or I don't, I'm not sure I understand. Yes? Okay, got it. Um, Chair Gordon, I, yes. could I add that 
We do our annual reporting to HCD on new housing units um, permitted and constructed. And, you know, in, in the notes column, we, we note whether there's single family dwellings or ADUs and, and we would be noting that these are, you know, if it was a tiny home on wheels. So there would be a, an annual reporting um, that, go, that goes to the Board of Supervisors and then we submit that report to the, um, uh, well, actually it goes to the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors. It's the general plan annual report that we do mm -hmm. every year. And so you'll see you'll see the reporting of, of the number of units and, and the type of units permitted every year. Do we in that report get like a, I can't remember, you know, there's a lengthy report. Is there like a homes that were demolished and not replaced? category or something like that, that we could say, okay, we've got, you know, we had 20 tiny homes permitted, but now people have taken 12 of them away. This isn't really working. Yes. Yeah. We would, in, in the case of uh, development that would be demolishing one or more units and then building one or more units. Yeah. That would be accounted for in that report. Um, and I could, I mean, I, I guess I could see in the future, based on the monitoring, if the tiny home on wheels was removed from the property, that we would have to go back and do a, re, a correction to the report that it's no longer there. Um, so would so that, someone, oh, okay, sorry. You know, we, we would have to, yeah, if, if it's no longer there, then it no longer be, could no right. longer be counted as a, as a housing unit. So we'd have to, and, and we can do this. We've done it in the past where we've, discover oh. new data or whatever, you, you can always go back. HCD allows us to go back and submit, you know, um, corrections or updates to past year's reports. Okay, thank you. Um, so in the brought, like just from a process question, if somebody's like, you know, I, I'm going to take this thing to Arizona and I'm, I'm done in Santa Cruz, what do I, like, what do they do? Do they have to like request a demolition permit? Because that's kind of what you do if you're going to take your single family home down. Um, or is it just like five years later when we get to our reporting, we realize it wasn't there and now we have to redo five years of bringing the numbers and five years of, you know, is there a way to clean that up a little bit? Uh, there, yes. I mean, the only way I think you can clean that up is require annual reporting, not three year or five year yeah, re sure. reporting. Um, and if it's removed from the property and the permit expires, uh, or, you know, we're not necessarily going to know about that. You know, they're not going to have to check in with us on their way out of town. Um, they don't stop by the county building. No, they don't stop by the planning department. <laughs> no. so um, we, but we would pick it up when they did renew it. Right, right. That, that would <clears throat> trigger it. So I think the renewal process is a good idea. So we know from that from that census point of view of knowing who and and kind of getting a sense of how the program's working because I think Commissioner Gordon's make a good point. If somebody moves, the housing unit goes with them and it would be good to pick it up. I think five years is reasonable for that, especially since we can count it for five years. <laughs> I mean, ho however, you know, all the infrastructure is still there. And so you have this property owner that has a parking pad that has the utility connections for a tiny home on wheels. And, and, and there's, so there's going to be, it's, I, I would, I would um, hazard to predict that there would be a, a new tiny home on wheels installed on that, uh, on that property in pretty short order. I mean, if the property owner wants to get some rental income from, from doing that or a tiny home on wheels owner is looking for a place to put their tiny home on wheels, I'm not sure that that, um, if a tiny home on wheels is removed from a property that it's going to be permanent. I think that you'll probably see an, a new tiny home on wheels moved does, in there pretty does, quick. Would the new owner need to register it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that would require a new permit. Yeah, the permit would be, would expire, and the new owner would need to get a permit. Could is there maybe if there is, I apologize, but is could we add something in the ordinance that says that the property owner, the permit holder, needs to notify some way that because I was thinking about the same thing that you just said, David, that if their tiny home on wheels tenant decides they want to move to Arizona, um, how would we know that? We wouldn't know that until we did our 
and say this is in year two, we would be three years behind knowing that they did that and then what would be the length of not having that housing unit. I mean, I didn't really wanna go down this rabbit hole, but um, you know, cause I, you know, you just, without having experience with this, we don't know what the issues are going to be, but I could see that, you know, then they could just not renew a permit and just get a new tiny home on wheels. How would we know that that is different? It was looked exactly the same. I, I don't know. I mean, it's, I'm relying on you guys to come up with some. Yeah, maybe yeah. we don't need to invent the wheel, but you will. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could, I mean, you could require that the permit be surrendered upon removal of the property, but how would we enforce that? How would we know? We wouldn't know. So, I no, mean, I think there are just some things that are going to happen that we'll have to figure out as this moves along. And wouldn't, we go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Adding a clause like that, you know, for a majority of people, I assume, you know, if it was a simple process, like an email, hey, I'm taking mm -hmm. this away. Um, I just don't think could, we could give us some, on, yeah. couldn't rely on that process, but a, a certain amount of people would comply. I agree. Couldn't hurt to add it. Um, yeah. Commissioner Lazenby, it looked like you might have had a comment there. And I well, I I think I had a question, but <laughs> the I've just been assuming that the property owner is going to be the owner of the site where the tiny home is, the tiny home on wheels, and also the owner of the tiny home on wheels. But and Mr. Carlson did bring up the idea that if, if I wanted to build a, a pad, let's say a parking place for a tiny home on wheels, then I could rent it out. But wouldn't I have to go through the permitting process to get that tiny home on wheels approved? Correct. Yes. Okay. But in that in that respect, you would find out that I had a different well I, that I had occupied that pad. Correct. Correct. We would even though yeah. I don't own that. So it could it could just pick up and go someday, right? And then we would never know. Yeah, um, say the guy, the owner of the tiny home on wheels found right. somebody with, who was going to rent their pad at a lower cost. They could pick up and move to the other, you know, next door neighbor who's renting their pad for lower. And then the permit holder would have an empty pad that he could then rent out to another tiny home on wheel owner. Or the owner of the single family <laughs> home could purchase their own tiny home on wheels permit that and rent it out to a tenant who did not own the tiny home on wheels. <laughs> I believe that this is all possible, right? Right. Yes. This I, is brave new world. <laughs> yes. my, con my concern that who would be that every time there's a new tiny home on the permitted site, that that new tiny home registers and meets the standards. Yes, that would be required. Um, that. It, it, that's in the ordinance that if um, the tiny home on wheels is conveyed to a new owner, um, the permit it, the expires. permit expires. Yeah, right. Yeah, and then um, on this point, um, I guess I'll just mention a couple of ideas that came up at the Housing Advisory Commission um, that I just recalled. They suggested um, on an annual basis that we could be checking DMV registration records. I don't know if we're it's possible for us to do that um, because they're supposed to be registered with the DMV. Um, uh, and then an annual fee. Uh, uh, it was a suggestion from a Housing Advisory Commission member that, of payment of an annual fee. And so, you know, if the annual fee is not paid, then that's an indication that maybe it's gone or that we need to not. contact them yeah. about paying their annual fee. <laughs> I had thought about that also, if I could respond to that really quick. And, you know, even if it was a minimal fee, 20 bucks, you know, something where people just like don't want to, they don't, like, who wants to pay 20 bucks for them they don't have. There's really no benefit to someone not like having this permit, but not having it there. 
you're right. So they have to do the reporting. They put in all the money for the infrastructure. Like there's not a ton of benefit outside of actually having a tiny home there. Um, so like, I think the reporting itself, if it was maybe more often or self-certified with a picture or something that just makes people report, you know, you know, 20 bucks, you know, something like that um, would effectively do what you're saying. However, I don't know that I want, you know, do we want to make people pay extra when we're considering how a single family home it, or ADU is, you know, people don't pay extra, uh, you know, to report or anything. But again, this is a kind of new territory. So well, other thoughts. Yeah. yeah. I'm wondering if maybe I could try to make a motion. Okay. Um, before uh, Commissioner Dan, I did have a few other comments oh, really okay. quickly, if that's okay. And yeah, we yeah, can definitely course. continue this conversation. Um, but it, um, just to respond to some other things that you had mentioned. So uh, the gas generators, I 100% agree with this. I think that that's a bad, I, I wouldn't be in support of gas generators for daily use of a junior or of an ADU or tiny on the wheels, excuse me. Um, is there a way to clarify, would someone like be uh, on board with me to make sure that, you know, if they're gonna use solar, it's actually checked at the local level where you do need to provide sun studies to show that your solar is going to work. Um, or what kind of, you know, what other things can we put in place to make it so that people aren't just sitting there running generators in any zone consistently and like providing housing or a rental to someone that's run on gas. You know, like if I was renting a place and I had to go get gas for my house every day, that wouldn't be an ideal scenario. So what kind of safeguards would it, you know, people be happy to put in there? Um, if through, through the chair of me, if I could provide yes, another please. comment on generators. Yeah. We, we do have an existing noise ordinance that addresses emergency generators and it provides for um, on residential properties, uh, the ability to install a, a permanent, a stationary permanent generator to power the home in, in a case of an emergency, only in, only in an emergency situation where there's a power cutoff, um, provided that the generator is, is low, is the property is big enough and the generator is located far enough away from property lines such that the Sa the the sound level coming from the generator does not exceed um, the county standards for sound levels at the property line, and so. Um, but that's that. You know, but that's a permanent installation. What most people have is when they wheel up and plug in. That's what we're talking about. Right. To, to, to do the installation of a permanent in place one involves a county inspection and a permit, and it's expensive. But to get Go to Home Depot and get a, you know, get a portable one that you plug in to, you know, that you can run on gas is what I think Commissioner Gordon's speaking to. Right. And that, that's an issue that we currently have um, countywide. Anybody can go to Home Depot and buy a portable generator and you don't, it, it, that plugs in, uh, I mean, that um, you can plug into and, and a permit is not required for that. And so, um, for the it, the ordinance, the, the noise ordinance I'm talking about, you're right? It it does just address stationary, um, permanent backup power supply generators. You know, like your Generac or type of generators. That, um, and we're we're talking some thousands of dollars to install. So that's not what we're trying to address here. We're talking about. Uh, people who would have solar installation that's not robust enough so that they would most of the time, or certainly when the power goes out, have their portable generator, gasoline generator on all the time. Uh, yeah, and so I guess maybe one way of addressing that would be, um, you know, in the ordinance right now, the language is that the if, if it's a off-grid situation and it's, there's a solar power system with battery backup that it have the ability to plug into a generator. Um, maybe go further and say that that if 
in fact, a generator is installed, it be according to the noise ordinance, it be a stationary backup generator that meets all the requirements in the noise ordinance for the location in relation to the property line to mitigate the no, uh, noise levels. Well, are we going to require a batteries too then? Because in the short term, if you have the deep storage batteries, which probably costs frankly more than the tiny house, but be that as it may, those that will come down in price. So you have a solar system with backup batteries, which takes you for a day or two. And then if you want a generator, it have to be permanently grounded. Is that what you're saying? Because having backup batteries can make some difference for sure. Yeah, and I think in general, where where you're going to really need the backup batteries is where you are off the grid. You are beyond PG&E power. So um, it's cheaper to invest in a solar power system with battery backup than to bring in a, a power lines from the nearest um, end of the line. Um, and so in those cases, those are going to, th those by definition are going to be pretty remote properties where, you know, they're the use of a generator is probably not not going to be an issue. Um, however, you know, we we still could have the requirement in the ordinance that um, that a any uh, that a backup generator, you know, not be a, a portable generator. It has to be a stationary installation, and it has to meet the requirements of the noise ordinance. Well, I, I have to yeah. say, living in the rural area, that would be, I think. Commissioner Gordon's on the right path there. I would support that simply because the built-in ones, the permanent, you know, the permanent generic types are way quieter than a backup gas one that you just, you know, run off a couple of gallons of gas. So I would support that. Do we need to specify Dan? that in the in this though? Yeah. I mean, isn't yes. it under wait, hold on. Isn't right. it understood that they would have to meet that? Uh, the, the generator ordinance? We could refer to that. Yeah, we could make a reference to that. We wouldn't necessarily but, have to restate it, but yeah, we but could make a reference. We, if we didn't reference it, wouldn't they still have to adhere to that section of the law of the code? Yes. Yes, okay. That was I, right. But I think for clarity's sake and for the neighbor's sake and for the person walking in the door and about to spend a bunch of money and time, letting them full disclosure saying, uh, you know, you need a solar system that's adequate. And if you want to have a generator, it ought to be installed. Yes. I think that, that should be clearly stated. I'm fine with that. I also want to move along. And there are many things that we could reference that they have to adhere to that are already part of our code. And I don't want to go through each and every one of those things. So I'm, can I try to make a motion now? It's going to be a very long multi-part motion. My, my only last thought that I have is that which I agree with you on the generators. If it's already referenced somewhere, you know, to me, either way, I'll, you know. Um, but my question is on the multifamily properties. So is this specifically excluded for an apartment style development? Like you couldn't put 10 of these on a, on a multifamily zone lots and rent them as apartments. If, can I ask Tim, because I thought of this when you brought this up before, if we have a vacant piece of land that's zoned multifamily, wouldn't we want to build to the highest density possible and a dozen uh, tiny homes would not even come close to reaching that density? That's a good question. Um, so technically the general plan and code says that you have to, you have to meet the densities in the general plan. So you're not tech, you know, the, the county shouldn't allow a developer to develop to less than the general plan densities already. So if you can't fit all of those tiny homes, so say it's for 30 units and you can't fit 30 based on the general plan, it's a, you know, the answer should, with lots of caveats, you know, would be no. So it's just how those units are built. And the reason that I'm concerned about this is because, you know, the main purpose of these um, tiny home on wheels is to really reduce our cost of housing. And the biggest thing right now is construction, right? Construction costs are through the roof. And this is a, is a means to a way to actually build some housing in a cheaper model. But you're talking about the stackable like type of module housing that like homeless service center is thinking of building. This isn't tiny homes on wheels. Isn't that. Like, right, that's a separate. How you get to the deal. density with 
tiny home on wheels for any <clears throat> any property that's zoned multifamily. So if you can't do it, then that's you know then that's fine. But say you have a large parcel that's zoned, you know, RM eight or something, you know, like where it's not actually a quite a high density it would be possible to fit enough tiny homes to meet that density and, and get us some, um, be like a more affordable housing. Chair, if, if I might, uh, yes. um, Thank you. good morning, everybody. It's still morning by two minutes. Um, uh, tiny homes villages was also a concept um, that the board wanted us to look at. And um, because this is so, new um, and tiny homes villages may um, result in increases in density that needed to be um, analyzed. We're, we're just talking about the single units. Um, we'll spend a little time with just that and then we'll um, come back and have a look at whether we actually want to be permitting tiny home villages. Um, so there will be an opportunity to kind of consider that um, multi-unit sort of concept, uh, in particular to provide, um, you know, supportive housing for folks or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I wanted to uh, just say that there will be kind of a part two. Uh, I, don't, I don't see it coming right away, but we, we certainly are um, aware that there were kind of two phases to, to, this, to this project. So um, if that helps kind of address that situation there there will be a discussion in the future on that thank you thank you um I'll, can I, go also ahead. oh go ahead oh, i was going to ask when that part two is expected or what's the plan we hit we have a lot on on our uh, uh plate so um i i don't think we're in a big hurry on, on it because we um have a lot of implementation to do with the uh, sustainability update. Uh, we're updating the housing element next year, um, so we we don't have a timeline for that. But but please be aware that there was a part two to to this project. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. I th I'm thinking limiting them to uh, replacing the otherwise allowed ADU only may address this question um, because. Um, you know, although I, 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 on multifamily zoned parcels, I think that requires attached units. And so, but, but at, at the same time, ADUs are also allowed on multifamily zoned parcels. So, um, just, just allowing them to function in place of an otherwise allowed ADU, I think would preserve, uh, the, the, the tiny home, the or, or would part would I think address I think address this concern. I mean, it wouldn't preclude mm -hmm. otherwise developing a, a multifamily zone parcel the the way it should be developed at a at a, a highest density possible with attached units. But at the same time, it would also still provide for the potential if it's large enough after you've maxed out the density with <laughs> attached units to possibly do it. A additional ADUs on that property, and by and then potentially those ADUs could be tiny homes on wheels. So, allowing them as just ADUs, I, th I think might address your concern in that regard. If you if if that makes sense. Yeah, I understand that. I appreciate that. So yes, because technically, if they're allowed as ADUs, then they would be allowed on a multifamily property as an ADU. Yeah. And uh, so I think that's great. I, you know, my preference would be to allow them anywhere. I think that's a great form of housing to reduce our, you know, housing costs. I do 100% understand and agree with Commissioner Riolante's comments about providing, you know, uh, like a tax basis and things like that. And I'm sure that there's going to be some, I'm hopeful, there's some state law that will, you know, clean that up. Um, but in the, for this one in particular, you know, if we remove the JED, what I didn't hear, and just to be clear with Commissioner Dan too, that you're not saying only ADU, you're saying the single family and the ADU. Is that correct? Or are you just saying you just want it to be just ADU? Uh, no, no. Um, just my only issue was uh, with the JADUs being defined as a tiny home on wheels. So, yeah, single family home, ADU. Yeah. Thank you. 
Okay, that was my last comment. <laughs> Um, I still have one question. I think you answered me earlier. So if we're, if Commissioner Dan's motion is going to include those as single fam as primary residents and as ADUs, I could have a 400 square foot go and build a 1200 square foot ADU on the same parcel. Right? No, no. You, well, unless your 1,200 square foot ADU was attached to your single family home. No, no, because then that would be larger than is allowed as a JADU. You could have a single family home, a JADU, and a tiny home on wheels. That's not what I'm asking. No, you could, she, I, she's correct. Commissioner Shepard is correct. You could build, you could have a tiny home on wheels as the, under. you could have a tiny home, because Mr. Carlson the, answered this earlier. You could have a, J, a tiny home on wheels as the primary residence. Yes. And, and by right, you can build a 1,200 foot ADU. ADU. Correct. Yeah. That, that and, is correct. And then when I decide to move to Arizona, what happens? You've got the 1,200 square foot ADU and an empty <clears throat> primary parcel. I see this as a problem. Oh. But we could, we could, it, it sounds like you're suggesting that we only have them as ADUs. Well, my question back to David, did you not say that all the other jurisdictions with one exception had allowed them only as ADUs? Yeah, that's correct. That, that's what I'm supporting because of these things that we haven't even thought of that are, that could easily happen. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's correct. Um, and I, I, my sense is, I think that's the direction that commission is going is just allowing them as, as, the, as a new construction ADU, not as a primary unit. So can uh, I ask why staff was suggesting that we allow them as a primary dwelling unit? Um, <laughs> that, that was, well, based on incomplete information, that was the direction that, I, that we got from the planning commission uh, at, at the study session. Um, however, I, in, 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 in that direction, there the, the planning commission did express some uncertainty, you know, ba based on lack of information on the property taxes and some other things. And so, um, just for full, just you know, just kind of just to put it all out there, we we proposed these three options um, uh, that you know, going from allowing them to function as primary ADU, JADU, all the way down to just ADU, knowing that. The planning commission would would um, need to discuss it and decide what what they actually wanted to do. But it was based on the sort of direction we received from the planning commission at the at the study session. Mr. Carlson, do I take your answer to mean then that staff does not their recommendation is not weighted one way or the other? It was simply ordered based on your perception of the planning commission's conversation. Am I taking, am I, am I interpreting your answer correctly? Staff does not recommend one more over the other, simply you ordered them based on previous conversation. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. And um, they, and I think you, I appreciate that. Yeah, I think you might notice it. I did in the staff report, I did write it up as recommending uh, exhibit C, which is the proposed ordinance, primary unit, JADU, ADU. But then in my presentation, I, modified that and said based on what the planning commission decides based on this hearing and this discussion knowing that uh, so you're you're correct yes we're not i'm not waiting it anyway and, to and either you, well, of any of them and you said I, earlier that all the other major counties and municipalities have gone in the only for adu's directions with only one exception in a rural mountainous county that's right well, what, so I guess I had interpreted the recommendation as recommending to us that we do consider these as both an ADU or a, a primary dwelling. Is there an argument from staff, from any staff, to recommend that we go in that direction? Otherwise, I'm inclined to agree with Commissioner Shepard. No, there's there's not. The those three, uh, that that was, I, I guess I, I probably should have maybe presented those three options in a different way as as three options on the table equally able to be discussed. I, so to, to 
thank you, Commissioner Violante, for clarifying that. It, it's it's three options, and it was staff's um, expectation that the Planning Commission would would choose one of them, or a combination of them, or or something like that. I would echo your comments, Commissioner Dan, that I I got the impression both from your presentation, Mr. Carlson, and from even from the staff report that there was significant concerns based on the lack of property tax and the way that, that I would agree with Commissioner Shepard that I would lean towards only um, the ADU. If, if Commissioner Dan's ready to make a motion, I think based on our conversation, um, I see Chair Burton has his hand raised, but I yeah. I would I, I, I would just echo your comments, Commissioner Dan. The response that I have to the original question there is just, you know, could we add in language that says, if this is a single family home, it cannot be removed? You can't take it somewhere. You put it here, it stays here. And if you want to replace it with a new model, cool. But you can't just take it away. At that point, I don't know why they wouldn't, we wouldn't just, that's a tiny home to me though. Yeah, I mean, that's the reason you bought it. By nature, you can take it away. Let's. Say, what about if we hear Commissioner Dan's motion? We'll at least have a motion to work on. All right, that sounds good. Okay, um, I will move the staff recommendation with the following modifications: that the tiny home on wheels can be considered an ADU, not the primary dwelling, and not a JADU that tiny home on wheels not be allowed to be sited in driveways, that tiny home on wheels are only allowed where a single family home is allowed in those zone districts, that a tiny home on wheels must go through a permit renewal process every three years, that in section H2, we remove the word permanent, that tiny home on wheels are not allowed to rely on generators within the urban services line and the rural services line. And in, <clears throat> excuse me, and in rural areas, tiny home on wheels, if they are to rely on solar, must have adequate solar access. That before this item goes to the board of supervisors, that staff look at annual fee options for tiny home on wheels. And that staff also look at options into self-certifying for purposes of the permit process. And that staff also determine when appropriate for this ordinance to come back to the planning commission after an adequate number of tiny homes on wheels have been permitted so that the commission can review this ordinance and make possible modifications. I would second that, but I would like to ask Commissioner Dan if she would include in the comments on generators that in the rural areas, not only does they need to make sure that there is adequate solar access, but if a generator is installed, it'd be, I guess the term is built in as opposed to portable. Absolutely, yes. So with that amendment, uh, that slight change, I would like to second that motion. I would just like to say I appreciate Commissioner Dan kind of compiling all of our, our comments and our ideas, and I, I, I support the motion you, you put before us. I, I think you really aggregated everything that um, we've discussed here and put together a strong motion, so thank you. Can I ask for, I think this is the time, or let me ask for a clarification on just one item and just the verbiage with the, the solar access, it. and I trying to catch all that. Um, if allowed to be on solar, it must have solar access, I think is what you stated. Uh, yes. Yes. I think that was um, based on um, Mr. Carlson's comments earlier because he said the site plan needed to verify solar access. I assume that's where her language came from. Okay, yes. So, and that's the language I should have articulated, Commissioner Bialanti. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, well I, could offer a, I could offer a friendly amendment that it used that language if you'd like, that it say the site plan needs to verify solar access if you'd like. I could make that friendly amendment. I would accept that. I would accept that. So it has to provide solar, verified solar access. And if there is going to be a generator, it has to be built in. Yes. Okay. Do you, do you mean not necessarily built into the unit, but stationary on the ground? Yes. 
Yeah. Could I ask for another clarification? I'm wondering if the commission would add in one more uh, item for me here. Just you mentioned that we would bring this back for a certain amount of time to review kind of how it's going. And to, I'm really passionate about making these work in other areas, especially with single family homes. And as you've heard, multifamily. And I'd like to ask if we can include, or if it'd be possible that when it comes back, if we can have a review of those things as options again, um, and put a timeline of, you know, whatever feels comfortable for Ms. Hansen a year from now. Um, kind of like the idea of a certain number of permits um, rather than a timeline. And the reason for that is that while we're allowing a new type of housing unit, there are, you know, significant utility challenges that are in the other parts of our ordinances and requirements. So hooking up to septic or um, having a, a, a electrical source and water source that we think may temper um, the rush of tiny homes permits that could have occurred. Um, so I'd, ra I'd rather say after say 25 permits are um, issued, then we could return. About, um, so I also think it's, and let me know, um, Stephanie, if you agree, that um, it would be maybe six months after that 25 so that we have some time to see how things are going. Um, yeah, that, that'd so, be even better. Okay. so. Does that would that satisfy what you're looking at, Tim? I mean, because I, I agree, it's it'd be helpful to come back and take a look at this again. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, that would be that would be great. So, so I'll specify in my motion that we come back um, six months after at least 25 tiny home on wheels permits have been issued. That's fine with me as a second. And could we include that we would look at this as single family homes and multifamily properties at that time? I, I, I don't think that Stephanie indicated that it sounds like a lot of staff work and thinking about it. I, no, I wouldn't support that. How about we look at all aspects of, of the ordinance and what's functioning, what's not functioning, Sure, that's a little more open-ended and doesn't tie us in. So there's no reason not to look at all aspects of the ordinance at this point, at that point. Do you want to bring that up again? We could bring that up again then, but we at least have some experience in granting some permits and having some installed. So I agree. Okay. Um, thank you. I there's one other item that I'd like to just see if we can get it in or not, see what you both think about it. Um, it's really simple, but to me, it's just like sticking in my head and not allowing mechanical equipment on a roof of one of these units really is like such a limiting factor for not much benefit is what I'm seeing. Like a roof fan from a bathroom has to have somewhere to go this code specifically says you cannot do that. The roof fan has to come out the side. And it's just like one of those little nitpicky things. But for me, as a person that deals with code a lot, you know, it's, and if I'm getting stuck to an objective standard, that becomes really challenging. So would you, would you allow an amendment to eliminate code section F point F3 requirement of not allowing mechanical equipment on the roof? Well, I'd like to ask Mr. Carlson, what other Besides fans, what what is the definition of what did you call it? Mechanical equipment. Mechanical equipment. That's the. That's what the term what are we used. talking about? Beside fans, Mr. Carlson, what does that term refer to? Um, air conditioners, generators, fans, anything anything mechanical. Well, alternatively, if if it's allowed on the roof like allowed on the roof, but then, you know, use the screening element, like you mentioned, you know, which is already standard in, in every other yeah. type of development. That's so, what I was going to say. 
So, so let me just say, I'm not really in favor of that within the urban and rural services line, because we're talking about something that's gonna be four feet away from the fence line of your neighbor. And so I think that 14 foot height limit must be adhered to. I'd be open to it if it were, you know, in the rural areas on parcel size, an acre or larger, um, but not within the urban or rural services line. Understood. Thank you for the consideration. And that's just because, you know, for neighborhood compatibility, if I have one of these, you know, right next door to me, it should, it should follow the 14 foot height limit like everyone else. I just hate to just make hasty decisions. I mean, I live in the rural community. Um, I there is an acre, you know, there are you know, acres when my when my neighbor turns on their gen, gas generator, I hear it loud and clear, maybe even more so. So I'm, I'm a little confused by what we're doing here. It should be. I agree about all plus screening. I have um, screening for my built-in generator that works quite well. So how about a screening requirement at a minimum? Insulated and screened, it can make a big difference. I, I don't know. I'd rather that. just leave it as is. Um, and, you know, we could, we could make a staff can note to the board that this was something discussed. And if the board, you know, wants to do something different, they can do something different. At this point, I'm not really willing so to. We're, we're basically to saying, we'll, Go over it again, Tim. You don't want to see sure. things on the roof. No, no. Tim wants wants mechanical equipment to be allowed on the roof. Well, I don't know if it makes any sense to put a generator on the roof. Well, well we're not he's not talking about generators. He's talking about a vent for a ceiling fan. Yeah. I mean, you go buy these. Equipment. You go buy oh, tiny homes. Okay. Off. No, I I didn't understand. I have. I know what you mean. There are okay. fans that uh, evaporate hot air on roofs of. And I expect tiny homes would want one to have a fan on the top to get rid of hot air. Is that what you mean? Yeah, that's exactly. It's that simple. And the reality is you go buy these things off a shelf, right? They're not custom built typically to meet no, I, our I, specific I code. And so that's why there's this challenge presents like a limiting factor for an unnecessary reason, in my opinion. Uh, in that case, I understand better now and I would agree. I wonder that if an exemption you know, just everything, other, all mechanical equipment except fans wouldn't be allowed. And that way you at least get that fan um, uh, feature. Because I can kind of imagine that, you know, a lot of these are going to be somewhat vertical and you'll have a sleeping loft and it could get warm up there. And as you also mentioned, the bath, bathroom fan. Um, so maybe just a a clause in there that it exempts fans out of there. Would that help? Well, the maker of the motion said at this time she's not open to it, and she recommended that a note be made to, made to the board. So unless Miss Dan has changed her mind, right? I think that at this time you should Miss Lazenby raised her hand. So I mean, Miss Dan, unless you, I believe, I mean, I'm ready to move on from this topic. I, I, I'm happy to hear from Commissioner Lazenby. Well, I, I was just going to point out that we have gone well past where we normally have a break, and we still have 42 participants online. So we need to kind of move this along, I think, don't we? Yeah. Yes. Well, if you don't have any more comments, Ms. Ms. Dana said she's not open to any more amendment, so I believe we probably are ready to vote. Yeah, so, thanks. so where are we on this last thing? Can we just add an exemption for fans and call it a day? It's um, up to Commissioner Dan. I'm open to just fans, but I'm concerned about increasing the height beyond 14 feet. So that's that's my, and without going into how much does that increase the height, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't want to get into a 15-minute discussion about an exemption for just fans. I would, I'd rather staff look into this and make a recommendation to the board to this effect since we are not the final decision makers on this. So you're saying we are in, we're asking David when he takes it to the board to say that we discussed adding an exemption for things like fans. We want the board to act on that. 
Yes. But keeping in mind the 14 foot limit inside the, or the, yeah. the I, I, would, I would agree with the stand on that as well. Okay. Yeah. I would be in full, I think people in tiny home when it gets real hot are going to need a ceiling fan. So I would okay. agree, I would agree with that. Um, let's, uh, if we're, can we move on to a vote? I, I think ready? so. And I, and I'm trusting that Mr. Carlson is, I mean, we've all kind of taken our own notes. It was a little messy. Are you clear, Mr. Carlson, on, on what this is entailing? <laughs> You're muted. You're muted, David. Sorry. Yes, I'm. I'm pretty clear. I'm. I'm clear. I'm clear enough for now. And uh, to tell you the truth, I can always come back and listen to this whole Wonderful. discussion and tighten everything up. Thank you, sir. They Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Great. At this point, we can close our discussion and move on to a vote. Ms. Drake, can we please have a roll call vote on this item? All right, Commissioner Violante. Yes. Commissioner Shepard. Yes. Commissioner Lazenby. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Dan. Yes. And Chair Gordon. No. And I would like to specify that I really appreciate where everyone's coming from. I think there's a couple key things that are really important for me in here that I'd really like to clean up a little more. Although where it's at is a is uh, moving in the right direction, and I appreciate that. Um, so the motion passes, Ms. Drake. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> at this time, I reiterate uh, how thankful I am for everyone's time, and especially Mr. Carlson for hanging on and walking us through that item and uh, getting us through it. It was, you know, it's challenging new territory, so we appreciate it. Appreciate the public hanging on. Um, we do need to address taking a break. And typically, we have a lunch at 1130, especially for CTV staff. Ms. Drake, are we uh, at a point where we should take a 30 minute lunch? Can you help me clarify that? Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So we will it is what time is it 1225. We'll reconvene at 1255. Can we just make it one o'clock? Yeah, Perfect. I would agree. One o'clock it is. 35 minutes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. And chair. Okay. All right, Ms. Drake, are we all refresh a little break? Here you go for the next round. Yes, maybe we all should right. take a roll call really quick to yes, make sure everybody's here. Okay. Thank you. Uh huh. All right, I see Commissioner Violante. Hello. Um, Commissioner Dan. Yep. And Commissioner Shepard. Looks like Renee's with us. Renee, are you with us? Let's make sure she's back, back. Mm -hmm. uh, there. Yes, Hi. I'm back. Thank you. All right. And Commissioner Lazenby. Yes. And Chair Gordon. Yes. All right. Great. Chair. Chair, I'm sorry. I have a question about the last session. We had a resolution that we did not sign or approve. Last session. I'm not following. I'm sorry. Can okay. It was on page, it was uh, page seven. The resolution from the Planning Commission was recommending adoption. The notice of exemption. 
I believe Commissioner Dan recommended moved the recommended action. Did you not, Commissioner Dan, which would have included that? I believe my language said to move the staff recommendation with the following modifications. Okay. So then you you would be the the one that made the motion. Okay. And uh, it was Commissioner Shepard that seconded. Correct. Okay. I apologize. I should have restated that for clarity. Although that's okay. Okay, so we're clear on that. And so uh, coming back to things here, just to recap, we are now on agenda item number seven, which is a study session for the uh, sustainability policy update. Oh, excuse me, item number eight, agenda item number eight. My notes are not updated. Um, and so at this time, Ms. Drake, do we have staff available for a report and to get started on the study session? Um, yes, I, Annie, I just saw um, Stephanie raise her hand and I just promoted her. So we have uh, Stephanie Hansen and Annie Murphy from the policy section with us today to present. Great. Hello, everybody. Again, I'm going to share my screen to get us started. <clears throat> okay, I think it's this guy. Are you seeing the presentation? Yes. Great. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, everybody, uh, Stephanie Hansen, uh, Assistant Director of Community Development and Infrastructure Department, and presenting with me today is Annie Murphy, Senior Planner. Um, I haven't looked at the attendee list just now, but um, we're also scheduled to have two other planners who've worked on the project, Daisy Allen and Anais Shank, to help with questions and answers. Uh, today, we're going to focus on the code modernization part of the sustainability update as well as agriculture and resources and um, do an overview of the draft environmental impact report. Uh, we'll begin today by discussing uh, how the uh, proposed updates uh, fit into the framework of sustainability. Um, then we'll go over some key changes in agriculture and the conservation of natural and cultural resources. Um, I think we'll have an opportunity for a break at that point if the commission wants it. Um, then we'll get into the details of code modernization, <clears throat> highlighting the new permit system. And this will be followed by a review of the EIR and the potential significant impacts associated with the project as analyzed in that document. We'll conclude with the project schedule and next steps and then take uh, comments and questions from the commission and the public. Um, Chair, can I ask a quick question right here? Um, Stephanie, how long is the staff's presentation portion? About a half an hour. Okay. <clears throat> If the commission likes, we if we go through the whole presentation, then do discussion, it might go a little quicker than dividing it up, but I'll leave that up to you. I'm all for that. All right, I'm turning it over to Annie, who's going to talk a little bit about agricultural resources. Thank you, Stephanie, and good afternoon, commissioners. The county's existing general plan local coastal program was adopted in 1994 with a focus on preserving agricultural land, natural resources, open space, and rural character, and limiting urban expansion outside of the urban and rural services lines. The USL RSL concept remains at the core of the county's development framework, and the county's environmental protections remain intact with this project. The sustainability update includes a partial update of General Plan Chapter 5, the Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Conservation Element, formally titled Conservation and Open Space. This chapter provides a framework for the conservation and management of cultural and natural resources, including agricultural land, timber, minerals, water, biotic resources, and open space. Substantive updates focus on amending policies to support commercial agriculture, as well as other updates to ensure consistency with state law in the county code. 
policy language has been streamlined and reorganized for clarity. County Code Chapter 1310, the zoning ordinance, includes updated regulations for agricultural zone districts to implement these updated policies. And Chapter 1650, Agricultural Land Preservation, incorporates updates related to public facility uses on ag land. As the majority of changes proposed to natural and cultural resources are focused on reorganizing and updating general plan policies and reflecting current practices, no updates are proposed to other chapters in the County Code uh, Title 16, Environmental and Resource Protection. We'll begin by reviewing agricultural resources. Agriculture is essential to our community and contributes significantly to the local economy and rural character. Commercial agricultural land consists of lands best suited for commercial production of food and livestock and includes agricultural resource soils. These lands are zoned commercial agriculture or CA. The agriculture or A zone district includes land in rural areas that does not contain agricultural resource soils but can support agricultural uses and is also appropriate for low density residential use. Land within an agriculture preserve is identified by the Ag Preserve Combining District or P Combining District and can be zoned either CA-P or A-P. The county code currently also includes the agricultural preserve or AP zone district. However, all parcels previously zoned AP have been rezoned in prior years to the P combining district. Therefore, as part of this update, the AP zone district would be deleted. Since the general plan was adopted in 1994, the local agricultural economy has evolved. In 2014 and 2015, the planning department went, met with the farming community to better understand how policies and regulations might be updated to support modern farming practices. Planning staff also met with local winery and brewery owners. Early drafts of the updated regulations for agricultural land and for wineries and breweries <clears throat> were reviewed in 2015 with the Farm Bureau, the Agricultural Policy Advisory Commission, and the Board of Supervisors. Planning staff also held several community meetings. The updated draft regulations for agricultural land and for wineries and breweries was reviewed by APAC again in May of this year, who recommended approval. Uh, moving on now to review agricultural support uses. Uh, to support modern farming practices and address the needs of local farmers, the general plan and county cone are being amended to allow new and expanded agricultural support uses on CA and A land. These changes will help ensure that commercial agriculture remains viable in the long term. The updated code would allow agricultural areas for equipment storage, in addition to storage buildings already allowed in the code agricultural service establishments, such as farm equipment repair or retail sales of farm equipment, currently allowed in the A district, would now also be allowed in the CA district. Agricultural research and development facilities would be recognized as a new use that would be allowed in the CA and A districts. The updated code expands agritourism to include events such as farm dinners, educational activities, school field trips, and farm stays. These uses are especially important to the viability of smaller farms. Streamlined reviews would also be provided for greenhouses. Changes are also proposed to allow the extension of water or sewer district boundaries to include commercial agricultural parcels where necessary to address public health and environmental issues. Policies would also allow the placement of water and sewer lines on ag land in the coastal zone to serve farm worker housing and for irrigation. This project also expands, expands the list of public facility uses allowed on CA to add a general category of essential public facilities. These facilities could be considered on CA land where a compelling need exists and where other locations are not available. For these essential uses, limited subdivisions of CA land would be about allowed. Access to water distribution and wastewater treatment for these uses would also be allowed where no other location is feasible with access to these services and no other options exist for wastewater or water uh, wastewater treatment on the site. While allowing new and expanded ag support uses, the county code would continue to protect agricultural land. For these ag support uses, discretionary review will still be required. 
The code requires that these uses be cited off of farmable land where possible to cluster development and to not adversely impact farming in the area. These standards would also apply to public facility uses. Existing ag buffer setback requirements and limits on residential development are being retained. To further protect the viability of CA land, new concept of development area would apply, which is the total area on a site that is covered by structures or any material that affects the viability of the agricultural soil. Projects that would result in a total development area on a CA parcel that exceeds 35,000 square feet would be required to be redesigned to reduce the total development area below the threshold or consider alternative sites. Where these options are not feasible, the code requires a property owner to place farmable land in a permanent agricultural easement. In addition, the development area limitations will be extended to also apply to public facility uses. Wineries and breweries are currently allowed in the CA and A zone district, as well as the residential agriculture and rural residential zones. Updated regulations allow for expanded indoor and outdoor tastings and marketing events such as tours. The code limits hours for events and tastings, the number of guests, and amplified music to protect residential neighborhoods from impacts. Distilleries would also be allowed subject to the same regulations. Areas used for outdoor events would be required to be buffered from adjacent residential sites and to comply with noise standards. Development applications would include conditions as needed to further limit impacts. On CA sites, wineries and breweries would be required to be ancillary to an agricultural use and cited to protect ag land. And now I will um, turn back to Stephanie to review natural and cultural resources. Thanks, Yanni. <clears throat> Uh, like many communities in California, water in Santa Cruz County is severely limited. The county uh, staff work with water agencies and groundwater management districts to protect water quality and plan for future water use. The 2014 Sustainable Groundwater Management Act requires water agencies to prepare 20-year plans to protect and uh, provide sustainable groundwater supplies. A new strategy in the general plan supports this effort and brings the general plan into consistency with this act. The county also coordinates with water districts in developing urban water uh, management plans. Um, uh, these plans require the districts to forecast uh, uh, their existing water use and their future water use and to ensure that they have enough water to provide for future populations. And then when a new development is proposed, water agencies are required to approve the water service and issue will serve letters if the proposed development is in accordance with forecasts provided in these plans. Uh, existing requirements in the county code and the county um, design criteria provide for development standards that protect water quality, habitats, control pollutants, and support groundwater recharge. Policies and regulations also require water conservation. Primary change in the general plan is to update policies to be consistent with low impact design strategies that are already required in the county design criteria. These strategies require new developments to maintain the capacity of the site to retain stormwater and recharge groundwater. Low impact design strategies also include things like bioswales, um, that utilize landscaping to filter water and screen pollutants. Um, the sustainabilities update, uh, sustainability updates focus on infill development will also help with more efficient water use. Existing policies and regulations protect biotic, timber, mineral resources, and these will remain in place with this update. The sustainability update also introduces a new open space plan, which is required by state law and includes an inventory that identifies the categories of land um, with open space values. Policies and regulations that protect open space um, will remain in, um, in effect. In the visual resources section, uh, the policy protecting scenic assets such as ocean views and ridge tops that have not yet been mapped has been added to strengthen the design review for development on sites that have these resources. 
visual resource policies in the general plan also protect scenic corridors and roads. Um, there's a long list of scenic roads that are in the existing and the proposed general plan. Um, and these include the entirety of Highway 1 within the county. Um, since it was originally adopted in 1994, much of the tree cover in the urban area um, has been lost. Analysis by planning staff determined that the urban corridor of Highway 1 between Western Drive and Santa Cruz to the west and Bay Avenue in Capitola to the east no longer meet the general plan criteria for designation as a scenic corridor. So this portion, the urbanized portion only, would no longer be considered locally scenic. Uh, photo on the bottom of the screen shows um, Highway 1 along Mission Street, which is in the portion that would be removed. And the photo on the right shows Highway 1 near Rio de Mar, which is more forested and would be uh, retain its local scenic designation. The updated general plan includes new policies that um, recognize tribal cultural resources. Um, policies are added requiring the county to work with affected tribes and identify and protect uh, their resources. Uh, policies has, have also been updated to implement best practices for archaeological sites. And for historic resources, new policy encourages the maintenance and upkeep of historic resources to reduce the risk of demolition through neglect, fire, or natural disaster. A new strategy also clarifies that a historic evaluation is required prior to demolition of any structure over 50 years old. Um, that may qualify it as a historic resource. Um, I think this was where we had a moment in the presentation to offer a break, but I think we'll just continue going. So um, I will turn it back over to Annie to do an overview of the code mod changes. Thank you, Stephanie. The Santa Cruz County Code was first adopted in the 1950s and has been amended in a piecemeal fashion in the decades since. As a result, land use regulations have become increasingly complex and challenging to navigate. Recognizing the need to make county code regulations more user-friendly, county staff began engaging with the community in 2013 and after meeting with the Board of Supervisors in 2015 to review code drafts, included the code mod in the sustainability update project. For today's meeting, we are focusing on the new permit framework, new regulations for weddings and community events, other amendments to modernize and reorganize the code. Key goals for the code modernization include creating an efficient permit review process, clarifying and updating regulations, while continuing to protect the neighborhood and environmental quality. The most significant change to modernize the code is the introduction of the new permit framework. Currently, planning permits or approvals are categorized by processing levels from minor development and use changes that only require administrative approvals processed at levels one through four to more substantial projects that require a public hearing processed at levels five through seven. The new permit framework replaces the process levels with more descriptive terms that are commonly used in other communities. A crosswalk of old to new permit types, types is provided in Chapter 1810 of the County Code and is also summarized on this slide. First, the new permit framework introduces two types of planning permits. Use permits for projects related to land use, such as the establishment of a new restaurant, and site development permits for projects that propose physical development of a site, such as the construction of a new building. Secondly, the framework now includes descriptive terms for permit and processes based on the intensity of the proposed project. Zoning and environmental clearances provide a new ministerial over the canon review to identify relevant standards and verify that no additional review is required before the applicant can apply for a building permit. These clearances are generally equivalent to level one and two approvals currently in place. Minor use and site development permits are discretionary permits approved administratively without a public hearing or public notice, similar to level three projects in the current system. 
administrative use and site development permits are discretionary permits for projects that may impact neighborhoods and so would require public notice, but are still approved administratively by staff without a public hearing, like a level four permit. Additional use and site development permits are required for projects that propose more substantial change to the existing land use and require public notice and a public hearing. Additional use permits and conditional site development permits are equivalent to existing levels five through seven. Updates to the new permit system also include streamlining reviews where appropriate and allowing some uses to be approved administratively where a public hearing was previously required. More uses that are compatible with the zone district are now permitted by right to provide a more efficient permit process. A site development permit may still be required for uses that are permitted by right where physical development is proposed. Additional use and site development permits generally would be reviewed by the zoning administrator while many projects previously approved by the Board of Supervisors would now be brought to the Planning Commission as a key decision maker, such as large mixed use projects. Requirements for commercial weddings and community events on private, residential, and rural properties have been clarified with this update. The new code section regulates commercial weddings and similar events on rural and agricultural properties located outside of the urban and rural service lines. These regulations would not apply to private family events or other non-commercial celebrations. The primary goal of these new regulations is to accommodate these types of events while limiting impacts to the surrounding neighborhood, as well as to preserve the primary use of these rural parcels. The code allows commercial weddings as a secondary use on properties where the primary use is either residential or a winery or brewery or vineyard with approval of a CUP. New approval procedures and standards require permit conditions appropriate for the neighborhood context, specifying the maximum number of guests allowed, the number of events per year, limits on amplified music and parking requirements. New regulations for community events and fundraisers establish similar requirements for events on private residential or agricultural property. New regulations would allow one event per year without amplified music and up to two events per year that can include amplified music with approval of a minor use permit. Community event organizers would also be required to notify owners and occupants within 500 feet of the event 10 days prior to the event. Responding to comments from your commission, staff is proposing to extend the noticing requirements for community events and fundraisers in increments of 50 feet where needed until owners of at least 10 properties have been notified by mail. This update would be consistent with existing noticing requirements for discretionary projects. Other changes are proposed to the county code to update regulations and make the code easier to navigate. The code has been reorganized in, and consolidated where appropriate, including moving procedural requirements such as general plan and county code amendment requirements to Title 18, which is procedures. The list of uses allowed in the zone districts have also been updated. Obsolete standards such as local solar access and gas station requirements have been removed to ensure consistency with state law. Use charts are also updated to include modern uses such as new research and development uses in urban industrial and commercial districts. For a variety of uses, including residential care facilities, visitor accommodations, and animal keeping, amendments update terms, clarify standards, and consolidate regulations. Outdoor storage regulations include new requirements for the loca location and amount of firewood storage and prohibit commercial firewood operations on residential sites. Definitions in County Code Section 1310 700 were also updated to be consistent with new regulations, state law, and the general plan. Today's presentation highlights the most significant code modernization. Drafts of all county code sections we reviewed today are available on the Sustainability Update Project website and are also linked as Exhibit E in your staff report. Now I will turn the presentation back to Stephanie to review the EIR. Thanks, Annie. CEQA <clears throat> requires local governments to analyze proposed projects 
to determine any environmental impacts and how to reduce them. Uh, the county determined that an EIR was the appropriate level of analysis for this project. And the EIR for this project is a program EIR, which means it's relatively high level countywide analysis of environmental impacts. Um, and it does not analyze specific project impacts, which makes sense because no specific development projects are proposed for this project. Um, all non-exempt uh, future developments that occur would still need to analyze their impacts under CEQA. And some projects will benefit from tiering off of this EIR, but still may need supplemental analysis to fully understand any impacts. Because the general plan is a 20 year plan, um, the EIR does analyze the indirect impacts associated with growth in that timeline. For the purpose of the EIR, it's assumed that approximately 4,500 dwelling units would be developed and uh, about 6 million square feet of commercial uh, building square footage over the 20 year would be developed over the 20 year planning horizon. The draft EIR was released on April 14th and had a 45 day comment period as required by law. A community meeting was held on the EIR on May 9th and 14 uh, timely comments were received from the public <clears throat> and agencies and those are included in the staff report starting on page 55. Responses to the comments are being prepared and will be addressed in the final EIR which is scheduled for release on August 12th and staff will report on the final EIR including the responses to comments at the public hearing on August 24th. As part of the project adoption process, the Planning Commission will be requested to recommend certification of the EIR as a part of this project. So the EIR analyzed all environmental resources as required by CEQA, basically comparing um, what the impacts of the new policies and, and future growth would be when you compared them to baseline um, situation. Baseline is basically our current um, situation with the current general plan and um, uh, current regulatory codes um, that are in effect now. And while the EIR found that there would be less than significant impacts to most resources in the county, uh, a conservative analysis of potential future growth could have some significant and unavoidable impacts as um, explained in the EIR. The EIR uh, identifies these impacts along with proposed mitigation. I'll just talk a little bit about the impacts first and then we'll talk about the mitigation. Um, the first uh, resource area would be in agricultural resources. Um, the new policies that allowed ancillary uses, support uses and utilities and essential public facilities could result in the conversion of prime um, unique or farmland uh, of statewide importance and conversion of agricultural um, uh, uses. In um, the area of biological resources, the, the project includes uh, the redesignation and rezoning of um, 23 parcels. And one of these parcels is a six acre site at Thurber Lane and Soquel. Avenue and that would change from commercial zoning to a mix of residential flex and um, C2 commercial zoning. Um, this site is a key opportunity site, but also has a stream that bisects the property from north to south and future development could um, impact the stream, especially if it's piped or moved to the prop to the perimeter of the site, which would be a permanent impact to riparian habitat. In cultural resources, although it's unknown at this time, it's possible that future development could affect um, undocumented historical built resources, um, particularly if preservation or avoidance of the resource is not feasible. And again, this is a very conservative approach. There are um, some codes in place that would 
protect these resources, um, but um, mitigation is offered to further uh, strengthen those codes. Uh, in transportation, CEQA requires that we analyze transportation impacts in terms of vehicle miles traveled uh, or VMT. VMT is the number of miles generated by vehicles. So in other words, one mile traveled by one vehicle is one VMT. In this way, transportation impacts are more closely tied to the statewide goals of reducing greenhouse gases. And the county has adopted, as required by law, has adopted at VMT thresholds for new development. Although the urbanized development pattern policies and programs in the sustainability update will re reduce VMT when compared to current conditions, the EIR found that it would not be reduced enough in order to meet our threshold of 15% reduction, um, especially in the areas of residential and non-retail. In addition, when these projects are considered along with cumulative projects, um, which are, are projects that are in the permitting pipeline or projects that are in neighboring jurisdictions, there would also be a cumulative impact. And the last area was in the um, uh, was the effect on water resources. The draft EIR analyzed um, future potential development. Um, and found that the potential development and growth appears to be within the growth projections developed by each of the six major water districts serving the unincorporated uh, urban areas. However, depending on the timing of development, um, there are two districts where there could be um, not enough water compared to their forecasts. And it also has to do with the fact that some of that growth is in the city of Santa Cruz and some is in the city of Capitola. So it's a little hard to tell the timing of it. Um, the EIR found that the project and our forecast of growth may result in um, an exceedance or approach the limit of the city of Santa Cruz's forecasted growth and the SoCal Creek Water District's forecasted growth for um, the communities that it serves. Um, these impacts are considered, again, conservative, um, but it's important to acknowledge the, um, the uh, issues with water supplies. Um, and again, like transportation, the project could contribute to a cumulative water supply problem when, um, or impacts when, um, compared or when considered with development in other communities. So the EIR uh, ha has several mitigation measures that it offers. In agriculture, um, we would amend the code to add <clears throat> public and quasi-public facilities to the types of projects that require special findings in order to address the conversion of ag land. In biological resources, uh, mitigation measure would require a preparation of a mitigation plan that details the replacement of habitat areas on that parcel uh, at Thurburn, SoCal. Um, it would also require maintenance and monitoring for the establishment of the mitigation. In cultural resources, there are two mitigation measures. Um, one is a preparation of a historical resources evaluation to avoid impacts um, for any properties that may be over 50 years old and of historic value. And the second um, mitigation measure would require that historic uh, that a historic building proposed for major alteration or demolition be thoroughly documented um, with, with video, pictures, recordings, et cetera, according to industry standards. In transportation, there are also two mitigation measures. Uh, mitigation measure TRA-1 would develop a regional mitigation banking program to start to create a mechanism for funding transit, active transportation, and multimodal transportation improvements. Um, private development would offset their VMT impacts by contributing to the mitigation program. A second mitigation measure would add additional implementation strategy in the general plan 
to start to evaluate additional parking related measures such as paid parking and the use of parking fees to fund transit. And finally, in water, um, while the policies in the general plan um, and other documents encourage uh, conservation and water demand has been flat and decreasing within several of the districts. Um, and um, there are policies that require that development only be allowed where adequate water supplies are available. Um, and all uh, water purveyors have to approve new connections um, with those things in place, the EIR doesn't, didn't find any other mitigation measures that could be implemented to um, offset water impacts. I just wanted to spend a little time talking about level of service because um, I know that this continues to be an important issue that the community expects in a CEQA document. And although level of service is no longer uh, an impact under CEQA, the draft EIR does include an analysis. Um, level of service analysis measures the amount of traffic, congestion at intersections and along roadway segments. Um, level of service is measured on a scale from A to F, with A being free flowing traffic and F representing congested conditions where traffic can be described as stop and go, and vehicles have to wait more than one traffic cycle to get through an intersection. The sustainability update does include a list of future transportation projects that um, can be considered in the future and would be candidates to um, be included on our capital improvement program when funding is available. Um, this is Appendix J of the general plan. So in the analysis uh, that's contained in the EIR, eight intersections were found not to meet the county's level of service standard of D under future conditions. Um, these include um, about five intersections along Soquel Drive and a couple of other intersections um, at 7th and Eaton and Capitola Road and 17th and Portola Drive and 41st. Um, and so additional improvements would be needed in those, um, at those intersections to improve um, conditions and, and meet the county's level of service standards. Um, as required by the Board of Supervisors, operations along Portola Drive were also analyzed if the Portola Drive streetscape concepts were implemented. The concepts envision a transition between 26th and 41st Avenues from four lanes to three lanes, uh, three lanes being two lanes plus uh, a center lane in order to accommodate a more pedestrian and bicycle friendly streetscape in that area. The level of service analysis revealed a decline in the operations of major intersections at 30th and 38th and 41st. Um, and actually at 41st, that intersection would operate at a level of service F, whether the sustainable, um, excuse me, whether the Portola Drive streetscape concepts were in place or not. So signalization improvements are therefore recommended at these intersections, which would improve operations back up to a level of service A. Um, in addition, if a roundabout were to be considered at 41st um, uh, Avenue, the peak uh, level of service would actually be a little lower at level of service B. For these improvements, additional analysis, engineering, programming, funding sources, would have to be um, secured before they could go into effect. And I think there would be other opportunities for further input. Um, for instance, when you know such a project were to be uh, incorporated into the capital uh, improvement program, which happens once a year. Um, also, as required by law, the EIR analyzes several alternatives for the project. The first one is the no project alternative. Um, that's where none of the new documents would be um, adopted and, and uh, future growth would occur as it would occur under the current general plan. 
Um, alternative two had reduced growth. Um, so we didn't grow as many, um, get as many housing units and as much commercial development. Um, instead, we met AMBAG's um, current adopted regional housing and employee employment growth projection. So a little bit lower. Um, and then the third alternative was a reduced project. This would mean that uh, some components of the sustainability update didn't go into effect. And we would eliminate the zoning map changes on the 10 parcels to residential flex um, and um, the existing zoning designations on these parcels would be retained. The second component would be to eliminate the um, regulations that allow public and quasi-public um, uses on ag lands. <clears throat> As required under CEQA, um, we had to identify an environmentally superior alternative, and that was alternative two with the reduced growth. Um, that comes closest to meeting the goals of the project while reducing the most uh, environmental impacts. Um, and lastly, the EIR also studies the significant irreversible impacts of growth um, and found that no irreversible impacts were identified that could be not that couldn't be mitigated, and the project would not directly or indirectly result in unplanned growth or projects that would remove obstacles to growth. So we wanted to just take a moment to um, review the timeline for this project. As you know, the draft amendments have been out since February um, and the draft documents are still available for public um, comment. There's a series of community meetings this spring and we also met with several of the commissions, including your commission, um, the Agricultural Policy Advisory Commission, the Latino Affairs Commission and the Historic Resource Commission um, just recently on July 29th. Um, staff is um, analyzing comments from previous planning commission meetings at this time and um, also comments from agencies that um, have been collected either as part of comments in the project or part of comments on the EIR, including comments from the Coastal Commission. And these questions and comments from these study sessions um, and the public comments will be um, reviewed for you again on um, August 24th. And we'll also talk about the final EIR um, at that meeting. <clears throat> um, we'll return uh, to the Planning Commission for a second public hearing on September 14th. Um, and then we'll uh, be asking at that at that meeting for a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors. Board of Supervisors would then in turn have public meetings, uh, hearings from October through December. After uh, the board uh, adopts uh, amendments, they would need to go to the Coastal Commission for certification. And with that, we'll end today's um, uh, presentation with our recommended action, which is to hold a study session on the sustainability update focused on agricultural, natural resources, um, code modernization, and the EIR. And that includes our presentation. Uh, all of our, this is a group effort, uh, this project. So uh, there's four of staff available to help answer any questions that the commission may have. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Hansen, and um, for everyone who helped and um, looking forward to digging in and I appreciate the presentation. Um, we can go one of two ways. I'd like to hear the commission, other commissioners' ideas here, but um, I would suggest that maybe we let the public have their time to comment before we dig in too much. Um, um, yeah, Commissioner Gordon, I agree with that. Can I just ask how many members of the public are here to to address the commission on this matter? Um, I'm not seeing a long list, to be honest. It, maybe a handful, small handful. Okay, great. I, I would agree that we should um, hear from the public first uh, before commission comments. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Let's go ahead and do that. We can open the public comment for this at this time. All right. So this is the time 
to remotely raise your hand if you're calling in by pressing star nine or raising the hand icon on the team or the Zoom app. And I will call on folks. You'll have three minutes to speak. Um, let's see if we have any. All right, I'm seeing a hand raised by Patricia Brady. Good afternoon, Patricia. Will you please restate your name for the record? Patty Brady. I'd like to just um, re-emphasize the um, residents' concern about the uh, residential flex increases on Portola and encourage the planning commissioners to really recognize the beach area differentials from other parts of the county from the standpoint of both our weekend and daily um, visitors, residences, et cetera. The um, changes in upgrading or changing zoning to up to 45 units plus density bonuses if they are allowed would really create major impacts on both Portola and within you know, the Pleasure Point community. So we've already had discussions on this sent to you. We've sent an opinion paper. There have been two articles in the newspaper about neighborhood concerns, and we very much appreciate your attention to the residents' knowledge of our neighborhood and the issues that um, this impact, this increase would, um, how it would impact the neighborhood and just the commercial area. We totally support a downgrade of the 30 units. We're not against growth, but we are against an overage of density. So thank you very much for your time, your efforts, and certainly the hours you put in on this. It's very much appreciated. Thanks, Patty. All right. Um, are there any additional members of the public who wish to comment on this item, the sustainability update? All right. I'm not seeing any chair. Um, if I see a hand pop up, I'll let you know. Great, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, so then, for now, we can go ahead and close the uh, public comment and bring it back to to the commission for discussion. Does anybody want to start with any questions or comments? Um, I'll just say I have uh, quite a large number of, of comments and questions, so I'm happy to go first or last, <laughs> whichever, um, whatever the commissioner commission um, would prefer. I think it'd be great if you went first. Perhaps it would save some of the duplication, actually. Okay, I'll do that. Um, so I'm going to start with the general plan and then hit the zoning code second. And, you know, because I'm toggling back and forth um, online, um, I just be patient with me. <laughs> um, so starting with the general plan, and, and I'll just start by saying, um, you know, goes without saying that um, I appreciate the enormous amount of work that staff has put into this. Um, <clears throat> this is also, from my perspective, one of the most important parts of, um, of this project. And I really appreciate staff moving this uh, study session at a time when I could be here. And I know that that wasn't easy. And so I just want to acknowledge that and, and thank you for that. Um, and I think you'll see, um, when I dig into this, why it's so important. Um, I'd also just say that um, a lot of reading is a lot of the changes and what's been put in here um, was like a, a blast from the past because so many of these issues are in here because they originally came up um, as, you know, areas of conflict that the supervisor's offices had to deal with. And I see Commissioner Violanti nodding her head because I believe that she's um, had to deal with a lot of the same stuff. <clears throat> and uh, so um, most of my questions are 
asking, you know, because there's quite a few changes that are being proposed in the ag section. And a lot of them, I'm just kind of like, what's the reasoning behind this? Um, and so most of the questions are going to be asking for your thought process in what specific situations were you, are you thinking about, you're trying to address with this change in the language because some of the changes are um, quite significant in my view. Um, so starting with the, um, the types of, the definitions of uh, the types of ag land, um, type 2D um, is proposed to be uh, eliminated. And this is land suitable for commercial ag use, but with limiting factors, including pressure from residential use. Um, just so why is this, why is this being proposed to be eliminated? Um, let's see. Um, I am looking at policy ARC 1.1.2. Is that where you're looking types of? Yeah, land, right. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so. Why? I, so thing, in the draft that I'm looking at, I wonder if there's a mix up in the draft, but in the draft I'm looking at, type 2B is not eliminated. Um, yeah, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to say that. Um, so, but it's being added. Oh, is that right? Okay. It's um, underlined in mine. Um, so, so the intent mainly of, of these, um, this update to this policy is just to clarify what, and add more detailed descriptions about these um, types based on language in the glossary. So, so type 2D is an existing um, ag land resource type and it, the land, it, added language is just intended to clarify based on the glossary definitions a little, give a little more information about these land use types in the policy. Okay. Um, okay. So um, the next one I have is 1.1.9. Um, Let me get down to that one myself. Um, and that is about coastal access through ag land. Yes. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Did you have a further question or? I do. I'm just, I'm just scrolling down to it myself. Okay. So I believe this is, so what is added is um, protect coastal access and agricultural land uses in the coastal zone by minimizing coastal access ways through an adjacent agricultural land and then blah, blah, blah. Um, so I, well, let me just ask, what was the thinking of, of adding this specificity in here? Um, so this policy was, so part of what we did was like reorganize and try and put policies where they made the most sense. So this okay. policy was actually, it's not, it, it summarizes a policy that was actually in chapter seven of the Jano Farm previously. So we thought it made more sense to put it in with okay. the section of the code for um, agricultural land. Okay. Um, so it doesn't really change. And then there are implementation strategies in this section that also implement the policy, but it doesn't really change the language. It's just sort of consolidating and putting it where it seems easier, more okay. logical to find it. Okay, thank you. That clarifies that. Um, the reason why it flagged for me is that um, there are situations where um, Coastal access is necessary, like on an existing road or a trail through ag land to access another, uh, like a state park or another public, some other public land that is used by the public. Um, so I just want to make sure that this policy wouldn't prohibit, um, wouldn't prohibit that. It would not. Yeah, it's, it's, it's read as minimizing, but I think that the intention is that if you know, you minimize it, but if you need to have access there to provide access to, you know, a park or other land that it would be allowed. Okay. okay. Rachel, as you go on, could you say what page you're on? Um, yes. I, so when I started my notes, I didn't put the page number, but um, as I move on, I, I did. Um, right now, I'm going to be on page 33. This is the online version, 33 of 146. And so the next one I'm looking at is a is a 
is a significant one and that's the utility district expansion and that's policy 1.1.13 on page 33. Um, so this is quite, from my perspective, this is um, a substantial and significant change. And um, the I had some concerns about it, reading it. And then I read the letter from the Coastal Commission and they um, have similar concerns. So I just w would like to know from staff's perspective what the thought process was in modifying this section. Um, yes. So. Um... So one thing I want to clarify that the intention is to serve um, existing development where um, there may be a failing um, septic system or um, a well water where it's not meeting minimum state health standards for drinking water. Um, so, so the intention is really to address these sort of limited safety concerns on existing development. Um, we did um, discuss this with um, environmental health with John Ricker as well, and he kind of brought up these concerns. Um, there are a couple of sites, um, and of course, there's. It would also need to be consistent with the um, the W combining district, the utility combining district in San Andreas area that prohibits extensions of um, water and sewer lines from the city of Watsonville to cross that to to the south to serve the San Andreas planning area. So it has to be consistent with that, but it's. Intention is really just to be able to um, identify sites where there are failing systems, where there isn't really another option to allow um, water and sewer lines in those cases. And then there would be, um, it would be required to be located below the tillable soil depth to protect the farmland. Um, and then further on, a policy also um, requires that um, service fees only be um, charged to the policy, to the property that's receiving the service to minimize, um, you know, additional fees for ag land. So I, I, I see that. Um, I think that though there could be some additional language to more specifically identify the specific circumstances that you're identifying here. And, but I'm not sure that expanding an entire district is the right way to go about it. And um, I have some ideas about some language that might, um, satisfy my concerns as that of the Coastal Commission that I I can offer um, on the 24th or the September 14th, whenever the data is we're making recommendations. But um, this is a significant one for me. And um, and I as I see it for the Coastal Commission as well. Um, but thank you for that. Um, OK, so the next couple I had were related to to the water and sewer lines. Um, okay, the next one. <clears throat> oh gosh. Okay. Um, was on page 39, I would say. So page 39, when you say the online version. Yeah, the online version, um, 1.3D. 1. 1. Okay, that won't work if we're not looking at it online. So maybe you could just say well, what it's about. It's the only version I have. I wish I well, had. I understand, it. but maybe you could just tell us what. <laughs> yeah, the issue I will is. read it. So um, this is um, proposed policy 1.3.1D, 1. 1. small letter D, and it's regarding the conversion of commercial agriculture lands which as you, Commissioner Shepard, know, we have really, really tight policies about the conversion of uh, commercial ag lands. And so um, this is speaking to that issue. And D, from what looks like to me, is a new proposed policy, which is talking about an exception to the findings of A and B, um, applies to the conversion of agricultural land to accommodate. A, yeah, so this is speaking to the public quasi-public use where necessary to address a compelling public health and safety or environmental concern subject to the findings of blah, blah, blah. So this is one that I, I'd like some explanation why this is being added. Um, I'd like to hear some suggestions of what you would consider 
something with overwhelming need too. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I think the intention here is to be able to provide um, a public facility use in an area where it's needed. Um, this also addresses concerns of the Board of Supervisors that public facility uses be able to be provided where needed. Um, and like what kind of public facility? Are we talking about a park? Are we talking about a wastewater treatment? I mean, that public facilities can be anything, a county building. I mean, I think that a, a prison. A prison. If we're talking about converting ag land, um, I think we need to be really specific. Yeah, I mean, it must if you saw the need to do this, there must have been something that raised, well, we really need to have an X, but this is wide open. Do you want to add to that, Stephanie? Yeah, like maybe I can help. Um, I, Annie can confirm, but I believe this in part came up from the um, necessary changes at the Buena Vista landfill. Um, that facility is coming to a close um, and they're going to uh, need to build a transfer station. They're doing some other work um, and having no, no policy that allowed um, our ability to locate a facility in a place that really, you know, needed mm -hmm. facility in a place that made sense, like makes, makes much more sense to uh, build a transfer station at this site than to find another site in the county to build a transfer station because you already have similar facilities there. Um, the uh, landfill will uh, then be transferred to another facility. Um, landfill contents would be transferred to another facility in Monterey County. Um, and so there are times when you have a facility and there there really isn't another place where you can locate it. And I think it was um, the concept that we um, provide some very limited circumstances where if you have to have a, a public facility and there's nowhere else you can locate it, um, so, that there be a provision for that. Okay, that makes sense. I understand now why this was put in here, um, if it's for the Buena Vista facility, though I don't think that um, if it's just specifically for that facility, I don't even think it's worth it because um, I doubt. So first of all, I don't think that it, um, it squares with the Coastal Act, um, and and I, I mean, I don't think that the Coastal Commission would agree to converting ag land for that purpose. Um, so anyway, I'll just say this: uh, this um, addition um, is makes me very uncomfortable, and I'm not sure I, I support it. And and I actually don't know that it will, um, it will actually meet the goal that it's intended to meet if it's for the uh, transfer station. Um, so the next one I have, I believe is, uh, let's see. Okay. Okay, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's skipping quite ahead to uh, 3.1.1. Four. Which I'll give you the page number in just a second. If somebody can has it yes. before me, feel free to yell it out. Three point one point one four. It's about Harkins Slough Road. I'm looking at a different version than you have. I'm looking at the um the I have the same document she has. It's page sixty four. Thank you. One point four. One four. Well, you said three point you... one point one four, right? It's the online version, Renee. It's like the if you go to the sustainability update website. I mean, I, I'm that's I'm using the same version she is. I would just if Rachel could just say what it's about. I yeah. don't have. Thing, I don't want to go. I only have one screen. I can't look at another screen and look at you guys. So. Totally agree. I am. I am getting there. It's the okay. Here we go. 3.1.14. Can I just give a little background on this before you dive in? Um, okay, I have background too, but go for it. Yeah, well, so so the Coastal Commission, one of their comments was they're, they're adamantly opposed to changing this. So I can just tell you 
So what we're proposing for the, when we come back with the final draft is basically to keep the policies as they are now, right. consolidate them in another section and just not mess with it. So that's the, that's right. the plan. <laughs> Thank you, Annie. Dip it in the bud, yeah. <laughs> we saved a whole bunch of time. So right, I yeah, okay. My 20-year history with that. Issue. Yeah, right, okay. <laughs> that was the great compromise. <laughs> okay. Um, the next one is on, on page 91. This is where I started getting smart and putting in my own page numbers. Um, and it has to do with septic issues. And, and which policy is this? Oh, <laughs> the night. Forgot to write down the policy. Oh, okay, yes. some reason I'm, I'm looking at the online version, but I have different page numbers. I'm not sure why. So, okay. Um, so, Annie, it's not the page number at the bottom. It's like the page number of the PDF. So it's 91 of 146 versus at the bottom. It's this oh, page 5-85. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So Thank I, I, okay. It took that, me a minute to realize. What that clarifies. Okay. Yes. Like, wait, why am I not seeing the same page? So yeah, no, it's page 91 it's of 146, which yeah. of the so, PDF. Yeah. Not so the ask really quick. Just to be really clear, because mm -hmm. we have a you know a handout that probably people in the public are following, and that's what I'm following, and I'm not seeing exactly where you guys are at either. So well, that's because where I'm on the website the, are you? I can't see either. So she's she's in the general plan itself. So it's yeah. it's it's not part of the staff document. It's yeah. so, the, it's. Thank you. Then you then you got to tell us what you're talking about. Karen. I am going to. I'm so sorry, but so I actually am reading the entire general plan on this section because that's where the, the money is, the meat is. Um, so right now um, I am referring to page 91 of the online version of the, the ag portion of the general plan. Um, and there's a whole bunch of, and Renee, you might be very interested in this because there is a whole bunch of septic requirements that are being proposed to be deleted. Um, and so I wanted to understand what the thinking was behind that. Um, yes, so let's Are you see. saying that we didn't have this? I, I am a little confused as to, I thought I read the big documents I got, the call and the staff report. Is this something else? Yes, they did not provide us the entire general plan in our staff report. Well, of course. So they just provided a summary which didn't go over, you know, of course it didn't go over all the changes. So to really see every single change in addition that's being proposed, you have to go on to the sustainability website and, and click on the actual chapters of the general plan. Well, I have to say as a district that, you know, being the district has all septic tanks, I really need to look at this and I, I have not. Well, we got another crack at it later this month. So can I, uh, Stephanie, could you help me find that section? I don't want to have to read, wasn't planning to read the entire general plan, but you can help <laughs> me out by saying, just sending an email and maybe anybody else who wants it too, with some direction on how to find that. Certainly we can pro provide the direction. Um, these, all of these documents are on the, project website um, and you know the general plan, plan is quite large and when you um, take in in all of the underlying strike through changes it gets even larger um, so I I'm very happy to point out the policies that Commissioner Dan is um, is picking up on and I can I can help you you find them. Well, thank you. I would appreciate just some guidance on anything that particularly applies to the district, which is all septic tanks. For example, that would be anything that you know from your extensive knowledge is particularly pertinent to this district, which has different constraints and different realities than the rest of the more urbanized districts. I would yeah, appreciate I, that help. I, I think when we have a chance to hear the comment and respond, I think that might help with the concerns. So... Go, go, go ahead, just, Commissioner. Yeah, I'll just say before you tell me your thinking behind this, that I actually would encourage all of us, even though it is extensive, but we all have to read the general plan. I mean, that's the only way we're going to know what's happening here is if we go into it and read those strikeouts and additions. Otherwise, um, you know, staff's well-intentioned staff report is not going to give you what you need to know to make a thoughtful recommendation to the board. Um, so anyway, <laughs> um, 
So yeah, could you explain what's going on here? Um, right, so we worked with John Ricker on this section. Um, and so many of these deletions, he um, just felt that it was more detail. One of the goals of you know the updated general plan is to try and streamline policies and sort of keep them at a higher policy level. So, so these aren't um, these most of these aren't really substantive changes in terms of the county's process and requirements. But a lot of these um, are are referencing the uh, septic disposal ordinance in Title Seven of the county code. Um, so, um, so yeah, for the most part, we're not really changing our, um, existing, um, sewage disposal requirements there. Um, John Ricker will be bring an ordinance to, um, you may have already come to the planning right. commission for, for septic. So, um, this will also be brought in line with, with that, um, okay. Amendments, yeah. so there may be additional policies will be added to that um, as part of his update to the sustainability update. But generally, it's not changing existing practice. It's just trying to consolidate and reference the code. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. I figured that to have to be something like that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe at our next hearing, we could ask him to attend and give explain it, why he made those changes. He's usually very succinct and to the point. Or I can also, if he's not available, I can also see if I can give you a little more detail about each policy, if that would be helpful. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the next section is on visual resources. Um, and it's 5.1.1. And now I'm lost on the online version, I have to say. Okay, so I'm just going to go by my notes because somehow I am not going in order here. <clears throat> um, so this is a designation of visual resources. Um, and, yeah, and I can, um, if people are looking at the online version, this is page 104 of the PDF. Thank you. <laughs> I'm definitely going to be writing down online page numbers in my next go of things. So I apologize for being so confusing. Okay. You said one of, oh, okay, there it is. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So actually the one I'm more concerned about is 5.1.5 preserving ag vistas. So I think it actually 5.1.1, I have some language, some real kind of um, easy language that I can um, suggest when the time is appropriate. But the one I'm more concerned about is 5.1.5, which changes some language from, yes, it takes out shall be and adds are considered, which to me seems to weaken um, this policy. What's the, what was, why, would, why was that modified in that way? Um, to be the, the, Previous planning director felt that general plan policies should not use the word shell for the most part. I, I don't necessarily agree with that personally, to be honest, but that, that's the reasoning for it. I think she thought it was more appropriate to okay. um, not use that type of words in a, in a policy. So, okay. Uh, why not? <laughs> you have a thing to add to that, Stephanie? I, I don't. Oh, you're muted. All right. Um, just that this is a policy document not a code and a lot of the language cleanup tries to keep the policies consolidate them keep them at a higher level policy so that when like the septic ones we were just talking about so that when you go to the code you have the actual requirements in in the code and so that's mm -hmm. part of what's happening here not to remove um any regulatory power at, at, at all, um, but just to distinguish between a policy document versus a uh, you know a code of regulations. Okay, that actually that actually helps a lot to understand a lot of the language changes. Actually, so um, I appreciate that. And um, so this that may actually be the 
explanation for the next one, which is open beaches and bluff tops, which is 5.1.7, page 106. And the issue I have here is the sentence that says, um, do not permit the placement of new permanent structures to be developed in a manner that would be adversely visible from a public beach. So the word that sticks out for me is adversely because there's a lot of subjectivity to that. Um, so I'm just, I guess I'm wondering what staff thinks about that. I think part of it is clarified somewhat in the next um, underlined sentence that some development may be permissible, but should be appropriately designed to, to minimize visual impacts. Adverse is used again. <laughs> But honestly, I don't. I don't think it's possible. Like just thinking about you know development, you know along the coastal bluff on the beach. Like I think it's impossible to, if they're if they're replacing a house with a new house, I think it would be impossible for it not to be visible. So mm -hmm. I think maybe part of it's just acknowledging what's what's possible, you know, on certain sites. But mm -hmm. I mean, it stuck out to me because you guys know we have that issue has, has come up. Um, so the next one is ridge tops. Okay, and the, the similar issue here, um, different adjective. So that is 5.1.8, uh, protect ridge tops, where am I here? This is hard, I have to say, having to do it this way. Okay, um, actually page 106 right at the bottom. Protect ridge tops and prominent natural landforms such as cliffs, bluffs, dunes, rocks, blah, 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 um, from inappropriate development and impacts on visual resources, public vista, scenic assets. So I like the second underlying section, inappropriate development. Why not just say development that has impacts? Um, if it's interfering with a public vista, wouldn't that by definition mean it's inappropriate? Um, yeah, I think the original language read protect ridge tops and prominent natural landforms, such as cliffs, bluffs, et cetera, from development. So I think um, that language in itself probably is, doesn't quite work. But I think, you know, if you, if you wanted to reword it, um, I think what you're saying is other significant features from development that impacts visual resources, right? Is that kind of what you're thinking? Pretty much. And yeah, that, that could work. And it speaks to um, C of that section, which I actually of all of these feel like is the one that is weakens the policy the most as modified. I, I like the language that was crossed out, which just says prohibit the creation of new parcels, which would require structures to project above the ridgeline tree line or along the edge of prominent natural landforms. And that was replaced with Restrict the height and placement of buildings and structures to prevent their projection above the ridge line. Restrict structures and structural projections adjacent to prominent natural landforms. To me, prohibit is better than restrict, though. I mean, I guess we're parsing language here, though it seems like a weakening to me, unless I'm missing something. I just want to say that I think Commissioner Dance making good points because these the things she's bringing out are the ones we've spent hours on in planning commissions with people who want to do just that. So it is worth picking picking nits on the language, and I would support what she said so far. It just brings back endless conversation from people who want to do whatever they want to do on the bluffs. Yeah, thank you. Um, a lot of this is from uh, many years of. of uh, dealing with stuff here. Um, so yeah, I'll just put that, that was just, you know, food for thought for staff okay. when this comes back. Um, the next one is about timber. Um, so this is page moving on to 117. And there's some significant proposed changes about how we deal with um, timber harvest plans. So let me get to the item so I can remember what I was thinking. Okay, 
so this is speaking to when a timber management plan should be required and when a timber harvest plan is required. So I guess I just wanted to know where this was, did this come from discussions with uh, um, foresters or Farm Bureau or Big Creek? Um, what it's actually doing is, is making sure there are some inconsistencies between the general plan and between the county code. So it's actually, the code is what we've been following. So it's actually bringing the general plan policies into alignment with the code. Aha, okay. Yeah, in terms of when we require a timber management plan. Okay. Great. Okay, well, that um, that satisfies that. Um, then let's see, I think that might be it for my questions on the general plan. And then, so I have a, a couple on the zoning code. Um, so I'm gonna start with community events. Uh, let me see if I can find that section here. Oh yeah, here we go. Um, so this is the zoning code now. So we're in a different online document. And from my online um, version of the chapter 1310, it's page 10, community events and fundraisers on private residential or agricultural property. Yeah, this code is, um, the section of the code is 1310. Um, Six mini events. 614. 614. Yeah. 614, yes. Yeah. My notes too. Um, so this one, um, I just so my understanding for this one is that uh, as you said in your uh, introduction to uh, what this is proposing is to allow up to two events per year with no noticing and uh, no public hearing, which uh, is a it's a quite a big change. So I just want to make sure I'm understanding that correctly and that's what's being proposed. With this, so it's being proposed with a minor use permit, which would be no noticing, no public hearing. Um, that's correct. These do require a, a mailed uh, notice of, of prior to the event, but there is not um, there's not so I guess that's similar, but there's not notice of the, like the permit approval, but there is notice required to be sent out. Um, if you look at um, e, E1A on the top of page, um, page 11, um, neighborhood notice. For each event, a notice is required to be mailed to all property owners and occupants within 500 feet of the subject property at least 10 mm -hmm. days in advance of the event. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. <clears throat> So I'm this this one I'm um, can be thinking about quite a bit. I mean this I think this one and then the next item I'm going to move on to, which is commercial weddings on private property, is probably one of the most contentious um, issues that have come up in my time here. Um, and so I think it's it's worth um, worth really thinking about. And in general, I guess I'll just ask a general comment. In general, it seems that um, the, 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 the need for public hearings is being reduced. And so I guess I wanted to know, given how contentious these, these have been um, with neighbors and how many times they're usually appealed, um, what was the thinking behind reducing the amount of um, um, public hearing requirements? Are you speaking generally? Yeah, just generally. I mean, I'm speaking towards, um, you know, community events, but also the proposed regulations for um, weddings and, and commercial events on private property. Um, well, so, so in terms of specifically the community events, um, the, the idea was that, um, you know, if they're just limited in number and that they help sort of serve a community purpose and fundraise from organizations and there's you know, one event without amplified music or a couple of events with amplified music where the conditions could be applied, that it made sense to provide sort of a streamlined process for that. Um, for, for weddings and um, commercial events for weddings where they have like a, you know, a, a site that's used for regular weddings, 
um, that would require a notice of public hearing. So for that, there is a conditional use permit that would be required. Um, and I don't know if you want to speak, Stephanie, to the general, um, um, you know, move towards fewer public hearings in general. Yeah, well, I, I, I think there are um, some conditions where events are going to be limited. And I think the thought process is that those just may not require the same level. So it's, you know, depending on how in, intensive a use is, in other words, how many times per year they're going to do it, um, that, that, you know, if it's a lot, that requires a higher level of um, scrutiny. Um, so it's, it's a matter of just trying to um, not put the little guys through the same pro big process as, you know, the, guy, the, the events um, areas that are having a lot of events. And so I think it's it's just finding the right process level. Um, so can you um, clarify for me then, uh, somebody applying for commercial uses on their property, a wedding, an event um, center on say an 11 acre site, they wanna do 12 a year, what would that be? What, what, what um, would that be an AUP or would that be a CUP? Um, all of the wedding, so community events are are sort of regulated separately. If they have one or two community events, that's a much yeah, easier process. Thinking, but, I get community yeah. events now. Right. On yeah. To okay. Show. Yeah. So for any wedding venue, any any number of weddings at all would require a CUP. So that's always a notice right. public hearing. Yeah. A CUP. Right. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Oh. This is, these are new terms, so you don't necessarily know. Wait a minute. Oh, a I'm CUP. trying to use them. I mean, I, the only way I'm going to get to know them is if I try to use them. So yeah. Right. A yeah. CUP means it notice public hearing before the planning commission does um, it. Not. Well, it's it before the zoning administrator, unless there unless it specifies in the code that it would go to the planning commission. So for this one, it would be proposed to go to the zoning administrator. And that would mean that that would mean a notice to neighbors within more than 500 feet. Um, let's see the standard. That's a, that's a lot of weddings, and and I would share with Commissioner Dunn this. We've heard a lot about people just feel really betrayed when someone has twelve weddings a year because wedding guests don't take, don't tend to place any attention on where they're supposed to park and stuff, especially in Bonnie Doon. That's been very contentious. Right. Um, yeah. So for the weddings, another um, thing that is required is to hold a a neighborhood meeting prior to um, issuing the permit. So I, th I think the idea there is also to understand neighborhood concerns and have the permit conditions, you know, address Good. Provide so conditions of permit to the neighborhood. The most important thing from my perspective about it needing a CUP is that that's appealable. So even if it's a ZA hearing, it's appealable. So um, so that that's so that's good. Um, so because I, I see I'm already taking up too much time, I, I just am going to move on. And I just had a couple of questions from the staff presentation. And one was about the scenic designations. And I think that I heard uh, Stephanie say that because of the loss of tree cover along certain areas of, of Highway 1, um, and there was a photo of Mission Street in Santa Cruz, that those that certain streets are being removed from scenic designation. Was that, did I hear that correctly? Just, just along Highway 1. Um, okay. So the areas that are um, still have trees where it is more scenic in the county, those continue to be a scenic corridor. Um, and the more urban areas where there's been a loss of trees, I understand there was uh, an oak disease that hit a lot of them. Um, the trees are lost. Now you're seeing buildings and development that really doesn't qualify as scenic. So just in that area along Highway 1, um, we would remove the, the designation. Okay, I understand that. that It is um, troubling to me that we can lose a scenic designated um, areas because of, of tree loss. Um, I would kind of rather that if there's a tree loss, we would have policies and code to replace the trees so that we could retain uh, not just the scenic designation, but just retain the, the canopy cover and the tree cover. 
Um, so I'm going to think about for when we come back. Um, and then for um, for administrative use permits and administrative site development permit permits, will the same signage requirements um, be in place? You know, will a development that just needs an AUP still have to put up the big sign that says notice of plan development on the site? Yes, we're not proposing any changes to the signage requirements, including that new that new signage requirement that came into effect a few years ago about the large sign. Okay. Um, and then um, one last question, and this is with regard to um, a letter from the Sierra Club that indicated that monarchs were taken off of the species list. Can you speak to that? I can speak to that. Um, so the uh, EIR, uh, the biologists who helped with that um, section with our consultant did a um, did did the normal research in which they find um, a species of special concern <clears throat> and um, endangered species and federally listed species, and they kind of do their regular research and then they look at them and see. Um, uh, which have a, a propensity to locate in a certain area, and it's kind of how they decide if there's going to be biological resources. Um, the monarch butterfly is a candidate species. It was not included in those lists because the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, um, or um, yeah, U.S. Fish and Wildlife has a lot of species they look at, and so it remains a candidate. And so it fell off the list. Um, and when we saw the letter, we hadn't realized that 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 loss had occurred. So the, we'll be replacing that um, list both in the EIR and in the general plan with a new list that um, includes not only the monarch species, but also includes several other uh, candidate species that had been lost. So it was unintentional. Right. Okay. That's that's great. Um, and then the last thing is just a, a process um, question. So we have a meeting on the 24th of this month and a meeting on September 14th. I originally thought that those two meetings were both for us to take action. Um, is that still the plan or is it the meeting on the 24th to have something else and our day for action is the 14th of September. Yeah, you know, um, there there's so many ways to go about this, right? Um, uh, but what we figured is we'll start the public hearing on August 24th. Um, we'll do the presentation. You can take public comment. Um, you can, uh, we were thinking if you have direction that you want to give to staff, that you know these changes that you want to make, you could do that then. Then we'll continue the public hearing on the next meeting at September 14th, and you wouldn't actually take action until the end of that meeting. So that would be um, when we thought we would get motions for changes okay. and um, and what you actually want to send on to the, um, the, the board. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. If, so if that is the case, I would make a strong plea to have no other items on September 14th, because I see this taking quite a long time and I see us having to take each section of the general plan by chapter. This is what we want to change in this chapter, this chapter, each chapter separately, and same with the changes for the zoning code. So I see, and that seems to me the most organized way to provide recommendations to the board. So uh, that I think will take up a full day potentially. And if there's any way to just have that be our only item, that would be, that'd be great. I would, I, I'd like to second that because I do not see, is it a day like today, that this is one of the most important things we'll do on our service to the Planning Commission. I really want the extra time. And I'd like also ask that items be postponed till after we do these very important upgrades. Just ask Jocelyn if there's anything coming up on that uh, <coughs> September 14th meeting that could get, would, would there be a problem pushing? Um, 
We, I think we do have some items, at least one on that date. Um, I will take a look at the schedule after the meeting today and check in with the planning commission. I'm wondering if we could potentially look at adding a, a special hearing date um, so that we can keep our other work on track as well. Um, but I, I'll, I will email. I'll email everyone and, and work that out afterwards. I, I understand the request for sure. Well, I would be willing to do a special meeting, but I'm not, I just don't see how we can do it justice if we tried to pack it all in one day. It'd be worth postponing someone's project. They're going to get a lot better fair hearing if we're not got this in front of us. They won't sit around all day either. I'll follow up by email. <laughs> I just wanted to, to um, um, note, uh, Commissioner Dan, that we also are looking at the Coastal Commission comments regarding um, policies for ag lands. So we may be um, proposing some amendments for the um, final, uh, the public hearing draft, in addition to the the changes that I already mentioned for the the MOU policies. Okay. Um, yeah. Maybe we. Yeah, I don't know how appropriate this is, but I actually had some ideas that I thought probably could satisfy um, their concerns um, that would also kind of meet the needs of what I think we're trying to achieve here too. So, so I appreciate that. And thank you, thank you so much for all the work that went into this. I mean, I only had to read this through. I can't imagine the amount of time and thinking and analysis it took to think through every single piece of one of these policies and change the language and, and all that. So, I mean, so I really appreciate it. And um, I hope you see my appreciation and that I actually read it all, so. <laughs> yes, thank you. So, Chair Gordon, I'll go next if, if that's mm -hmm. all right. Sure, please go ahead. Um, thankfully, um, Commissioner Dan gave you over several of mine. I just, I have some clarifying questions even on some of the ones she brought up, if that's okay. Um, I'm going to go through it the way I think that uh, Chair Gordon would prefer, which is using the the staff report um, as a, for my page reference numbers. Although sometimes I do reference the way I often read it is like like Commissioner Dan, I read the staff report and then kind of reference the 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 code or the the general plan as appropriate, which makes it really back and forth when I read this document. Um, I don't know if that makes it harder or easier. Um, one of the questions I had, which was, I, I, you know, Commissioner Shepard brought up as well, which is this question about on, on page 10 when we were talking about the the quasi-public use. Um, it's both in the general plan, but it's also in county code section 1310-315, um, which is this when it's appropriate to minimize the loss of agricultural land as possible when that talks about, so it talks about subdivisions and lot line adjustments. And I, I would just share Commissioner Dan's concern and then my question had been and I don't know if we need to answer it so much as like when would that be necessary for public use so I don't really know that that question got answered if it's if it's specifically if the only concept we're even considering is this one isolated use I'm curious if that's our answer if we're talking about things like cell towers if we're talking about you know, county public buildings. I'm just, I'm, I don't know that I was satisfied with the answer of are we, are we really contemplating the singular option of, 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 because it's both in, like I said, the general plan and the county code of, of this idea of reducing and doing lot line adjustments of, of ag parcels because we have these minimum standards of ag. And I'm just curious, is that, is that really the only time we're contemplating it? Because it seems like a, it seems like a really big change for a single instance. Um, uh, let's see, I'm, are you, I want to make sure I understand your question. Are you asking specifically regarding subdivision of CA land when that's appropriate? Well, so in, in this part of the, it's, it's the part that Commissioner Dan referenced. She just did it with, with regard to the, the general plan, but it's also in the county code change as well as the staff report. It talks about these, um, subdivisions or lot line adjustments on county code specifically for, um, the establishment of public use or quasi-public uses. And I just wanted more clarity of if the sole reason that staff put this in there was because of the landfill. 
Um, no, so it's, I, I think the landfill that Stephanie mentioned is an example of like a public facility use that's, that's in this case, it's already on CA land, but the county did like an extensive search and couldn't find alternative sites. So, okay. so that's sort of an example, but I think the idea is that, you know, where, where there might be a similar example where they did like an alternative analysis, they couldn't find another location um, where there's some reason, maybe where there's some nexus to ag land where it needed to be provided. I know already in the code, they allow, I think, recycled water facilities, but that's sort of an example where it's sort of needed in that location. Um, but the, yeah, so, so where, where there would be an essential public, quasi-public use that the county determines would be appropriate on, on CA land, where they did that analysis showing there weren't any all the other alternative sites, then for that, there could be a um, land division considered for that use. And the idea really would be to, um, in, in a sense, to like be able to protect, to subdivide that part of the parcel off necessary for the public facility use in order to protect the viability of the remaining parcel, which would remain in CA. So it's intended to facilitate a public facility use, but also protect the ag land. Okay. And if then you, I, if you don't I mind, just, I'm just gonna come back to this one too. So if we'll go, could we, would you consider Commissioner Valenti, if I'm gonna address the same thing, Maybe I could ask my questions about that one at the same time because otherwise I got to we have to go back and forth. I would. I just don't want to make sure we don't get distracted. Um, I only have a few to go through. Um, okay. I, I I just want if, if that's okay. Um, sure. On page fourteen of the staff report, um, we sorry, I'm getting my notes back up because I just um, I, I it's funny Commissioner Dan and I have many of the same, but I just want to get some more clarifying questions on this that I didn't. Still got answered when we're talking about the scenic corridor. Um, the project for Highway One, when it got constructed for the auxiliary lanes, and they did all those tree installations, were were part of the reason that Caltrans did all of that. Was that part because of the scenic designation that they did so much vegetation restoration? I don't think so. The scenic designation is a local designation. It's not a state designation. So the highway is not um, designated by Caltrans, um, but I think that they recognize that as appropriate mitigation for, for that type of project. Um, like they would do a noise wall for some. Or... Okay. okay, I just, I thank you for that. I, mm -hmm. I agree with Commissioner Dan's concerns about that we, simply because we lost ground on keeping something scenic, I worry that we would be seeding um, and instead of, so I'll contemplate that as well. Um, yeah, and I would, I would just add that it was, you know, disease as I understand it, that really took out that whole kind of area worth of trees. It wasn't attrition by development um, so much. And at one point when it was fully vegetated, it was a, a you know a nice area to drive through. Now it's really more of an urban area. So that was the point. <clears throat> and then on page 18 of the staff report in the very top of the page, it talks about um, more efficient permitting process. And it says, for instance, attached single family dwelling units are now allowed, um, sorry, are now, are now, and allowed use permitted by right in the single family zone districts. Um, can you, there's no code attached for me to know exactly where in the, the code this is being changed, referenced. And so I was hoping maybe you could further elaborate on what this is in reference to, because I, I understand on obviously multi-residential on, on our flex zoning, but if we're having a, a, a parcel that's zoned single family dwelling, I'm just wondering if you could, if, if, and it, what what an attached single family dwelling would look like on a parcel that's only zoned for one unit. Obviously, we have ADUs and we have JADUs, but since there wasn't somewhere for me to reference this, can you explain? Yeah, what you're, I, you're contemplating here and what you're. Yeah, I think so. It's, this is will be over in the residential code, and um, I think I'll ask Daisy Allen if she might be able to help us with that. Sure, uh, happy to help. Hi there. <laughs> um, oh, sorry about me. 
Um, yeah, so when we say attached uh, single family, um, we're generally talking about, you know, townhome style development. And uh, we're clarifying in the code that we allow um, townhome style, style development in uh, single family zones um, uh, uh, with uh, 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 as a common area development or um, if you have uh, two two single family zone properties next to each other, you could have um, two townhomes that share uh, 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 the property line um, uh, in that scenario. So that that's that's sort of what's meant there. Um, if that clarifies. Yeah, I know the fact that they would be able to share property lines. That's because I was having trouble kind of visualizing if you had a single family home, how you'd have an attached style. So that makes sense. You, you allow it now with an attached property line. It sounds like that's what we're expanding to allow. Right, exactly. Okay. Um, I also, I could clarify a little bit also uh, additionally on this, the scenic corridor. Um, one of the issues that comes up sometimes in development review um, along Highway 1, uh, specifically in the urban area along like the Soquel Ave um, frontage road in that area, um, is that um, if you're um, in that scenic area, you are required to um, meet certain uh, uh, design requirements um, related to like whether the property can can be seen from the highway. And it's not really possible to meet those requirements given the existing situation with without vegetation on Highway 1. Um, uh, so that designation is... Um, sometimes problematic for um, approving development that might otherwise appear to be, you know, appropriate um, in that that urban area, especially where we are proposing to enhance our, you know, medical office building um, type of uh, development in the future. Thank you. And then the next one I have is I I know Commissioner Dan asked about these two, but I I I'd like I'd like to touch on them a bit, which is the community events and then the weddings. I'll I'll take the community events first, which is I just would like clarity on this, um, which is in the staff report. It very specifically talks about community and nonprofit events with a hundred um, or more guests, um, and so I I would really like to touch on this because I I I one would like I couldn't find anything in the in the code that specifically referenced 100 guests. And I want to know the other question is, I, I would like you to specify for me, if someone's having community events with 75 guests, are we having no limitation on the number of events? Whether or not they have, as long as we're, they're having acoustic music, are we okay with that versus obviously, or is, do we have different, do they not have to get permitting? Um, for the event component, if they have amplified music, obviously perhaps they need an amplified music permit, but could you, I know it's like a lot of questions at once, but if you could maybe speak to the things I just spoke to, that'd be helpful because like I said, the staff report specifically references 100 um, people or more. I couldn't find that reference in the code. Um, and then could you clarify for, for if they having less than 100 events, are we not being bothered um, with requiring permitting or tracking or anything like that? Because that would that would be helpful for me. Um, and understanding what the direction the staff is kind of making this recommendation. Um, yes, I I would like to verify that in the code so I can maybe I can get back to that question in a moment. But um, but it certainly I, I mean I believe that's correct that it only if it's fewer than a hundred guests and it wouldn't be regulated, but um, it's still would be subject to our noise ordinance, for example. So, so that would affect, you know, the ability to have amplified music um, and that sort of thing. But it's generally intended for those larger events where they would be regulated. Okay, thank you for that. I'll, I'll ask you my next questions about um, kind of the, the what we're calling commercial events. I know that we often think of them as weddings, but they, they can be commercial events as a whole. They could be um, concerts, for example, and things like that, as long as they're paying, they, they come into this category of commercial events. I know we just usually say commercial weddings um, as a kind of a paintbrush to deal with them. But I, I'd like to touch on these because what I what I didn't find when I read 1310-615 um, was the standard. 
Um, I, I, what I found is it, it kept saying that we were limiting the number of guests, hours of, hours of operation, amplified music, and number of annual events permitted that they'll be established for the condition of use permit. But I found no regulation, no regulatory framework. And I'm wondering if I missed it or how this will be structured moving forward. Because although we had minimum standards on the parcel size, I basically found nothing else. In fact, when reading the staff report, I mean, you're allowing them on RA and RR. I mean, a rural residential parcel um, is a residential parcel. And while the, 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 the code says it needs to be secondary to a winery and a brewery and residential and um, residential ag parcels, it, it also says it just has to be secondary to residential use. So you're, uh, to me, I, I don't know how some parcel couldn't meet that standard. Right, um, and so I'm a, I'm a little, if you could clarify for me what framework you're asking us to build around these commercial events uh, on these residential parcels, they are rural residential parcels and, and rural agricultural parcels, um, that would be helpful for me because I think these parameters are important. Um, this is something as Commissioner Jan mentioned, we dealt with quite extensively in 2014, which is what led to this. And I think it's important that we talk about, um, are we allowing 300 events a year? Are we allowing 30 events a year? Um, and how many guests are we saying 250? Um, is that only allowed on parcel sizes of 25 acres, 2.5 acres? Um, and I just didn't see anything in here. And it's very possible I missed it. I did try to read all of the code and I tried to read all the, 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 the um, everything, but you know, a lot of words. Um, yes, okay. So, so um, so let's see, in terms of um, where they would be allowed, um, you know, you're correct in terms of the zone districts that you um, identified and the minimum parcel size would apply. So the idea with that um, minimum parcel size is that there should be enough area to, you know, provide a buffer to adjacent land uses. Um, and um, in terms of, um, there is not, a absolute limits specified in the code um, for the number of guests per event um, or events per year. Um, the, the idea is that um, through, through this neighborhood meeting and um, that parameters be established that, that are appropriate based on the, the site um, neighboring parcels and that sort of thing, but there's not a, a limit, specific limit on the number maximum number um, for, for weddings and commercial of uh, similar events in the code. But I guess my question, Ms. Murphy, then is how are those standards set? So if, they, if it's not in the code, when someone comes to the planning department or if the permit comes before, sorry, check, check, checking, checking which level, <laughs> it's a CUP. <laughs> right. When it comes before the ZA, what standards will be used to determine the framework under, like it seems very, sub, sorry, it seems very subjective. If it's not in our code, how will, how other, I mean, you're saying that conditions on the ground are essentially going to decide the, the, the conditions, like the, 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 the conditions of approval for this permit. What I'm hearing, at least, and let's tell me I'm wrong, because what I'm hearing from you, my reflexive hearing is that you're telling me that there are not any parameters in the code that says, Max, like, like, let's take cannabis for example. Different permit parcel sizes have different, you know, square foot footage. They have a different, um, all all these different things are based on parameters that are in that codified. And, and what I'm hearing is that th those framework doesn't exist for this. Am I correct? And am I hearing you correctly? That those aren't codified. They aren't here in the code. Yes, that's correct. The code okay. does not have like this is the maximum number of events per year that could be allowed or maximum number of guests. It doesn't. Okay. It doesn't. Okay. 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 Thank you. I, I appreciate that sure. clar clarity. Um, sure. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, okay. Um, sorry to harp on that one. It's just it's a really big one because in these rural communities, it's something we just as I just want to make sure I wasn't missing. Um, I think that might have been my last question of clarity because, like I said, thankfully Commissioner Dan got a lot of them out of the way. I just those were the couple pieces I wanted to um, make sure I didn't misunderstand. So I really appreciate you walking me through once again, um, since I touched on all of the ones, Commissioner Dan did some of those pieces. So I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Definitely.
Great. Thank you, Commissioner Violante. Um, Commissioner Lazenby or Shepard, did either one of you want to go ahead with some comments or questions? Well, I have um, I have a comment, and Commissioner Dan may remember these two cases we had. One was the brewery that wanted to have concerts and, and gatherings in the um, sort of in the courtyard there. That wasn't that in near Davenport. Or do you remember that? Then there was the other one that was at the winery, and it was out a very narrow road. It wasn't Soquel, it was um, Paradise Valley or something. And the biggest complaint was the traffic trying to get there, but they worked it out. So each the winery had uh, got a license to have on, on site sales, and then they had a very large piece of land. But there were some there were some meetings where the neighbors were very upset. But I don't know how to tell you to find those. There's been several. Um, I don't remember one in Davenport, though. I there was a, a big brouhaha up in uh, Bonnie Dune, the Savankaya property. There was a um, yeah, the, right. Yeah, I don't even want to mention them all. <laughs> There's too much PTSD. But yes, it has um, it has come up quite often, and so I appreciate the attention we're giving to this this particular item. Um, just because, uh, uh, Commissioner Lazenby, you mentioned the road. There is a specific language regarding road capacity. Use permits for weddings exceeding 50 guests will be reviewed by the. Public Works Department as necessary to assess yes. road capacity and infrastructure. So we are trying to make sure that that's addressed for these sites. Thank you. There was also one about a, a wedding shop and then she wanted to become commercial and have weddings on site. And that that's in a case somewhere. It's actually case uh, precedent, I guess. But my memory is not that good. Yes, and I, 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 I know this is a controversial issue. I think the general, the general intention is to provide a lot of opportunity with the free development neighborhood meeting. There would also be a person that would need to be on site available for questions or concerns. The permit also for weddings expires in three years and requires renewal. So there is some... In, intention built in the ordinance to try and address neighbor concerns and make sure that these are operated in a way that's compatible with the neighborhood. Thanks. Yes. That's all I have. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Lazenby, Commissioner Shepard, did you have any other comments or questions? Maybe. Are you there, Commissioner Shepard? Uh, thank you. I am now unmuted. Um, I would agree that the wedding venue issue has been fraught, but I would hope that with these more ways of guiding the path to getting a successful permit, um, that it'll work a little better. Public works commenting on the roads, neighborhood meetings, and so on. I think a lot of it happened because neighbors didn't know it was going to be there. And all of a sudden, one peaceful Sunday, their neighborhood was hugely disrupted. But I think that, you know, we could try these and see how, how they work out. Um, however, uh, what I wanted to ask about was um, going back to the uh, two items that have been touched on before, uh, loss of urban trees. Um, I understand the trees are gone and they were sick but isn't there somewhere in the general plan that we could talk about a policy of trying to replace trees that have been lost to disease? In other words, if you lose the trees because oak trees got oak disease, it would be nice that the policy was not, oh, well, there's no more trees, so we don't need trees there, but uh, you know, if we ever get an urban tree planting ordinance or many other communities have an active policy of planting uh, street trees, and it's part of how they see their new, you know, the, what the municipality does. So, can we get some language in there if we're 
going to take that designation that that's a scenic corridor or somewhere else or in that saying, you know, policy would be to plant more trees of a different kind that are not susceptible to disease. There's a lot of trees. So I just, do we have to just concede that the trees are gone and therefore God hail the trees? I mean, wouldn't we suggest that more trees should be considered? Um, Question mark. <laughs> there, Annie can help me out with this, I'm sure, but there there are lots of policies that encourage um, uh, replacement trees and protection of resources um, and require tree plantings in the code. So, so there's a variety of mechanisms where um, trees are are protected and um, uh, and uh, there's a significant tree ordinance that's in the coastal zone, for instance. So, so there's a variety of ways. Uh, but I, I'm wondering if you're asking if we shouldn't have a policy in the general plan that speaks to restoring vegetation in that area, because um, I don't think that there's something specific in this proposal for a policy like that. Um, and I, I will also note that um, uh, Highway 1 is largely in Caltrans's jurisdiction um, and it, it does limit what we can require or achieve, um, but a policy or an implementation strategy could be added to the general plan that speaks to working with Caltrans for you know, restoration of trees in, in, in the area. I think that would be useful to add to the general plan. We've lived in a county for a hundred years or more where we had plenty of trees. But as you know, with fires and urbanization and so on, we no longer may be in that position. I'm sure it will uh, be more of the case as time goes on. Most other communities have such policy. You can go to places like Chicago and other cities, Pittsburgh, we have an active policy of planting lots of trees. We haven't needed one, but maybe it's time to at least put the policy language in there. So yes, that's specifically what I am proposing. Okay. The other thing on the allowing um, some development in ag land, I think this is widening a, a crack that could be just burst open. I agree with the other commissions. Why not list more? Um, specific uses that the amendment could be applied for. And otherwise, if, for example, a major concern was moving the uh, waste disposal, um, maybe you can mention that and then say that allow for some, otherwise they got to come back for a general plan amendment, which is costly and time consuming, but not impossible. I, I think this language is still too general and with the right political agenda, you could use it to different times, different people. I think either we're going to protect uh, agricultural land has been a good policy. And I think you can craft this a little more carefully and make it less general and more specific to the kinds of project that would be considered. I think, I don't think everything here is done very carefully, and very well, and very thoroughly, but this is one area I think you could be tightened up because you're kind of writing policy in case things happen. So maybe you could make some specific suggestions of the kind of things that would be allowed. Otherwise, they can always come back for a general plan amendment if it's that big and that important. Um, and then on the changes to level three and level permit proposals, you mentioned in your introduction that some things that have not come to the planning commission were, and then thing proposals that have come first to the planning commission and then gone to the board the final decision would now rest at the planning commission level. Can you give me some examples? I mean, that's a big change. I want to know what we're in for. <laughs> um, Daisy, do you think you might be able to speak to some residential examples of that? I'm sure. Uh, uh, you'll have to give me a minute, though, because I'll need to pull up the code and take a look at it. Yeah, I, I can do the same as well. Um, okay, well, um, I have another specific one in the code, not about that, but about something else, you know, that I can go to if you would like. 
Paul, we can just wait a minute while you look that up. I really want to know what this change means in terms of month-to-month -month planning commission meetings. And, you know, we have, there are very few things right now that don't end up in the Board of Supervisors. If that's going to change, I'd like to know what kinds of things. It's fine. I'm not objecting, but I want to know what we mean. And does that also mean that proposals that have in the past come to us will just go to the zoning administrator? And if so, they continue to be appealable, I am sure. Um, yes. Um, and I'm just looking through the residential code. Um, and uh, this is section 1310, uh, 321, or sorry. 322, um, and there's a text box that precedes that section um, on page three of that document that explains the changes to the residential uses chart. So that's that's what I'm taking a look at. And um, one change uh, example is that congregate senior housing has been updated to senior rental housing and now requires a CUP at the zoning administrator rather than a level six or seven. Um, so the planning commission would not be seeing applications for senior rental housing. So that's that's one example. Um, uh, is it your sense that this that these will be more isolated examples like that? Is there's not a whole class of items that we once reviewed that we no longer will? Or is there a whole class of items that always went to the board that will no longer go to the board? So, the, so there are very few items that would now go to the board. Um, the highest level that we have in our um, updated use charts is CUPPC. So uh, an item would only go to the, a development project would only go to the board on appeal. Um, and uh, so that that is a, a fundamental change here in terms of how the levels uh, are working. Um, and then some items that the planning commission had looked at in, in the past would would now be looked at at the zoning administrator level, and some items that were looked at at the board level would be looked at would be the, the planning uh, commission would be the final decision maker. I know I know that large subdivisions will continue to go to the planning commission. Well, you know, in our subsequent hearings, this is pretty important. I'd like to get more detail. You can use past projects if you want, but I, I'd like to, our job is going to change. The board's job's going to change. The zoning administrator's job's going to change. I'd, I'd like more than a paragraph on what that means in terms of what kind of projects. I mean, first of all, I, I don't work for the county, so I don't throw around the new names easily. Um, so just looking at a chart once and saying, well, it sounds fine. I can't do that. But And I'm not asking you to do a lot of work, but you must know what kind of projects you mean. And you could use you know, projects that have come before the Planning Commission in the last six months or five months that no longer would and things that have gone to the board that no longer will go there. I just want to know what this means. And then I want to think about it, too. The Planning Commission exists to give the board and the zoning, you know, the whole county government ability for outside individuals that are not employees, county, you know, not elected officials to have some say and represent the community at large. And that's got to be carefully thought about that in terms of what projects come to them. So I'm very interested. I am not saying I oppose. I just don't think that you explained it enough for me to have a useful comment on it. And it is a big change. I think, I don't know, maybe it's not a big change. I, I can't address it. Yeah, the Commissioner Shepard, we, we can start to address that, but uh, I will say that, you know, all of the use charts have been reviewed um, and uses have been modernized and staff has uh, looked at each of the uses and said, is this the appropriate level? Um, can, you know, are there times where we're overdoing the public process where it's not necessary? Um, and then there were other times where we thought, well, this really needs noticing. It needs a public hearing. It's legislative. It really needs to go to the board. Um, so all of the use charts have those levels. And I'd, I'd be happy to show you 
online where where they all are. We'll we'll do our best to summarize what might not come to the planning commission in our um, in our next hearing. Well, just a general summary would be would be in fact uh, quite useful because I think I think it is important that, that the public we represent the public at large have some input to what we think needs overview. All of these new designations would be appealable, continue to have appeal, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, all right. So I really like to know a little bit more about the actual effect of that. Okay. Maybe I can show you where they're located in the code as well. But I, I'd like to know if you can just some specific types of project because the charts just say, and this will go here, but it doesn't say what they're talking about. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about that um, I wanted to get into was specific to the code, if we can move to that. And I wanted to talk about, and I think I've mentioned um, this to Stephanie before about a month ago, if we go to the code on animal regulations, which is 15.3.645-16648 on the, um, in the zoning uh, code um, changes, it's uh, page, I guess page two in the animal in chapter 13.10. Well, I've identified it enough, it's table 13.10.645-1. Okay, so it defines requirements for small animals and large animals. So on small animals, um, I just wanted to say, uh, I wonder if it would not be reasonable to not allow people in RA zones, because in RA zones, I know people in the urban section think that means huge acres just, but it, well, in large parts of the valley, RA zones are houses next to each other. It's just the way the zoning falls out. I think we ought to limit roosters to four per acre instead of, I think roosters should be limited where people live. And that, that would be the uh, minimum parcel size for roosters, peacocks, tom turkeys, get loud, loud birds, peacocks, et cetera. There's, there's no limit on them now. And that can be very annoying. And I'd like to suggest a limitation in terms of quantity be added because you don't need roosters to get eggs. And then the other change is, I think a misunderstanding, because I did meet with some of the folks from the Horsemen's Association on this. Stephanie, you and I talked. Right now, uh, for large animals, there is a minimum setback for stabling or paddocks. And I believe when we talked, you thought a paddock was a structure of some kind. And a paddock to a person who keeps large animals means the fence line. So they're very different things. And for example, um, many, many people existing who own horses or llamas or donkeys, the uh, fence line is the paddock. The, a paddock doesn't mean a structure. So therefore, I think 25 feet from the side in your property lines, preventing the paddock from extending that way would mean almost everybody now keeps a horse or a donkey or a large animal will have to change a fence line. I don't think that's what you meant, because I think you were defining paddock as some kind of Stable. Yeah, we did have that discussion. Maybe we can talk about the small animals first and then talk about the and, paddocks and the fencing. Okay, and then on the subject of paddock, the old language said the minimum lot area upon which a horse may be kept in its diverse acre, two horses may be kept in one acre. And then it said for additional, an additional horse may be kept for each 20,000 gross square feet by which the parcel of land exceeds one acre. I think that should be kept because it re reflects common practice of the two, 3,000 horse keepers here in the county. I, I just think you dropped that. It's a small item, but it's important because it, it really doesn't affect horse care at all in welfare or public interaction. And the other thing is, I think there should be some mention of a a manure control plan for boarding facilities or with more than some minimum number of animals, say six to 10. The county has good documentation on how to control manure. And you mentioned erosion control. I think manure control should be something that is mentioned as required for 
beyond a certain minimum number of horses, maybe six to 10. So those, I think those are very specific, but I actually thought this was important enough to meet with people who, who carry, who, who keep such animals. Annie, could you clarify um, the small animal requirements for the commission? And then yes. we can talk about the setbacks on paddocks. Okay, yes, so we do have a table as um, Commissioner Shepard mentioned on um, page two of that um, code section. Um, and so there is a minimum density um, um, of two small animals per thousand square feet. So that's obviously much higher, I think, than what you were recommending, Commissioner Shepard, for, for roosters. Um, but that is the minimum density that, current, that, as proposed, would apply for small animals. The way it says an RA on the chart I'm reading, help me out here, is this on, in the public draft page two, requirements for small animals, minimum parcel size, minimum, maximum density, minimum parcel size for loud, noisy animals. That's what I'm reading for. Right, so that maximum density above that line that specifically mentions roosters, that applies as well. And that's where you find the number of animals per, this is per thousand square feet. Yeah, so in other words, for for those noisy, for roosters and other noisy fowl, the minimum parcel size is one acre and the maximum density is two um, roosters per thousand square feet. So that would allow how many roosters in an acre? Um, a lot. <laughs> so that's exactly what I'm addressing. Right. If there's 40,000 square foot in an acre, you could have 40 roosters. That would be awful. And would probably exceed the, you know, roosters, in fact, if you have to live around them, don't crow at dawn. They crow all the time. And peacocks mm -hmm. are even worse. So if you could have 40 peacocks, you'd have a real nuisance problem. So I am suggesting that this code be changed. I think it's appropriate. A lot more people live in the rural areas now. And I think, I just think it's out of date. So I think we should limit the number of roosters. Okay, you have to have it. You have to have it for RA. RA can be quite dense uh, in a good deal of the valley because it's RA zoning, but the, actually the houses are pretty close together. Are you making a suggestion for what that density should be? I believe that you said four four loud birds per acre on RA. Is well, that that's correct? That's very generous. I was going to go for two, but I oh oh four. okay, I misunderstood. It, okay, two. Go okay. to two to four, but I mean two to four. Anyone who lived, I, you, they'd still give if you wanted fertile eggs, you'd still have them. Let's put it that. So four loud birds per acre. Yeah, and then we can talk about paddocks, what they are and how they apply, because I think it, I think the language is just plain wrong on what a paddock is. And I think there should be something about manure control. Um, yes, I, I think your suggestion about manure control is, is a good one. And we can also check with environmental health if they have specific recommendations. So um, I am not saying that there has to be regulation of someone who care, cups, care, keeps a couple of horses, but we have some sizable stables. All of them are pretty good neighbors. But the county has developed manure control recommendations. They're good ones, and it's kind of the gold standard. So why not just have some general language that there should be a manure control plan in place for, for um, you know, boarding stables that board more than, I don't know, six horses? We'll also look at other sections of the code that may apply here, like in Title Seven. Um, we can report back on on that or and what environmental health says. Yes, they have experience with it. But the other, then the other thing, there's 600 people along the Horsemen's Association. So I know the other members are starting to roll their eyes, but what a paddock is matters. Um, yes, so I, I did want to clarify about paddocks. Um, what we did is we combined paddocks and stable requirements. So there are some adjustments to the setbacks, but currently, if you look at like the the strike through language on page three of that code section, um, 1310.641 is struck out animal enclosures, stable and paddocks. So we do have 
um, existing paddock requirements. Um, number three there, paddock shall be located on the rear half of the lot and not closer than 20 feet to any property lines. No I closer did. than. I understand. I am oh, saying okay. that I just, when, okay. I, um, when I talked to Stephanie, she said, well, a paddock's like, uh, you know, a sable. They are different things, is my point. A paddock is a, okay. a fenced area. It's not a stable or, or any kind of place that the horse goes into. It's just a fence line. A, a paddock okay. is a horseman's term for a fenced lot. Yeah. So yeah, we can certainly so look. If you drive up to the valley or any place of horses, there's a completely new big facility on Zayani Road, actually. And the fence line is the paddock line. This, okay. this does not reflect the reality of how horses are kept, is my point. And yes, I know the old one, it's just a it's just a wrong definition, is my point. Um we had we we did discuss this with our um planners on over in the development review side who specialize in more in agricultural projects. And um, they suggested that it was really appropriate to have some kind of setback um, for either paddocks or uh, stables, um, specifically for erosion control and um, manure control, as you were mentioning. So um, if, if this goes in the books, then we've got, I'm not going to dwell on it, but then almost 90% of horse owners are out of compliance. So we have rules that nobody complies with. Is that a very good idea? Um, so these regulations would be for those who are getting permitted. You don't need a permit to, <clears throat> to keep horses or goats or llamas or whatever, as long as you're in the spring, as long as you have two per acre, et cetera except I'd like that one exception. There's no permit involved. I mean, people put up a fence line, usually, you know, within two feet of their property line. That's come up. You know, go around and look at a horse facility. Because you want to have the most space for your animals you can. So I, I don't want to take up endless, you and I can talk about this, but I, I've gotten lectured on it quite extensively. Um, nobody wants to make things less or more restrictive. We just think that animal keeping should reflect what our best practice is, and this doesn't reflect that. Okay, well, um, we, uh, I, I think what we would ask is if you have better recommendation for how the code should be changed, that um, during probably the second hearing, there are motions for... Um, what you think those standards should be. Okay, I won't take up any more time. And yes, I didn't say, well, I said that doesn't seem appropriate, but I didn't say, well, how about this? So I'll come back yeah. with a considered, how about this, where I have also talked to people who keep the animals. The small animals with the noisy, with the noisy birds, you already got the recommendation. That, that doesn't need any more analysis. <laughs> gotcha, thank you. And thank you that we have more time on all these. I, I have to agree. There's an awful lot to take in, and I have not read the whole general plan. If Rachel says I need to, then I will, but I couldn't do it in one week. That's for damn sure. If the chair, please. Sure. I really have to leave. I'm sorry, but I have another obligation. Understood. Thank you. Thank you that. all for all that hard work. I'm glad you're doing it and I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and I, like everyone else, apologize for having my own special interest and particular concerns, but I guess if we're going to do it, this is the time, so we won't do it all the time. <laughs> Therefore, I'm sorry, Tim, you must have a lot of stuff you want to say. No, that's good. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, well, then I'll go ahead. I actually don't have a lot of other comments. I think a lot of what I had questions on is already talked about. Um, but I do have some. So um, in regards to EIR, I am a little confused about process with the EIR and how we are increasing density, but maybe not. I'm not clear how we're specifying, like, where it goes since we don't have what I understand is that we don't have a zoning map yet to see applicability. And so, or maybe we do and I missed it. 
And I didn't know if that was a process that needed to happen, or is this just like saying this EAR says, like, if you change the zoning to what we're saying we want to do, the impacts could be these things. And then each new project that gets, you know, that applies for a development would need to do their own EIR or similar, you know, go through that process. Right. So the, um, the sustainability update is largely a policy update, right? Mm -hmm. We're creating policies and regulations um, much more than any kind of a mapping. Um, but there are policies and regulations that talk about, or policies that talk about, for instance, the residential flex should be located along our multimodal corridor. So it gives direction on where you might locate that. Um, we have we have a zoning map, but we don't um, uh, we are not proposing a lot of change to it. As you know, the project includes um, zoning changes or general plan changes to only twenty three parcels in the whole county, and um, thirteen of those are corrections that won't result in um, additional growth. Ten of them, are, are starting to look at areas where we have underutilized parcels or vacant parcels where we might be able to um, utilize that land for the new residential flex zoning. Um, the, the EIR not only looks at, at that, at those 10 parcels, but we also went through a, um, a, a very detailed exercise of understanding how the county could grow in 20 years, right? It's not parcel specific, but it does pr um, project a certain amount of growth. And I talked about, um, while it doesn't say parcel specific area, um, that would be 4,500 units is what's projected for the EIR. So it's looking at a very high level. It's not looking at it at a parcel specific level. When new uh, developments come along, they may well fit directly into what's in the EIR and they'll be able to use the information in the EIR um, for their uh, environmental review. And where they're operating or proposing something outside of what was anticipated in the EIR, they'll need additional studies. So um, while we're not giving you a new zoning map, <laughs> right, that has these new areas, we certainly will be back um, within a year as we're looking at the housing element. And we're then having to show the state how we have enough land zoned for 4,600 housing units. And we'll be kind of forced, if you will, into the position of looking at areas to, to rezone. So think of that as kind of part two of this particular project, gotcha. if that helps. That does, and I think that's, you know, sparked something that we might have talked about previously, and forgive me, it's been a while and a lot of information, no but um, essentially, the, like, the new RF zone gets applied in a, it's a general plan designation, but it gets applied when you look at the zoning code, it says, you know, C1 or whatever uses the density of this general plan designation for residential service, for residential space, right. stuff like that. Okay. Your, the general plan sets the, the uh, residential densities for for RF, that'll be 22 to 45 units per acre. Um, and there are um, other standards in the code that speak to mixed use on a commercial uh, uh, right. property. So you don't, you don't necessarily have to change the zone to a new zone. It's just a new designation as far as the general plan. Right. Um, think of RF as a tool. We're going to use that tool um, next year to really think about where those housing units need to need to go, and we'll be we'll be talking about specific areas then. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's mention of change to the historical 50-year marker. Did that act? Was there actually a change? Because when I looked through the notes, maybe I missed it. Um, if there's actually a code change, or can you explain what that what that part was about? I'll, I'll give that to Annie. She does her historic reviews. Um, so the change that was proposed was currently um, we do review discretion when a discretionary application comes in. We do look at it to whether it might meet the criteria. If if a building is 50 years old or older, 
whether it might meet the criteria for designation, and if so, we require a historic evaluation prepared by a qualified consultant. Um, so, so the change in the general plan is to make that clear. That's our current practice, and we don't have that in the code at this time um, as a change, but we are planning to bring that forward in the future. It would go to the Historic Resource Commission for review and then and then you know to the to the commission and board of supervisors. And that's pretty much an industry standard. That's that's mm -hmm. not right. really yes, specific I, yeah, for explain. us. Yeah, the 50 years is generally um for example um for the state of California it has to be at least 50 years old unless there's special criteria that applies. So it's, it's sort of a, a general rule of thumb about when something might be considered historically significant, a general criteria. Okay, and so that 50 year mark is still saying, it's just kind of cleaning up all the language and stuff. Yes, right, okay. clarifying, yeah. Okay. Um, the solar access change, it looked like the whole code got deleted and there's a note that it's now like a state law or state controlled um, uh, bill or, or uh, code, I guess. And so can you just explain that to me a little bit? I wasn't clear on that. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the there is under state law, there is a solar access shade control law that regulates like when, when um, regulates trees in terms of shading solar systems. So we, we had our own regulations that may conflict with state law. That was part of that ordinance was regulating like when a tree can shade a property. So we thought it was more appropriate just to reference state law rather than having potential conflicts between local and state regulations. And then there, there are, the other part of that was, was regulations about if you have an existing property where there's solar, solar uses, then it regulates sort of what can come in adjacent to that site. But it was, it was like really difficult and difficult to enforce and complicated. And now under state law, um, under the California Building Code, new residential development is required to have solar solar installed anyway. So, so it may also conflict, you know, or complicate compliance with the building code. So it seemed cleaner and more consistent with state law to just delete that chapter altogether. Okay, so that's deleted in the, well, that, I appreciate that, that makes sense. So um, then is it referenced somewhere or is, like, because solar access is something that you really do need to know at the planning level, um, even if it's a building, or, or maybe I misunderstood what you said there, but, you know, something you need to know early on because shading other structures, shading your own property, that kind of stuff from solar access is really challenging. Yeah, um, you know, I'm sorry. No, go I, ahead. Saying, yeah. I think that's a good point, and I think, I don't I don't know if we reference it, but I think it could certainly be referenced in Chapter 1311, the site development and design chapter. I think it may be appropriate to reference it, reference that state law in that section, so. Okay, that I think that would be helpful, give some clarity, and anytime, you know, there's so many state bills, as we all know, coming down for housing and things like that, that are really hard to both reference in our own code, and then also even know that they exist. And so and I think, yes. yeah, it's tricky, but I appreciate you taking it, taking a shot at it. Um, sure. I had a question on the level of service for the traffic, but I, I think I, we kind of talked about it with the zoning. So my question was, how do you like, how do you know what the traffic reports are going to say if you don't really know where the units are going to go? But it sounds like with the EIR based on what we talked about before, you kind of, you have a plan for where they're going to go. So then you kind of input all of that and then it tells you where the traffic is going to have tru trouble, right? Yeah, I, I've, uh, I haven't gone through the whole process. Um, and here's Anais and she can speak to how we forecast units. It's directly try, tied to traffic analysis. So go ahead, Anais. Yeah, I think, you know, Stephanie did a really Great job of giving an overview. Um, but basically, we we took the units that we um, forecasted and we distributed them into what we call traffic analysis zones, which are based on um, census block groups. Um, so they're based on census geography, and they're they're um, they can be fairly large in some areas and smaller in other areas, but they are always larger than the parcel level. Um, and um, we focus the growth in the urban services 
area. Um, and we did also attempt to focus the growth around the corridors that Stephanie was mentioning earlier. Um, it's not an exacting science. It is an approximation and it's a bit of an art, um, but we do the best we can with the tools we have until we have a, an actual zoning update and we have more information. Um, the other thing that we do consider when we do the traffic analysis um, are uh, plans for uh, growth that is, um, and this is covered in the EIR, but um, there is the kind of ongoing growth that would happen with business as usual. So um, the, the units that are forecast as part of the project are added on top of the business as usual uh, growth. And then um, there's another scenario that also looks at adding onto that the, um, the growth that is planned but not approved. Um, so that would be things like the, um, the Capitola Mall or um, the Watsonville downtown specific plan. Um, so the growth that's kind of outside of our control, but we know or we think we're pretty well certain it's going to happen. Uh, and so we need to look at that and consider how that might affect traffic patterns. That's great. Um, sounds really not complicated at all. <laughs> Super easy. <laughs> um, I do have so one follow-up question there. Do you, does this eliminate need for future traffic studies on a per project basis if it fits within the general plan designation? No. Okay. Um, no, not at all, actually. It's <laughs> okay. But it does. Um, it 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 does help us identify projects that uh, can improve operations, so that if a project does have um, an operational impact, not a CEQA impact, because LOS is not a CEQA impact anymore, but if it does have an operational impact, we have a set of projects that we can look to to say, oh, well, you can contribute funding towards this, or you can implement this specific, you know, operational improvement and we know this will help, and it's I already been identified. So that goes into what's called a nexus study um, and gives us the legal basis for uh, charging development impact fees or traffic impact. Got it. Okay. Thank you for that explanation. Um, and so one last follow-up there, I guess, you know, one of the ideas to lessen the impacts is to reduce parking requirements in general. Uh, and different ideas around, you know, how to reduce vehicle miles traveled. And so is all of the, are those ideas incorporated now or there's something we're going to look at to reduce the impact later? Um, yeah, so we, we did incorporate um, almost everything we could think of. There's um, some of the more controversial parking measures um, were not incorporated into the code, but were... Um, uh, general plan, kind of like long-term strategies, and then came up as mitigation measures in the EIR. Um, and um, that includes, it's it's not specific in the EIR, they're, they're long-term uh, TDM strategies to look at for parking management. Um, and then another mitigation measure that is in the EIR is a VMT mitigation bank. Uh, which we do have a grant um, for and we're currently implementing, but it's um, it'll take a few years to to get underway. Okay. So to sum that up, we've included a couple items that you mentioned, but anything else that's like kind of outstanding or a little nebulous as far as new codes or bills that would reduce or parking or trips are not really included, didn't really need to either. Uh, okay, let me rephrase that. Okay. We have, um, we've incorporated a, a, a few new parking code uh, exceptions to help address um, VMT um, from a TDM perspective. Uh, we also have a new TDM ordinance. Um, so these are the things we're doing to attempt to reduce vehicle miles traveled and mm -hmm. vehicle trips. Uh, we also have a new bicycle ordinance um, or a new bicycle code, which um, requires more bike parking than previously required. Um, 
We have also incorporated a, uh, a requirement for um, showers to be provided. Um, and I think those are the big items that really address TDM and reducing vehicle trips. Um, the, the biggest really is, is updating the TDM ordinance, which previously existed, but was um, no longer enforced based on the way it was written. Um, and then on top of that, there's an, a number of policies in the general plan that address uh, vehicle trips, including uh, no longer uh, just doing, when, when we have an LOS impact, we no longer are just looking at improving vehicle operations, but the idea is, is to look at multimodal operational improvements um, mm -hmm. and ensure that the um, the LOS analysis, the resulting improvements do not impact future improvements for uh, bicycle, pedestrian, or transit operations. So for example, if like a, a right turn pocket is proposed as a solution, that right turn pocket won't then prevent a bicycle lane or a sidewalk or crossing. Gotcha. Um, so there's there's actually a lot of really small changes that we've made to um, make the general plan and the code more multimodal friendly mm -hmm. and therefore reduce vehicle trips. Um, but the question I was answering when I first heard your question was uh, what would, what did we not do? And so there's two things that we did not do, which are now mitigations in the EIR. Got it. <clears throat> that clears it up. Okay. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate the insight there. Um, last couple questions here. The zoning map from Title, or there zoning changes in Title 13, I think, and specifically regarding the zoning map, and those got moved to Title 18, but then I don't see them on the website anywhere. Is there, am I missing it? Is it somewhere there, on there? there is it just literally like a copy and paste so you didn't need to? Yeah, I mean, that's largely reorganization. Um, I I forget which section of Title 18 they went into, um, but but they are they are in that document. 18.4 through, gosh, no, I've set it down and don't know where I put it. Um, it was past 18.4 and I didn't see that on the, on the website anyway when I was looking at the code. But um, if yeah. it's just copy and paste and no change. Yeah, it it, it's pretty much just reorganizing. Um, but Title 18 is included below Title 13. Mm -hmm. Um, all the way at the bottom, and um, it's procedures title 18. Right, so I went there and it's all, and maybe I just need to read each each line, but it does go to 1810, mm -hmm. but then it said on the handout, and I'm sorry, I lost my page. That's just okay. Reading through things that I thought it got moved to 18.4. Yeah, so it'd be on page 40 of our handout, it says section 1310.210 zoning map. And mm -hmm. I just got moved to chapter mm -hmm. 18.4 and then I don't see 18.4 in here. It, maybe I'm just missing it's it. It's down there. That. That, that, that document starts with 1810 oh. and then goes on to 1820, 1830, and 1840. And 1840 starts on page 68 of the document. Great, thank you. Sorry. Yep. And I it pretty much is to... cut and paste. Okay, perfect. I'll dig into that if there's yeah. anything. Yeah. Um, I was expecting a thing at, at the, the top. top. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, yeah, no problem. Um, okay. And, and then the last thing I had was just a process question. Um, yeah. Okay, Commissioner Shepard. Could you, could you mute yourself? It sounds like you're on a talking to Well, someone. sorry. That's okay. Um, so process, I, maybe I misunderstood like exactly what today was going to go over. I had thought that it was really just the code sections that, um, are kind of highlighted in the report, 
but maybe I misunderstood that we had like now is our only opportunity to talk about all code changes. And am I misunderstanding that? Is there does the next meeting about like some of the other code sections? Or? Yeah. So this is um, as you know the fourth study session um, that we've had. So we've been talking for the past couple months about the different aspects of the sustainability update. Um, you know, we started with built environment and design that, and then um, I know you weren't around for at least one meeting. We went on to transportation in a meeting. Um, and so we've covered uh, several different topics that kind of the big, the big chunks. Um, mm -hmm. So today's the last of the study sessions. And then next we'll go into public hearings. It'll be almost like starting from scratch. Yeah. Um, however, uh, we'll probably do an overview of, of the project. Um, we would definitely at the next meeting, we're gonna focus on some of the direction that and questions that we've had from the planning commission um, in your previous, mostly your previous uh, uh, study sessions so we can address some of those things. For instance, um, I, and I don't want to get into any detail, but but you were asking about the feasibility of having three stories and you know for RF and that kind of thing. So we've been mm -hmm. doing research in the past couple months since those study sessions, and we're going to address um, we're going to address the results of of the research that we've been doing in response to your comments and questions, and then we're going to focus as as we had decided um, we're. We're, we do have a couple of changes, a few changes that we're making. We're going to um, highlight those in yellow and put them in your packet so you can see the the exactly the changes, the change to language that we're proposing. Um, and then you'll uh, start the public hearing, take public comment. I imagine we would continue the public hearing to the next session on um, uh, September 14th. And and then I I would hope we would have um, motions. Well, we would like a motion to approve the project and recommend it to the board of supervisors. But we know that there are changes that the commissioners are interested in seeing, and so we we would we would hope to have motions that would suggest what those changes are um, to be incorporated as it goes to the board. Great. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Um... You know, like the built environment, we talked about a lot of things, and and so I wasn't sure if I, you know, it sounds like you guys are gonna go back or like kind of get everything kind of wrapped up, and then send us a new document next time that has like all of the requested changes that we've all brought up along the way. Yeah, it's okay. gonna be pretty targeted <clears throat> and highlighted, so you can see highlighted in yellow the text change. Okay. Um, we're not gonna bombard you with all new. 800 pages of documents. We're going to really focus yeah. in on the changes. Okay, great. That makes sense. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I, I will say though that we are going to we are um, posting the new documents on on the website um, once we get the packet out to you. Can I ask a question about this, um, just for clarity's sake? So when you have modifications um, to you know what's online right now. How will are you going? How are you going to know what's changed? I mean, I understand what you're saying that you're going to provide in our packet sections that are highlighted, and then I would hope that you would include everything that you're proposing to change so that it's clear for us. But then online, if I'm, you know, if I want to see the entirety, for instance, of a chapter of the general plan. How will I know? Because I will not remember. That is for sure. What is new and what is not new? What is new and what was the draft? The yellow highlighting would be in the packet and in the documents online as well. You'll be able okay. to see both. Yeah. So like, so like right now the new is underlined. So mm -hmm. it will be just highlighted but not underlined or underlined and highlighted? It'll, it'll be, it'll be uh, underlined and strike through, kind of similar, mm -hmm. you know, um, but the, where things are changing, we will we will show them in underlined strike through and the yellow highlighting. So okay. you'll be able to, mm -hmm. the packet will be helpful to focus in on those areas. Thank you. That's much appreciated. That makes it really possible to do having it all in front of you. 
So I know it's a lot of extra effort for you, but I think we can conclude more, much more concisely and usefully. I want to clarify Rachel's question, though, because I want to make sure that I, because I have the same question Rachel's have, which is we're going to be able to track the changes from the original version, the draft version you brought to us, and the highlighted version. We'll be able to see all three in the version, both online and in our packet. That's, I, that's what I, I, I think Rachel's asking, and I want to make sure that we're going to be able to see that using this yellow highlighted version, we'll be able to essentially see all three versions kind of at once within the document using your yellow highlighted version. Everything will be in track changes, yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And then as far as, you know, the meeting on the 24th and the 14th, I guess I, I do have concerns about structuring the meeting so that we're organized in a way to be able to um, make our recommendations in an organized way. And so, I mean, I think that I suggested this earlier and I'd like you know, staff and then us as commissioners to think about this as well. But I mean, I think that the only way really, well, I shouldn't say the only way, one way to kind of accomplish this is to just, is to be able to take each section one at a time. So, um, and separate between the general plan and the zoning code. And Otherwise, if we're just throwing everything into the kitchen sink, it would be absolutely impossible to keep anything straight. So that's kind of how I'm thinking we should structure it. And the general plan should be divided into each chapter. And then the zoning code should be divided as well, um, which I think will be a little bit, well, I shouldn't say it's easier, but yeah. it might yeah. be easier. Yeah. We've been thinking about this for a long time too, because there are many ways to present the information. And as you know, we've really um, up to up to through the study sessions and all the community meetings, um, we really focused at a topic level. Mm -hmm. um, but as we're heading into actual adoption here, we, we are going to do it at a document level, pretty much as you're suggesting. Okay, good. Yeah. So, and so then I, I so on the 24th, I'm still a little kind of it's a little nebulous what the meeting on the 24th is. I guess since we have the 14th to take action, I'm thinking I'm going to be prepared to take action on the 14th. And then the 24th will be just kind of more discussion, I guess, um, unless people feel otherwise. Well, I guess my question to that, Commissioner Dan, is since it is so much, and I almost feel like there's going to be a series of motions, like we're going to take, I mean, I, I almost feel like we're going to, because I can't imagine us having one big motion at the end, mm -hmm. uh, because I think exactly. it's going to be overwhelming, I almost wonder if we are going to have a motion at the next meeting where it's going to, I'm, I'm going to make this up, obviously, but maybe we're going to vote on um like 13, to, I have to have the thing in front of me so I can actually do a better job of making something up. Like we're going to vote on Title 13, um, then we're going to vote on Title 15, then we're going to vote on Title 16. And I almost wonder if we are going to make some motions and vote on pieces of it next meeting because there's no way we're going to get through it all mm -hmm. and we're going to need the second meeting to get through the rest of it. I don't know that that's the best way, but what do you, what do you think? Um, like, do you think we could really get through all of it and have motions ready all in one meeting? It's so much. Uh, yeah. No, I, I don't think so. Next time and some motions the next and this, the, the following meeting because we need to take piece by piece by piece mm -hmm. couple votes. Because but I, I don't know if you can do it chapter by chapter because 13 is like huge. I, I, made, I made it up, Renee. <laughs> exactly. It was, it was a, it, I mean, I just picked some, I, well, I think the way it's divided up online is, you know, chapter 13 is divided up into several sections. And what would be simplest for me is to use that as the guide, because that's how I'm I'm reading it, is I'm just clicking on each <laughs> section that planning staff has put online for us. Um, so yeah, um, Commissioner Violante, I, I, I think that that's probably makes sense to do it that way. The question is, what do we prepare to deal with first the general plan or the zoning code? I guess I'd kind of like to know, 
now so I can be prepared on the 24th. Well, and I guess to, to your point though, I have a question to stack because I mean, just even like what we talked about today, there are pieces of the general plan that are so interwoven to the, to the ordinance and to the code. Is it even realistic for us to separate them as such? Because one motion will obviously dictate the other. I mean, Stephanie, so maybe Andy, we take the general plan and then staff makes modifications to the zoning code that would make it conform. Yeah, it's really, it is really confusing. And then I'm thinking if you're going to bring draft of changes before the next meeting, I'm not sure I will be prepared on the 24th because I might have to evaluate what those are. It'll be tough. Wait. I don't think I would be ready is my guess, just to, sorry to mm -hmm. interrupt it, just to add to the, that conversation that by next meeting, if we just get the yellow line diversions, mm -hmm. it's going to be a lot to go back through I, and I, like re-engage on those sections that we talked about. And I'm sure we're going to have conversation, especially when we get to 13, you know. Stephanie, um, I think we're giving you a lot of, a little bit of pushback that we need more time. Well, my concern, that's what I was going to say to Tim is like my concern, sorry, Commissioner Gordon, is my concern is we're going to have the same problem for these pieces in September. We're going to have the same. Um, and so I'm trying to kind of yeah. through like what is the best way for us to be ready to make motions? Because I think we're going to have discussion, right? We're going to, we're not, I don't know. I mean, this time, like taking our first item today. You know, Commissioner Dan was able to aggregate kind of a lot of conversation to create one motion we were able to vote on. And that's going to be every single piece of this. Yeah. Right? It's going to be like every single one of it's going to be like all of us talking and putting together one giant motion, but we're going to need to do it six times for the, yes. the ordinance and five well, maybe, times for the, you know, the general. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Maybe we That's could right. ask uh, Annie and Stephanie to, they've done a lot of organization, they're very good at it. Maybe they can think about this question of how we can get through this and present us a plan. Since all of us are saying we can't quite figure out how to get what we need to get, which is motions that are representative and inclusive. So maybe you've already come up with a plan to get us, you know, crossed out and highlighted section can you can you put a little time in thinking about how we can deliver deliverables to you so to speak well i would say to stephanie if this if you have the highlighted version the sooner you can get it to us the better if you have this tracked version i mean i'd rather see it in pieces than all at once if necessary but i'm yeah i, I I mean, I, I just think the sooner we can see whatever it is we're going to consider. We um, we are we are diligently working to finish up those yellow highlights. Um, honestly, we needed to get through today's meeting to know if there were going to be any others, and we have talked about some of them. Um, some of the coastal comments you know, have taken a bit of thought. We've already had two meetings with the coastal staff on, on those. So um, we are working diligently to get those out and we can, um, maybe what we can do is get them posted and let the um, commissioners know when they're, when they're posted online. Um, I know that um, we can also perhaps work with Mike, um, Michael Lamb to see if there's a way to get the packets out earlier to, um, so the, it's a tight, it's a tight turnaround for us as well. Um, and I, I think maybe I just reiterate um, that the schedule was somewhat dictated to us by the um, uh, CAO's office, just in terms of trying to get this adopted this year. Um, and there's, uh, you know, there's going to be a change in board members next year. Um, and I think that there's um, concern that uh, bringing somebody new, you know, along on, on a project that's taken, what, seven years to get to this point, it is not really even fair to, to do to somebody. And so um, 
that along with the fact that we have to get to updating our housing element next year or we're going to be behind um, that that is really driving those two things are really driving the schedule so I, I just want to um, share staff's appreciation for um, what the commissioners have been able to read and absorb and try to get feedback Back to us, we we know it isn't easy, and we really appreciate all the work that that you've done. So, um, on our part, we're gonna keep we keep moving ahead um, uh, to get things out to you as early as possible. Um, and I'll just take a second to tell you how amazing the policy staff has been in in getting this work done. It's been um, a lot of work and nonstop, and so we're almost there. Just hang on; we're almost uh, we're almost got got through it. But the uh, staff report for next week for next time is just about completed. Um, and I think what we're doing is fo focusing on the general plan and then the code, and and then um, we're going to present it that way. And mm -hmm. I suggest that the motions that follow, whether they be at the next meeting or the meeting after, either either way is fine. I, I suggest we go through the general plan first and we can call for motions on introduction, motions on built environment and try to organize it that way. That that would be my suggestion. And if there are places, we understand what Commissioner Violante was saying, there are places where we might have some overlap between general policy and, and code. We'll, we'll work through that. You know, We'll make sure that both are, are captured. Um, but I think that's the best way to organize it. Otherwise, if we go commissioner by commissioner, it'll start to get kind of chaotic. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. And then I, I would also just say that, you know, depending on what happens on the 24th, that um, I'm also open, you know, to a special meeting if that's necessary to get this done on your timeline. Because we didn't even talk about um, we'll also be evaluating the final EIR. So um, there's also that too. Um, at the next, uh, in the next staff report, you'll, uh, we'll talk about the final EIR, the response to the comments. Mm -hmm. um, and there will also be the statement of overriding considerations mm -hmm. that the board would adopt and the PC would recommend, I hope, um, that helps to, um, say we understand that there are significant impacts, but there's overriding considerations and benefits to the community in this project, and we're willing to accept those significant impacts because there are consider are these other considerations and benefits to the community. Um, so you'll find that in your packet ne next time too. So um, what what I think the staff won't do in our presentation, we'll keep it as an overview. Um, of the sustainability update, mostly for the public. You know, if you have somebody who's just now entering a public hearing, it'll be helpful to have that overview. And then we're gonna focus in on those um, uh, staff changes and the planning commission driven changes that we've made so far, or um, also on the research that we've done to address the planning commission comments. Um, and then I would suggest we start the public hearing process, right? And public um, uh, comments and then and then go into motions. So whether that happens next time or the time after, uh, we can we'll mm -hmm. we'll, we'll we'll be able to pr proceed um, down that path. Sounds good. So, yeah, I have a, another question, and I really don't mean to throw a wrench in things, but um, you know, I'm going to go back through and like look at my notes and just think through stuff and try to be really prepared, reread all the general plan again, you know, put a bunch of time in between now and the next meeting. But let's say there's something I missed and I found now and, you know, is there going to be opportunities still for adjustments or is it something like I should just email a list of all the things and like then that's it. I don't get any more chances. <laughs> no, I... I uh, we've been talking about this too. I think we can um, st start to have a discussion if there's things that the commission wants to talk about. Um, and um, and we can take some direction from the commission if there are changes that you, you can agree to that you want made, we can add them into the packet for the September 14th meeting. 
Um, aside from that, I would ask, I think I would ask if you're not asking for information or there isn't clear direction, and then we're really gonna be about making motions and having the commission vote on those motions. Yeah, I would just say, Tim, like that is absolute, that's exactly what we'll be doing is like, you'll come and say, like say we're talking about built environment and you'll come with like, this is, these are the changes I want. And then Michelle Violanti will say, oh, well, here's what I want. And then we'll hash it out. And if we, you know, and then at some point there'll be a motion and we'll have to vote on it. <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, I imagine that some things, probably most things will be unanimous. Other things probably won't. So, so we'll have to be mindful of, you know, as we're hashing things out, there'll be a point where we're just gonna have to take a vote um, and that we, it's okay not to always agree. Um, I think, you know, this commission is always likes to be unanimous, but I think with this item, um, probably it's not always gonna be unanimous and, and that's okay. Um, but but to make sure we move things along, we'll have to be okay with um, things not, you know, taking a vote, even if like we're not agreeing on, on stuff. Yeah. And along those lines, I just, I, I think there were some comments at one point that, you know, this is the only chance that we're going to get. And, and that's, that's not, ex that's not really true. You know, we're putting a lot of new things out there and if we're, you know, for finding that they're working great or not working, they might need tweaking. We do tweaks to ordinances all the time. Um, so, you know, we recognize some things are going to be very new and we'll have to see how it goes. And and if if changes are necessary, that can happen down the road. So what, what I hope will never happen again, I think we talked about this, is that we're 25 years in and trying to do something this this big. Um, my my plan for the policy group is if we can get through this project and then um, and the housing element next year, and we can start to focus on annual housekeeping updates and annual updates that, so it you know it, we're not throwing things into one big project year after year after year, but we can start to tackle things on a more regular basis. Awesome, understood. Thank you. That sounds a lot easier. Hope so. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to just reiterate what Commissioner Dan said, which is we're going to take votes. We won't have unanimous votes. We're not. It's not a requirement that we all agree with each other. That's okay. Yes, absolutely. Uh, great. Any other comments, questions before we move on from this topic? Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it. Um, then with that, let me find my agenda again. Great. We can close the study session and move on to planning director's report item nine. Do we have a planning director's report today? I don't know that we have a planning director still with us, so I'll just say I don't um, know of any reports to you, Jocelyn. Uh, no, it looks like, and Matt was um, tuned in earlier, but it looks like he's since signed off. Um, so I'm going to say there is no planning director's report today. Good. Okay, and then sounds good. Agenda item 10 is report on upcoming meeting dates and agendas. Um, yes, so the next agenda, there's been some discussion about it already. You've got the sustainability update, which is the August 24th agenda. We also have an appeal um, for 22702 East Cliff. Um, and also the growth goal is on that agenda. So I'm sorry, um, I, I didn't quite hear you. Which, which day? Um, so the next meeting for August 24th has those three items um, scheduled. Um, and then the next meeting after that is September 14th, um, which again will be the sustainability update um, public hearing, hopefully, uh, moving towards um, 
adoption and recommendation. I'm wondering, we do have right now on September 14th, the a hotel project down in Seacliff um, proposed also to be on that agenda. I'd really like to keep it on that agenda if possible. What I'm thinking based on the conversation I just heard is maybe what we should do is at the next meeting on the 24th, check in and see where you're at on the sustainability update to see if we need to add an additional hearing date. And if so, maybe we can look at adding one um, at the end of August or early September to continue the sustainability update. I'm wondering if folks would be amenable to that. Or would you be doing a separate hearing for the hotel project? Um, I would pref I would prefer not to, but we can. So we've already been advertising the public hearing dates. So you have it, okay. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to add another date for the sustainability update, is what I'm understanding. Like, not in between. Okay. If we can, if we can man manage it. Okay. So maybe I will just wait until we finalize the agenda for the 14th to see if we might potentially have to bump the hotel to the 28th. Okay. All right. I'm so going to ask, is there, is there a challenge with, yeah, I know this is all, I don't understand all the process behind all this, but <clears throat> is there a way to just add another, like the next planning commission to add on to the um, sustainability update? Is that, or is, you're saying that with the noticing and everything that that's not possible. I know it's pushing September another September 28th. Um, it would be it would be great to not push the sustainability update to the 28th um, in order to help us get to the board because I know that there'll be work after the planning commission to make sure we get your recommendations in the drafts for the board and get that into the packet and time because those are due a month early so mm -hmm. we're we're really squeezed for for time mm -hmm. so if we have to have another hearing i'd recommend it be for the hotel and any other project well, to that end stephanie if we're having another meeting for the hotel could we i i don't know jocelyn if you've already noticed the appeal i assume perhaps you have should we not just put the appeal and the growth goal on that meeting so that we're only having two meetings specifically dedicated to sustainability and the special meeting has these other um, items. That's what I thought too. Can we can we move the growth goal, which is written pro forma? I agree. If we can have the meetings be on just these topics, that's what they that would be the best use of our time. I'll let you contemplate it and decide I, you don't have to answer us now. Okay. Well, we cannot move the appeal date, that I can say for sure, because we're mandated under the code when that needs to go to the planning commission. Um, the, the growth goal, though, potentially could be moved, but I'll let Stephanie um, weigh in on that. So, yeah, maybe I'll just go ahead and assume we're going to have a meeting on the 14th for the sustainability update, and it doesn't seem like we'll get through everything um, at the next meeting, and I'll just go ahead and, for now, bump the hotel, keep the appeal on, but then we have the two meetings for the sustainability update. Okay. If you're setting up a second meeting, the growth goal could be on there. The 28th okay. of September. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. So you're just pushing it off. Okay. Uh, no. The, the, <laughs> under, the under, the, code. under the code, we have to go to the board in September. Mm. Okay. Well, the growth goals doesn't take very long. No. Okay. That's not a big deal. Um, right. Yeah. The peel item, I think, is going to take a little while, the one that's on the next agenda. So what is an appeal of? Um, a denial um, of a coastal development permit, large house variances um, project on East Cliff. So can we have it later in the day? We need to address the sustainability report and all these other issues, the the appeal can be after a certain time, maybe heard after 2 p.m. or something. If there's time certain, we just give ourselves the morning to do the sustainability update, and then uh, if we don't finish, we don't finish. Good. Yeah, we could do that. Uh, the real, why not? I think the, the noticing already went out actually for the appeal, and so <clears throat> and I think the agenda has already been posted. Um, and we usually put well, then we need an extra sustainability meeting. Those appeals of coastal well, issues take hours. 
They do seem to take a while. Let's, I would say since it's the 24th, let's see how it goes. And that gives us enough time, I think, between then and the 14th to see where we are with the mm -hmm. sustainability plan and how much we're able to get done. Okay. Yeah. So I let's would... go, let's go over <clears throat> what our agendas are now. We've had a lot of discussion late in the day and I am. So we, sorry. Yes. Yeah, so I the, have pencil the, and paper here. And what are we So the next agenda on the 24th is going to have the East Cliff, um, appeal, the growth goal, and the sustainability update. And then on the meeting of September 14th, we will have just the sustainability update. And then on the meeting of September 28th, we'll have the Seacliff Hotel and anything else that comes up between now and then. You absolutely can't change a hotel people and let them know they're not. Do they have to go first? The hotel people are in the 28th, so that I'm is... I'm sorry, the... Yeah. Yeah. I think we've already finalized that agenda. I can double check after this meeting. Well, if you haven't, then let's put them last. If they're first, then we just need to agree we're going to try and move them forward. That could take a half a day. I will see if we can. I think we've already sent the notices out today, though, but I will double check. I have a Ricky question for you. Do we have an, like, an end time? Are we supposed to be done at five or something? Or it's like... Because if they, this could go on all night, right? No, nope. so you we can. <laughs> I, you know, CTV staff actually might have, have an issue with that, um, yeah. <laughs> but I don't. But you don't have a time limit. Okay. Um, Jocelyn, the the planning commission can change the agenda around, can't they? They can at the meeting, definitely. I just oh well, let's you know, do that. I just. Uh, we usually try and put public hearing items for projects on first just to be respectful of all of the community members that are there for a project related item. Um, that is why we schedule it that way, but this, you, you yeah. guys can certainly revise the agenda. We're definitely going to have a lot of neighbors on for the appeal item. So I would say I would rather get the appeal over with and then do the sustainability plan from my perspective. Um, so, and I understand we can't move it, so we'll just make it work. I, that's how I'm. Well, we'll you know, that's what I would do. I just want to say that having been on the Climate Commission the longest, believe it or not, our agendas were normally nine to five for many years. So I don't, I think we should prepare for these next two hearings to be nine to five, and it's not unusual. We just had years of having light agendas, frankly. So, all right. I, I'm fine with the being here <laughs> like nine to five. I agree. If it's easier to just get the appeal out of the way, we just we just do okay. that. Okay. But I think it's also important. We you know <clears throat> appeals are you know important, and we have to you know look at them seriously. So it's important they go first and as scheduled, and not mess around with it. Well, let's just move it through. That's all. I mean, yeah, fine. That's that's great. We we have now know what we're going to do, and we're all knowing we're going to be here all day. <laughs> I mean, that's okay. That's what you signed up for. Why quit at five? We could just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> that has been done. We've had a dinner yeah. break and come back at seven. I can oh, remember. man. Yeah. Know, when we had the abalone plant a thousand years ago. <laughs> lasted to 11 p.m. on the quarry ordinance. Oh, man. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So I think that wraps up um, the report on upcoming, upcoming meeting dates and agendas Great. from me. and. Thank you. Yeah, Sorry, so great. Thank you. No, it's okay. Uh, county council report today. Do we have? Justin I was just going to say, still? and I don't see yeah. county council yeah. with us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to, I was jumping the gun. Gun. Okay. Let me, let me make sure he's not. Yeah. He, um, Justin was with us. Justin um, Graham is our new county council person appointed to planning commission meetings. He was on here earlier. Um, and I will notify him. Actually, I'll email him and let him know to expect some longer meetings on these next couple of agendas. Um, so let him introduce himself at the next meeting. Yeah, that would be great if you would just for 30 seconds. Yeah. I didn't know who he was. <laughs> I was wondering. He is already with the county. He has been county counsel for the Department of Public Works. 
um, up until um, Daniel leaving. And then since we're under one CDI umbrella, he took over our department as well. So he's overseeing um, all sections of the CDI. So he's he's been with the county for a while, just not hasn't been with us. All right. Cool. Well, thank you everyone. Appreciate it. Um, we don't have anything else. So we can let everybody go home. <laughs> Thanks, uh, everyone. We will okay. see you in a couple of weeks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.